what we see happening now across the world and also here in Indonesia will shape the learning experience of, of our students for decades to come. For more than a century, the classroom has remained fixed as the center of both teaching and learning. Students sit in rows and, and a teacher instructs the lesson. If a student misses a class, he or she would have to ask their friends for notes. There was no rewinding of the lesson. How times have changed. COVID-19 forced 1.2 billion children across 186 countries to sit at home and learn. Schools and universities scramble to move lessons from the physical classroom to online platforms literally overnight. Even before COVID-19, however, EdTech was, was growing rapidly, but the pandemic gave it a rocket boost. In 2019, global EdTech investments reached US $18 billion. In 2025, the overall EdTech market is projected to reach an astounding US $350 billion according to the World Economic Forum. Now, whether it's language apps, virtual tutoring, video conferencing tools, or online software, we have just entered a bold new world. This huge growth in online learning will be largely led by Asia's growing youth population that is hungry for knowledge and totally at ease with technology. The question for us, however, is how do we transition from a purely physical educational setting to a virtual setting, or indeed even a hybrid setting. Many factors will determine the road ahead. And I am excited to have with us today speakers who are all experts in their fields and who can answer these questions. The brave new world of education must shape the learning outcome for the next generation of Indonesians and prepare them for the jobs of the future. We have often seen how major world events become inflection points for rapid innovation. SARS, for example, launched the e-commerce revolution. And I believe that COVID-19 will become the catalyst for the e-learning boom. What the pandemic has made clear is that learning does not stop and the importance of disseminating knowledge across borders, sectors, companies, and indeed all parts of society. To this end, I feel that the Indonesian Education Forum is a reflection of this cross-border sharing of knowledge, as we have speakers joining us today from the United States, from India, from Europe, from Singapore, from Korea, and of course here in Indonesia. The speakers are also from diverse backgrounds and bring with them different perspectives and insights that I'm sure will enrich the discussions today. We are also honored to have the Director Generals from the Ministry of Education and Culture speaking at the forum. So to all our speakers, a huge, huge thank you from all of us at the Indonesia Education Forum for being with us and sharing your knowledge, your wisdom, but most importantly, your time today. I'm also happy to know that we have more than 1,000 registered participants for this year's Education Forum, which is a new record for us. And it illustrates two things. The huge interest in education and the power of online platforms to connect us. Lastly, I would like to note that we have with us today Panadim Makarim. Of course, Panadim re requires no introduction. He is one of the most well-known personalities in Indonesia as a founder, as one of the founders of Gojek, Indonesia's first unicorn, and probably the most well-known tech company, not just here in Indonesia, but indeed globally. With him as the Minister of Education and Culture, we may perhaps see the first ad tech unicorn arise in Indonesia, 
which would be a true reflection of the confluence we see today of education and technology. In closing, though, we would like to send our prayers and condolences to the families and friends of the brave soldiers who were lost in the sinking of KR Nangala. Our prayers go out with them. We also send our prayers and our hopes to the people of India who are struggling with the devastating second wave of COVID-19. The virus has exposed just how vulnerable we are, but I have to say the response of the global economy, community to, to coming to India's aid has also demonstrated the compassion and the strength of the global community. So our prayers, our hopes go out to all of these families. And in closing, I would like to say to all of us here in Indonesia and, and to thank the government of Indonesia for keeping us safe and our families together. Thank you for joining us today and God bless. I would now like to invite by Ilham Habibi, the co-founder of Orbit Future Academy, as our host for a very, very special session of fireside chat with our very esteemed ex, uh, speaker, His Excellency, Pat Nadim Makarim, the Minister for Education and Culture, Republic of Indonesia. We are very honored to have him, Pai Ilham. Good morning. Good morning, Pai. This is Ilham speaking. How are you? Thank you very much for joining us, Pai Ilham. Well, I'm very uh, happy to be here and I look forward to the conversation and discussion. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, our Minister, Pai Nadim Makarim, also online with us, Panadim. Good morning. Good morning, Pa, and thank you so much uh, for joining us here. It's a real honor and privilege to have you mm. join us at the second annual Indonesia Education Forum. Thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. The honor is all mine. Thank you. Uh, pa Ilham, I will leave you to take over the conversation with our Minister, Pa Nadim. Thank you very much, Shoeb. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear participants, uh, dear Minister Nadima Karim, Nadim, if I may call you that, uh, it is my pleasure and honor to have some time to directly discuss and uh, talk to you about very important topics in relationship to education, education in our beloved nation. And of course, education is uh, one of the major critical areas that we have to do well in, in order to live well in the future. And before we start the conversation, I'd like to give you an out, outline about what kind of questions I'm gonna ask. So first of all, I'd, I'd like to talk about, in general, how digital technology and the pandemic, the health situation impacts educational system right now and how that basically leads into a way forward among others, to the future education. And, and, and in order to achieve that future education, the Ministry for Education and Culture has launched a lot of transformation plans and particularly one program, uh, which is quite known in Indonesia called Mandeka Blajar, which is like independent learning. Uh, and and, and that, all of that is important in order to uh, arrive at the education of the future. And the education of the future what we understand from uh, what we've seen so far will contain some, some very important things like 21st century skills, uh, tech related subjects such as computational thinking, AI or artificial intelligence, all of that. And so basically this is the framework. So uh, talking about, the, maybe we should put it the other way around. How do you see the education of the future and how do we get where and how do you see education right now impacted by digital and health pandemic. Now, I, I basically launched a sort, so this is the framework, but maybe I, I talk one by one. So basically uh, talking about what I said before, uh, what do you think is basically, or are the transformation plans that are very important to realize the 21st century skills for all Indonesian students? What kind of transformation plans do you have as a minister for education and culture? 
the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paella, and thank you for having me in this session. Uh, it's an honor to be here to speak to such distinguished people in the field of uh, education and innovation and technology. Um, it's a very big question about what are the plans. Um, I've, I've come to learn the hard way that there are no silver bullets in the education space. It's probably the, the space that, that truly doesn't have any silver bullets. You have to attack multiple problems at the same time to achieve uh, long lasting transformation. But I can mention kind of the highlights, right, uh, about uh, where do we believe the biggest return on investment of change is. Um, in order to achieve, I just wanted to slightly correct you, Pa Ilham. Uh, I believe the better translation is not independent learning or Merdeka Belajar, it's emancipated learning. Um, uh, it's quite different uh, uh, because emancipated learning uh, is, is um, actually the, the philosophy came from Ki Hajar Dewantara, which is one of the founding fathers of Indonesian education. Um, and it is about the emancipation of the mind of the students, the emancipation of the mind of the teachers, and the emancipation of the institution of the school uh, in, 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 in for it to pursue what is best for its students. Um, and I think we get very bogged down in issues of, of, of general technical competency of teachers and curriculum debates, et cetera. Um, when uh, we are missing a fundamental rule in quality of learning is that without autonomy, there is no learning that is happening. Without autonomy of teachers uh, being able to choose what is best for their students, there is no learning, no matter how good or bad the teacher is. And this is a, a, a misperception, I think, in the education space. Educators have known this for a long time, especially teachers, but there, there seems to be an ongoing uh, debate in education that is missing this very important factor that without choice, there is no engagement. Without engagement, there is no critical thinking among the teachers. And without that, there is no critical thinking among the students either. And in the 21st century era, what is far more important than what is actually being taught or the subject that is being taught, far more important is the process of learning that is happening in the, in the school itself, because the information itself is constantly evolving. The, the skills that is needed in industry is constantly evolving. Uh, it, is, it is futile to try to chase every single type of skill and competency that is needed in the workforce because the, the, they will move at a pace that is forever faster than the educational institution can keep up with. So it, the solution has to be in the process of learning itself. How do you train the most important foundational competencies such as collaboration, teamwork, creativity, critical thinking, how to process information, problem solving, uh, the ability to be independently driven, having a growth mindset, a love of learning. Um, these are the most important things. Unfortunately, they're also the things that are pretty much the hardest to test on a standardized test. Uh, they just, the, the, the things that happen to be the most important things. So, we need a first a, a mental transformation. We need a mindset transformation about what education is. So now going back into Merdeka Belajar, what are the most important things that need to be changed? Well, I only have five years here. So the most important things have got to be the things that are foundational and put, have the potential to not be reversed. So the first is the assessment itself, measuring correctly what we're trying to measure. So the first thing we did is we removed the national exam. Uh, that was actually testing subject knowledge primarily across multiple subjects. And we moved that to be much more of a global standard of numeracy and literacy like PISA. And we made sure that the results only impacted what level of quality the school was at. Had nothing to do with individual teachers, had nothing to do with individual students. It was a way of measuring a snapshot of quality of learning outcomes at the school level. So. One of the innovations we did was to also include a survey, a character survey there that was tied to our Pancasila values. And here is where we assess all kinds of cultural values and learning processes as well. Um, we can, we'll be able to assess not only numeracy and literacy, we'll be able to assess levels of radicalization, for example, um, experiences of bullying happening. So social and psychological issues that children are facing. Uh, sexual violence or, or gender issues that are being faced at the school. So 
we are moving towards a PISA, almost like PISA plus model of, of, of uh, and this is one of the, probably one of the largest big data projects the government is undertaking right now. Uh, we don't talk about it as a big data project because it just, uh, it, 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 it to, to, to a lot of people in the education space, um, that, that term is overused, the big data term, but actually when, when we talk about big data, this is gonna be our first big data program in the government to be able to see where is the problem? Where are the numeracy problems? What are the correlations between certain programs or certain approaches to learning outcomes? Uh, what, what, where are our value gaps happening in the school? So without measuring things correctly, you're always gonna be chasing the wrong thing. So that's the first thing we're gonna fix. The second thing, probably the most important thing though, this is the second thing, is ensuring that instructional leaders at every level are placed in the most powerful and important positions. So vice principals, principals, uh, and superintendents or supervisors, whichever system you, you follow, these are people who monitor the schools. They need to be emancipated teachers. Okay, They need to be emancipated teacher leaders. So our Guru Pangrak program, the most important part aspect of this is regeneration of leadership in each of the school environments and using a very, very selective criteria. Among them are, you know, uh, ability and comfort level with technology. Um, very often, by Ilham, being able to use technology is a very good proxy of your growth mindset, of your ability to go outside of your comfort zone and learn new things and your curiosity. And that's the kind of instructional leaders that we need. That's the kind of heads of schools, principals, and vice principals that we need. So this process of regeneration, a new species of leaders needs to emerge that are prioritizing the student instead of compliance, that are prioritizing learning instead of administrative uh, ad administration of education, um, that are willing to take risks, um, uh, constantly willing to take risks uh, by trying new things uh, instead of um, trying to defend the status quo. I think that's the second largest program. The third is, of course, then the infrastructure itself. Digitalization of schools is our key priority here, because without that, you cannot achieve any of those changes. Those emancipated leaders cannot do work effectively without bureaucracy. They cannot personalize education and segment education. Um, and, and the assessment tools will be of no, no use, because then we cannot target and pin target key initiatives in each of them without having digital platforms that the school are using. So providing laptops, projectors, uh, making sure with other ministries that internet connectivity is, is, is being pushed out is an extremely important part of this initiative. The fourth is we're building our own technology organization within the ministry itself. And this technology organization is really going to focus on the adults in, 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 in the schools, the teachers and the principals, how to build platforms to optimize school budgets how to build platforms so principals and teachers don't have to worry about financial reporting and administrative requirements and automate that so that they can focus on the schools. Uh, providing platforms for teachers to be able to um, custom tailor curricula to their students and do assessments to be able to see if you know student number one is, should be actually assigned the same tasks as student number two. Uh, because they're both at vastly different learning curves. Um, it will open the doors for uh, hybrid learning, uh, flipped classroom models, um, whereby you know they're watching something at home and then doing problem sets with the teachers at school. Um, it opens all kinds of personalization uh, 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 capabilities in, in the classroom environment. And more importantly, it opens self-driven learning by teachers, from teachers, by teachers. And this is the other big initiative here, is the realization that teachers learn from teachers. And the curricula and the, 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 the improvements of their capabilities need to stem from, from hearing and being exposed to other teachers and collaborating with other teachers uh, to, to, to actually improve their, their capabilities. So the entire factory of teachers, uh, which are our teacher training programs, must evolve but also the in-service training philosophy needs to change from academic driven teaching to clinical based teacher to teacher training uh, and collaboration. That's, yeah, I, I basically mentioned the big ones. If you want me to describe the comprehensive program, it will take two days. Yeah, so, thank you uh, very much, Panadima. Very yeah. uh, comprehensive and uh, actually concise answer to the, what we discussed before. 
uh, what I observed in your explanations is uh, there's a lot of uh, technology keywords that you already mentioned, like uh, big data, and you have a technological depart department within your uh, organization that focuses on exactly that. And of course, the keyword of digitalization. Uh, I have a few questions related to that, actually. So first of all, how does the experience, because I mean, uh, Shoe mentioned uh, your previous background, and but how does that particular experience that you already have related to technology help you in realizing those plans? And the second question would be, uh, this is a little bit outside, but I think related, and that is that many people uh, mentioned that Indonesia has a large labor pool, but a small talent pool. So how much will that transformation actually create more talent that is needed for Indonesia to achieve its goals, particularly to become a developed nation, as we always say, by 2045? Hmm. Um, let, me, let me try to answer the first question uh, yeah. first. Um, I think most people assume that my background in technology has made me um, be able to know how technology can impact humans, right? Before, before Gojek, no one would have thought that a object driver could earn the same amount as a top university graduate. Um, and, 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 and so it might sound like a technology company, but why I built it was because I believed in the human potential of these drivers. And technology was the fastest way of scaling that potential to basically create you know, hybrid uh, operators between human and software that could actually 10X their productivity, 10X their potential uh, and so on. So more importantly than actually understanding the technology, I understood the impact that technology can have in upgrading someone's capacity, okay, the impact. So if you could do that with millions of object drivers, um, what, there, is, there is no argument to be made that you cannot do that with, with, with teachers, for example, um, uh, and, 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 and increase their level of capability and productivity. And so that's, I think that understanding was the biggest source of optimism that I had coming into this job. Um, the second thing I think, uh, uh, was actually understanding how technology uh, operates anyway, and the rollout, understanding the power of mobile technology, knowing how to build a technology product, um, I think is very, very helpful, not just to create platforms within the Ministry of Education, uh, but it also changed the philosophy of execution uh, in the ministry, I think. Um, and that philosophy is the not the monolithic changes that normally non-tech organizations do, but to do many different iterative processes. A lot of uh, pilots that then get iterated and keep perfecting as they go over time, using data as a way of actually informing decision-making, uh, using data to inform changes in policy in a much more dynamic way, um, instead of just standardizing everything. The natural gut instinct of government is to standardize things, and that's the, the diametric opposite of what we're trying to do. Um, so, so we are trying to fight that bureaucratic instinct to standardize everything, uh, but instead have technology and, and, and even in our policy making, not even nothing related to technology, to, to have that philosophy and principle of no one size fits all. I, I can tell you by Ilham, there is no field that needs more of the eradication of one size fits all than education. It, it, is, it, is, it is one of the biggest plagues in the education space that in the effort of making it easier to measure, easier to compare, easier to the, we, we standardize curricula, we standardize assessment, we standardize all in the effort of making it easier to compare, to rank, et cetera. But this has nothing to do with learning outcomes. This is the, the dangerous part, right? Uh, about, about educational transformation. So in, 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 in my mind, Technology plays a pivotal role in being able to say, look, we can still measure all these things. Doesn't mean you have to standardize, it, right? Um, and, and I think that's a powerful way of transforming what happens in the classroom over time. The final, I think, thing impact of being coming from the technology uh, sector is I think that the emphasis on 
the dynamic within the ministry uh, it, that I bring from the technology sector is quite different. Um, I, I sit in on meetings constantly where my team members are, and this took a lot of cultural uh, adjustment in the beginning, where my team members were actively shooting down my ideas. Now, for the people that have been in the ministry for, for a very long time, this was a, a novel concept of having the minister being shot down by his one downs. But this is, but this is, um, this is the fundamental requirement of, of, of optimizing decision making. Without having that debate, without having the ideas of the minister being challenged by people who are better than the minister at their respective fields, you're never going to get this kind of internal transformation in, in the ministry. So I took that wholeheartedly from the technology sector and transplanted that in, in the ministry. And even though it was shocking to a lot of people uh, that have been in the government for a long time, uh, now they've adapted. And now the people who have been in, in, in the ministry for 30, 40 years are now attacking my viewpoints and having open debates without getting offended, without fearing me. And I'm also attacking their points in very cold ways. And out of that, out of that debate and discussion, uh, we are we are far more refined in our decision making capabilities. So th don't forget, it's not just the technology know how; it's the cultural, uh, the corporate culture of technology companies that 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 emphasizes openness, evidence based debate, and transparency uh, is a critical part that that we've transplanted here. To your second question about uh, talent versus labor pool. I think it's problematic. I think the statement is very problematic. I think we have a lot of different problems um, that, that all, you know, people also love to have a simplistic view of education that improving education is going to improve everything in Indonesia and then everything will be hunky-dory. And yet we have never seen to this extent uh, a country that has exceeded its economic level in educational output. There is a ceiling that we have seen naturally in all countries, to, and that ceiling is their economic level to how, how the quality of their educational system. These are all correlated, they, they, they are inseparable. It's not like suddenly a poor country can make an excellent education system and then the country becomes a rich country. That's not how it works. Um, these are constant influencing factors that are both correlatively uh, uh, connected and also uh, causation and correlation are kind of mixed up in a messy way here between economic income and education. There's also the, the when you hear this thing about the talent gap, et cetera, you're also hearing this from a very small group of high quality industry, which represents a fraction of employment in Indonesia, right? When you talk to every single technology company in Indonesia, it sounds like Indonesia has got a lot of unicorns, but those unicorns employ like the tiniest fraction of Indonesians. Um, and from their perspective, yes, we have a massive talent gap that, but their gap is a technical gap. Their gap is a critical thinking gap, right? Um, there is also a huge amount of issues about we don't have enough industry and enough jobs for our graduates. That's, 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 that's nobody ever mentions that, that part as well. There's, there's just not enough jobs uh, in industry today. Uh, which is why our education system cannot just rely on getting people to get into jobs. Our education system needs to, to, to also emphasize the ability to become micro entrepreneurs on their own. You know, not, not, not everyone has to graduate and create the next unicorn. You know, pe people graduate, but they need to be able to create their own uh, uh, income and they need to be able to create their own businesses and their own uh, entrepreneurial ventures. And so building an educational system that is not job dependent is going to be just as important. So do we have a big talent pool? Yes, absolutely we do. Are these talent pools being prepared uh, uh, um, effectively in the educational system? No, they are not, okay? No, they are not. So you cannot see the employers and companies and their limited interaction with job seekers are not able to see the latent talent because their potential is unrealized. They're not able to communicate effectively. To an interviewer, they're not able to discuss a root cause problem solving session. They're not able to discuss around a case method because they've never experienced that before. Uh, they're not able to 
um, speak confidently to the interviewer because they've never challenged their professors or their teachers in the educational system. Um, they, they have no idea about what life is like within a corporate environment because they've never simulated a corporate environment in their educational system. Um, and then you'll, you know, maybe when we talk about university education, you'll see that I haven't discussed university education yet, uh, but the biggest change is there is in truly simulating what real world environments are like and by pushing 21st century skills, um, uh, by breaking the monopoly of only academic institutions can, can become a, a university. Um, and, and that's really probably one of the most radical changes that we're doing in university systems to to make that change. Sorry for the long rant, but those oh, are no very, two I, very I, I, big I, questions. Yeah, yeah. Adanib, I really, really like your answers. You said one size for all, absolutely not. It's very true to say that the future of learning is something like, call it customized or individualized mass learning. It's mass, but it's individualized. And so every child, every person has a different way to learn. It's very true what you say. Also, I find it very interesting that before you implement the critical thinking culture in an Indonesian's education system, you implement it first in your ministry. That brings very astonishing results that we can see. Otherwise we'd be uh, very hypocritical if yeah, we didn't no, apply very, very yeah, those values in our ministry. Yeah, yeah, it's very refreshing to hear that part. Mm -hmm. uh, so before we go to the next big topic, which is COVID related, uh, I'd like to ask one more thing and that is about actually what you mentioned regarding the universities. And that is, um, do you believe that the way to teach and learn in the future will be much more based around project-based learning rather than by discipline? Because I think that is something that uh, if people want to be ready for what they want to do in the future, they have to work with uh, people that are not necessarily of the same discipline. They're, they're very different and they have to work in an environment which is uh, multi, very, very, very plural, right? And, and have to have to do that. and clearly goal oriented but in a in a in a in a, in a very, very diverse environment to achieve a particular goal or achieve a particular to realize a project what about so basically that is something to do with steam based and and project based learning how do you see that to be realized in the high school or even elementary school or leading towards university of course well in my personal opinion i think in universities they should all be project based learning okay um i, I don't think they should be doing anything but project-based learning. And I don't care if you're doing literature to astrophysics, okay? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it, it doesn't matter. You, 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 you need to be working collaboratively with your peers. You need to be discussing, debating, and creating real-world output. Those are the skills that, that matter most. It's not how much, how, how, how much you know about that particular field that is going to make the difference in that child's career. Yeah, because you can you can learn and relearn anywhere, but the ability for that student to get used to working in teams, get used to solving real world problems, get used to being able to create something on a deadline and to present it to people and defend it to people is 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 mission critical. I would I would add there's project based learning. I would also add um, kind of discussion-based seminars, uh, which are, I think, just as important in, 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 in training the critical thinking and building the communication skills that are important to defend your viewpoint. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the ideal classroom, you know, of the future should not be a quiet classroom. Uh, the, the, the classroom of the future is a very noisy classroom. Uh, and a noisy classroom whereby the students are speaking more than the teacher. Um, a, a, a future classroom is, is where the, 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 the professor is, 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 or the teacher is going around to these groups and providing tailored advice and support on the yeah. issues that they're facing in their projects, etc. The school of the future uh, has no more lectures. There's absolutely zero reason for you to group a bunch of kids together just to hear someone lecture. This makes zero sense to me in today's term. When you do have a lecture, lectures are great uh, and they, they can provide huge amounts of insights. Just record them and have the kids watch it in, this, in the flexibility and safety of their own home environment. 
why are you wasting quality face-to-face -face time by just having one-way direction discussion? This makes no sense to me. That time of interaction with the teacher needs to be spent actually answering questions, uh, solving problems, giving direct feedback, um, and, and interactive processes, right? So, so uh, I, I'm a firm believer in that. Project-based learning is the only way to build character-based competencies as well. How are you going to teach about empathy and um, uh, uh, um, tolerance when you're not interacting with people of different backgrounds? Uh, how are you going to learn about creativity when you're not forced to, to, to create a novel solution to an existing problem that has already happened if you're not appreciated for that? So absolutely, project-based learning is going to be the fundamental pillar of transformation. It also happens to be the hardest thing to assess yeah. and the hardest thing to standardize, uh, which makes a lot of people in the education space nervous, but we have to get past it because actually the whole standardization is the problem. Um, and, and, and the more that we emancipate teachers at any level of competency, at any level of competency, no matter good teacher, bad teacher, the worst argument I've ever heard is saying, yeah, that might work for great teachers, but if you emancipate not so great teachers, um, they'll do a worse job. And I'm like, then you have no idea the basic mechanics of what teaching is. There is no learning that can happen when the adult in the room is not free to reflect, pursue, and choose what that is that they want to teach their student, no matter the average level of competency of the teacher. So, the, so that argument is the most, in my mind, the most uneducated argument in education is saying that, oh, for teachers that are not so good, we should just standardize what it is that they do. And so they become a robot that cannot inflict that much damage because we're really setting their standards. This is a complete misunderstanding of how teaching works and how learning works at every level. So I just wanted to, to, yeah. to state that because it annoys me that, that it's a yeah. constant mistake in, in the philosophy of education. Yeah, yeah. Very good answer, sir. Uh, I'd like to switch you know, a little bit, very different topic, but sort of related. And that is about, of course, the pandemic. So COVID-19 has done, done a lot of damage to everything in the world. And uh, digital solutions have been uh, quite helpful for every aspect of our life, including education. So now uh, it is planned, if I'm not mistaken, to resume face-to-face -face classes by, say, July. and. Why is it important in, in the ministry's view to return for school when the digital adaption is actually already happening and what steps should schools take in order to reopen safely? In that regard also, what kind of changes will actually last even beyond the pandemic? I mean, we are probably in a few months or years even, uh, pandemic will not be a big issue, but some of the changes we've seen and that have been implemented already, they're gonna last. So what about that? Thank you. Sure. Let's just be very clear that on, on one side, there is the benefits of technology for the education space. And then there is online learning. These are, these are two very different things. Right. People confuse these two concepts. Online learning as a substitute to face-to-face -face learning is a subpar, suboptimal solution to learning. Let me be very clear. That debate used to be had before the pandemic. Once the pandemic hit, then every, every educator's instinct to say that there's no way that replacing the teacher is going to be possible uh, by just having everyone learn independently online learning uh, was proven 10 times fold. Huge psychological issues of kids, boredom, loss of learning. Uh, and this is globally. We're, we're seeing this globally. Uh, uh, loneliness. Um, um, and, and, and of course, loss of learning because of the the, 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 the boredom and the monotony of online learning that is just not as effective as face-to-face -face learning. So that debate is over, okay? Face-to-face -face learning is absolutely necessary. And uh, one of the most important parts of the pandemic has been teaching people, especially people of me, like me with background in technology of the limits of technology in the education space, okay? That's one of the most important learnings we can derive from it. Now, having said that, what will remain? So when online learning happened, 
teachers, parents, and students were forced to use a variety of tools and platforms. They were forced to choose themselves what tools they wanted to use, uh, and they started learning how to use these tools. And in this process, they discovered a, a, a whole new way of interacting, communicating, and collaborating with the stakeholders. So what will stay, I think, first and foremost, what will stay is the usage of these platforms in collaboration between teachers, parents, and students. Okay? Without this triangle, learning can never be optimized. Okay. I think one of the biggest learnings of the pandemic has been the dawning realization of parents that school is not just an outsource uh, factory that you can just send your kids and hope for the best. Uh, the pandemic has, has uh, made us as parents confront the reality that we are a critical part of our children's education. And the, the kids that have succeeded, there's, there's no secret to this. The kids that have succeeded in online learning are the kids whose parents care and have actually contributed. Not only care, but the parents who can afford to care, who can afford to spend the time to help their kids, right? So, so the, the, the differentiator between the ones that were successful are not just the teachers that they were able to adapt to technology, but were the parents present as teaching assistants at home uh, to, to support online learning. Um, so that, that participation of parents, I think we're entering a new era where the participation of parents due to technology is going to, to define this new period. Parents will become nosier. Parents will become more uh, uh, actively engaged in lesson plans and in, in seeing what their kids are up to, et cetera. Um, so I think that will be a big role of technology. Thirdly is, you know, we've only scr scratched the surface of what this technology can mean for teachers. Um, the ability for teachers to access the greatest teachers around the country and internationally to see how they implement their classes. The ability for teachers anywhere to upload and share a video of what they're doing in class and receive comments and feedback about it. The ability for teachers to, to pick lesson plans from other teachers that are posting them online and then to, to adapt them to their own class. The ability for teachers to move up and down the curriculum scale, move one year back, two years up for certain groups in their class and not uh, supported by policy is going to usher a new revolution in, in, in basically teaching at the right level and allowing the right level. Um, Project-based learning could, could be enhanced significantly with technology when, when kids are independently pursuing their projects, um, even outside of the classroom. Um, and so you'll need technology to do that. So those are the lingering effects of technology. No one is going to argue today that kids should not be learning in schools. Um, I think I think very, very small amount of people. Uh, it used to be bigger, yeah? But the pandemic kind of proved them wrong, that face-to-face -face learning is a critical component of the child's mental health, their cognitive development, their relationship building with other peers, et cetera. So I, I, I think those are going to be the big drives of, of, of ed tech. All the ed tech that we see right now is, is, is because it's a revenue driven, because they're all for profit at tech and, and understandably, um, are basically trying to convince parents to pay for some kind of an online or AI assisted learning. Uh, we are less interested in that in the Ministry of Education. We are far more interested in the ability of technology to empower the adults in the room, to empower the principals, the teachers, to be able to create a engaging and amazing learning experience for the students. And so that's a very different way of seeing how EdTech can support uh, education than I think a lot of the, the private sector yeah. players out there, which by the way, they're doing amazing things and I love what they're doing. It's just our focus is a little bit different. Yeah. Thank you for your very good answers. Before I go to the last last question I have, I'd like to re-ask actually one question uh, that uh, maybe you can say a few words about. What about the steps that the school should take in order to reopen safely? I think it's very, very important for us to understand in order to, to not do wrongly and basically contribute to uh, have even more clusters of uh, COVID infected people in our country. What sure. kind of the, steps should they take? Sure, the, the, these steps are, are mandated and set by the Ministry okay. of Health as yeah. well. So we, we came and supported their standards for, product, for, for health protocols. So it's, it's, it's quite standard. There are social distancing rules. 
maximum capacity is 50%. There's no extracurricular activities, no assembly, no nothing. You go to school, you sit down, half your class is there, the other half is at home, and then you go, you go back. Uh, mask is mandatory at all times. Washing hands is mandatory at all times. Um, all the windows are open. Uh, outdoor classes are, are, are encouraged. Uh, and, and of course, thermometers and shut down the school if there's an incidence of infection. Yeah. The, key, the key part about this is that the school for teachers that have already been vaccinated have an obligation that they're mandatory to open up and provide an option for in-class learning. It is not mandatory for parents to send their kids to school if they are not comfortable with. The important part of this policy is putting the power back to the parents. Right now, parents don't even have a choice. The school are not providing face-to-face -face, uh, 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 options at all. So parents that are, are, whose kids are undergoing massive learning loss, who are undergoing psychological issues, loneliness issues, um, uh, agitation, attention deficit issues, are, are, are now being uh, not even given the chance to make that call and decision. It's, it's a parent's decision at, at, at what stage, what risk they're willing to take, given the other risks that they see for their children, right? And so once the teachers of the school are vaccinated, we don't have vaccines for kids yet uh, globally. So that's, that's a moot point. So, but we do know that transmission rates in children are significantly less uh, and also um, of severity of cases are significantly less in okay. students. So that's the step-by-step -step approach of how to open schools. Ultimate choice is in the parents, but the schools are mandated to provide an offline option uh, uh, to for the huge amount of students that are simply unable to learn from home yeah. for a variety of reasons. Thank you very much, Panadim. Before I switch to the Q&A session with an expert panel that is already present here, a very quick, uh, quick question, maybe with a very quick answer. Given your vast experience, and this is a little bit out, out of the box, given your vast experience in the private sector as such, what would be your advice to education players in Indonesia to work with your ministry to build scale for reaching high quality education to even remote parts of Indonesia to basically have something like inclusivity? I mean, uh, we have a big discrepancy between areas in Indonesia regarding the quality of education and perhaps um, policies set by the uh, Ministry of Education and Culture can very much happen that and as an educational player, what can we do in order to work with your ministry to achieve that? Are you very talking quick, about very quick, I, very quick answer? Yeah. Okay, I just need a clarification on that. Are you talking about private sector for profit at tech players or are you talking about philanthropy organizations? It could be Those both. Are two very different. It could be both. Okay, but they're 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 on different total mechanics. So the 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 ed tech uh, uh, players are they, they have to generate revenue, so they naturally focus on more affluent uh, right. areas and cities because they directly drive revenue from the parents and the students themselves. They don't really make money from the schools. So, so, but the philanthropy players are totally different. They're motivated not by profit, um, and and so they're 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 going out. They have a higher potential to go out to the most poorest regions in, in Indonesia and actually enact transformation initiatives yeah. there. Um, I think the 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 for profit players have a huge amount of, of potential in actually uh, 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 creating knowledge maps uh, that are, 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 are that can be used by schools and teachers as well to, to, to draw uh, learning paths that are more optimized for every single student. I think ed tech players play a huge part in innovating the content of information and knowledge. Without those uh, ed tech platforms, uh, we wouldn't be able to do some flipped classroom models in schools. Um, you know, because uh, thanks to to you know the the Khan Academies that which are nonprofit or the nonprofit or the for profit versions of Khan Academy in in Indonesia, for example, um, it, it's great because teachers can uh, tell their kids to watch certain videos and then come back to class and solve problems together. And, and, and not have to waste time re-explaining the concept. So I think, I think that's a huge uh, potential impact from putting all of this content uh, digitalized. Um, again, the, the, the issues always come with the revenue model. The issues always come with having to focus on uh, uh, more middle upper class users. Um, so I think philanthropy players can play a huge role in actually doing the, the the predominantly offline tough job of teacher transformation yeah, in yeah. areas 
that that need them the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so how to work with your ministry in that regard? Is it more regarding the content or the model or the uh, what is it? How do we help educational players like that could work best with your ministry, given your experience in the private well, sector? We've launched just we we've launched one of the largest partnership programs called Program Organisasi Penggerak, where we've identified literally uh, dozens of organizations that are doing innovative stuff, and we're helping co-funding them. To, to, to do pilot projects to be able to prove uh, what are the strategies that they're using to improve numeracy literacy uh, in these challenging environments. So our entire philosophy is partnership. Um, yeah. and, and, and it's also merdeka in our, uh, not only in our thinking, yeah. merdeka in our schools, but merdeka in, in, in organizations pursuing uh, 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 different uh, outcomes. So our, our university education, you know, in case you, most people don't realize this, but now every single or multilateral organization, every single nonprofit, every single world-class company in Indonesia can become a mini university. So we are now, the Campus Merdeka program has created space for all these world-class organizations to create a full semester within their organization that will be fully accredited. The same amount that a student would take four or five classes in a single semester. So the partnership model, um, which philanthropical organizations and NGOs and multilateral organizations and even ed tech companies can jump in and slot in a full semester immersive project based uh, 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 working experience fully accredited for universities. So there are endless ways of participating now because we have basically unbundled education, especially in higher education. We've unbundled it and allowed all organizations and institutions to participate in yeah. an undergraduate degree or a master's degree. Excellent. So sort of like uh, emancipated partnering, yep. perhaps is a good solution to yep. for everybody to work with your ministry, right? Exactly. So now I'd like to uh, switch to the expert panel. We have, I think, in the, in the Zoom room, uh, basically four distinguished ladies and gentlemen here. And uh, if I uh, introduce them here, there's Dr. Rani Birchpour from Microsoft. She's uh, responsible for Asia Pacific Education Industry, K-12 Study and Sales Program. Then we have Mr. Gunawan Susanto, the country general manager from uh, Amazon Web uh, Services, AWS Indonesia. And then we have Mrs. Shweta Kurana. She's a director for a uh, Asia Pacific uh, uh, for group, global partnership initiative groups from Intel Corporation out of New Delhi. And then lastly, we have uh, Mr. Jasper Sidhu. Uh, he's the founder and chairman of Singapore International Schools and Inspiracy Group. All of them are present here. And because of the lack of time, I have to apologize, dear ladies and gentlemen, can we just confine it to one question per person only? So maybe we start with the ladies first. Maybe I ask uh, by, Mr. By, Sweet by to Ilham. ask a question first. By Ilham. Yes, please. Can I recommend that they uh, 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 ask all the questions first and then yes. I'll time manage to answer all the questions at once. Good I'll point, Bob. We do exactly like that. So maybe yeah. then uh, I, I ask again, Mrs. Shweta to, to uh, basically ask her question first and then maybe Dr. Rani and then Mr. Gunawan Susanto and lastly, Mr. Jasper Sidhu. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead. Sure. Um, thank you, Bail, um, and good morning. My question is, the minister spoke about uh, the lack of jobs today and the need to create micro enterprises. So it'd be really interesting to hear about your vision on how do we move a generation in Indonesia, that's the future workforce of Indonesia, from being just technology users to becoming technology creators, specifically when it comes to emerging technologies like artificial intelligence. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Shweta. Then maybe Dr. Rani? Hi everyone. Um, <laughs> um, the Minister Nadim, it was very insightful, all of the things that you had mentioned for very holistic transformation to occur. Um, when you were talking about how do we focus on the adults, right, in the, the school leaders and the educators in the school, um, I was just trying to think about, given the global rise of learning games, such as Minecraft Education Edition, and we feel that products or solutions like that really touches quite a lot of the things you mentioned. 
how to flip the classroom, how to change the mindset of the teachers and students um, and, and the leaders. With that in mind, when do you believe such things will become part of Indonesia's national curriculum for primary and secondary specifically in Indonesia? Thank you, Dr. Rani. Uh, Mr. Gunawan Susanto? Are you here? Or perhaps this replacement, if not present? And I'm Director Jasper. Oh, Director Jasper, okay. Gunawan is not here. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Jasper Sidhu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Minister, thank you for your time. Um, from the private sector, whatever you are saying is honestly music to my ears and music to all of us in the private sector. So I want to focus on the K-12 sector. Uh, this is where I'm operating. We are establishing schools throughout the country at multiple price points. So my question, Minister, is, is the government looking at new innovative public-private partnership models in the K-12 sector where we in the private sector can help raise the standards? If so, what are the specific PPP models in the K-12 sector that we want to explore? Thank you. Thanks, Jaspal. The floor is yours, Panarin. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great questions. Uh, excellent questions. Okay, how do we move to technology creators instead of consumers? Okay, first I have to put a caveat to this uh, question. This is a great question. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of a key area of focus that we're doing now. Now, for countries like India or Indonesia, I just want to remind that moving to become technology producers and, and, and getting a bunch of uh, a, a critical mass of software engineers, uh, 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 data engineers, infra cloud computing engineers, AI engineers, and so on, and designers, uh, and so on, is fantastic for the overall productivity of the economy, okay? But it will never be a job absorber, okay? The, the, if you do the numbers in your head. So, so I wanna say that sake of economic productivity, it is not, you're not going to suddenly turn 20% of your population force into programmers. This is not going to happen. So, so, so I just want to put that caveat there, but the question is an extremely good question. And, and what we're doing very simply to do that, to build, it's not just to build the next unicorns of, of Indonesia, it is, it is to create producers of technology that will create step changes in economic efficiency across all sectors, right? We will always have an over demand for programmers, software engineers, um, um, and the like, uh, uh, material designers, um, UX engineers, UI engineers. So the way to do this is we have two options. One, what we're doing is we're moving practitioners to teach in universities. Two, we are removing students from universities and putting them in the technology companies themselves and getting fully accredited for 20 courses. So all, all the unicorns in Indonesia right now are participating in the Campus Pradeka program right now to put hundreds of kids into their boot camps and then receive full 20 credits. That's the fastest way of doing it, right? It'll take you 20 years if you want to transform every single computer faculty department of a university that's been around. So until that happens, you have to do something in the meantime, which is just move the kids out of there and put them in the technology companies. And hopefully the technology companies will uh, uh, hire the top 10% of that batch and then it'll be worth it. So the government is now subsidizing that process to enable all kinds of students to come into these companies and, and do this, to become, to learn all these skills. So we've got Google program with Bunkit Android development. There's 3000 kids joining this batch and they're getting a full semester's worth of credit by doing this and only this. They don't have to do any work in their university during this immersive four to five month program, which is amazing. So we're really flipping the model of the university uh, and, and, and the pioneer is in the technology training space. So moving this digital talent, the fastest way is by getting the technology players to actually do this job for us and to help move and influence the universities in, in shifting their curriculum towards them. So in fostering the partnership. Now, if a company uh, invests in money in a project and a university, the government will also match that using a matching fund. So we're providing every red carpet to this kind of partnership right now. And that's how you move 
from becoming consumers to creators. But that's not going to solve your job, job problem. It's a different solution. So I always want to remind people that. Uh, <laughs> you're, you know, just calculate how much 5% of Indonesia's population as engineers, there's, there's, there's simply not that many jobs there to, to, to be able to do it. So second point, learning games. Um, when do you think they'll be part of the curriculum? Hopefully soon, hopefully soon. Our entire focus, um, I'm sorry, can you hear me? It looks like it's lagging. My video is lagging, sorry. Um, the, the focus of computational thinking, which will influence how science and math is taught, what I've tasked my team to really focus on, are in pushing computational logic. Um, again, a lot of people get trigger happy and say that we should all be teaching coding to our kids. Um, I wanna just slightly correct that understanding. It's, it's not coding per se that is the important part. Uh, it, is, it is the aspect of engineering for kids that is the most important part. Engineering can, for kids can work through Minecraft, can work through Lego, can work through Lego robotics, it can work through any, any form. You don't have to learn, you know, computer programming to understand logic. It's, it's programming at its essence is about engineering. You're building things that work based on quantitative logic, okay? So those kind of games is something that we want. Our focus on computational thinking, our focus on numeracy will really wants to focus on this game-based approach project-based approach, the building, the maker-based approach. So you're gonna see the beginning of this trend, hopefully during my time, um, but, but I believe that this will be, you can't, you can't block this trend, uh, it'll, it'll be impossible. Kids will figure it out on them, themselves and launch an open mutiny against the classroom anyway, if they're not able to do this. So it, it's a really a fighting battle. You're not gonna win and you shouldn't be trying to win this battle uh, because it's, there's an amazing set of team and collaborative play-based uh, approaches uh, that can foster creativity and, and engineering skills. Yeah, when I say engineering, do I want everyone to have to be an engineer? No. Do I want everyone to have an engineering mindset? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, and, and this is again, uh, it's not about building engineers, it's not about building coders, but everyone needs to have an engineering uh, 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 mindset and way of deductive logic, whether they are a singer, an artist, uh, a philosopher, uh, or, 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 or a musician, it doesn't matter. Um, you need to have an engineering mindset to approach the problems in your life, to approach your career, and to approach the novel problems that you will experience constantly for the first time. And the third question is government looking for new public private models? Um, the program Indonesia Penggerak is a, an example. I mean, we didn't call it charter schools, but they're essentially schools that are being uh, uh, treated with a specific NGO program um, and then being observed, right? There's required funding for that as well that is supported. Uh, that's a public-private model. What I just described to you in universities is the biggest example of public-private model. We've basically allowed every single world-class organization and company to become a mini university for a full semester. I don't think you can get and funded all the students being funded by the government too. I don't think you can get any more deeper public private partnership than that model. Um, we, we are not explicitly yet creating uh, types of partnership schools like charter school model in the US, but we're, we're definitely considering it, right? Uh, it's a lot more complicated than most people think because also the regulations around it is a lot also quite archaic and also uh, uh, complicated. So, so we need to get past those problems first before we can think about the pros and cons of a charter school model. Um, we are having our own ministry version of, of charter school where the ministry is now uh, 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 taking Skola uh, Pangrats, about 2000 schools this year uh, that are going to become 50,000 schools uh, where we're, we're doing the full holistic transformation treatment, except it's not the private sector, it's the, the, the people who came from the private sector who joined the ministry that is doing that implementation. Um, so, so very interesting model there where the, the, the charter is the ministry. For the, as, as you know, we don't own schools. We don't run schools. So for us to actively take a more engaging role in transforming schools is already a big step forward for us in Skola Pangrat. So 
organisasi penggerak, kampus merdeka, sekolah penggerak. These are all examples of public-private partnerships of which we are extremely excited about. I think that's all the time I have right now. I have to take my leave, Pak Ilham. I, I'm so Thank sorry. Thank you so much, Panadim. It's a pleasure and honor to talk to you. An excellent discussion. I wish we could continue for much more time, but I know your time is very limited. I really like your answers, all of them, and I, uh, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, good future ahead of us. Uh, hopefully, we can all achieve uh, what uh, you and your excellent team have uh, prepared and are executing right now. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much for being here, and I look forward to seeing you hopefully soon again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, Take care, sir. everyone. Bye bye. Goodbye, Pak. Terima Thank kasih. you for having me. Thank you so much. Uh... Uh, Pak Nadim, that was, I think, an incredibly, incredibly insightful session. Uh, I think he destroyed many, many myths of education on online learning, uh, you know, in terms of giving us real insights into, into in his thinking on Indonesia's education sector. Pak Ilham, thank you, Saru, uh, so much for hosting this fireside chat. I think My your, pleasure. Thank you, Shoaib. I think your, your in, insightful questions really got, uh, got the conversation going and the juices flowing. I hope everyone's excited and everyone's thinking hard about their role in, uh, in, in the education sector. So thank you very much, Pai Ilham, uh, for your pleasure. time and for your insightful questions and moderating the fireside chat. Thank and you. thanks to all the participants also. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. I think... Uh, I really have to thank uh, uh, Pak Iwan and the, uh, the team at the Ministry of Education for having us, uh, for bringing, uh, you know, for having us engage with Pak Nadim. I think that was an, a really very good session with him to get one hour of his time uh, and give us those insights into how the future of education in, Sing in Indonesia is progressing. And I think some of the myths that he destroyed about online learning about you know uh, one side fits all those are really uh, issues that i think will take us uh, a long way it is now my honor and my privilege to invite uh, dr Ewan sharil uh, the director general of teacher educational personnel ministry of education and culture republic of indonesia to give us his presentation uh, this morning Ewan, the floor is yours Hi, Pak Shoaib. Thank you so much. Um, hi, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here in this uh, very, very, uh, very important session and uh, important forum. Um, so uh, I'm here today to talk a little bit about um, some of like the things that have been happening with the Ministry of Education and also uh, reflections about how uh, we think about going forward. Um, so the title of my presentation is um, uh, From Classroom to Hybrid, Reimagining Teaching and Learning. I, I would say that it's more focus is more about uh, reimagining teaching and learning, especially uh, during the pandemic, what, what has happened. So uh, adding more into uh, what the minister has, has uh, shared with us, uh, but maybe like with some uh, more information. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So I'll structure my presentation into three parts. Uh, the first one, just like to give some um, uh, reminder again for those who haven't maybe got the chance to uh, think about or know about Merdeka Belajar and the transformation of teachers and school leaders. Uh, and then uh, we look at what has happened uh, during the pandemic and the multimodalities in teaching and learning. And then the question about, uh, this is maybe like the one of the most important questions, how can technology, education technology realize its promise, especially in terms of uh, assisting student learning. The minister has mentioned so many uh, great insights about the, the big picture, the big vision of it. Um, and we know we need to go forward with technology to enhance uh, all the possibilities of access and quality uh, and equity for uh, quality education for all learners. So next slide, please. Yeah, go to the next slide. So the first, first of all, uh, this is like the framework and how we think about the Merdeka Belajar or emancipated learning. Uh, the main uh, goal of the emancipated learning is to provide a high quality education for all Indonesians. And there are three components here. The first one is the enrollment. So we have to put uh, kids to school. And then when they are in school, like the quality of the process and outcome should be there. So that's like the, the second pillar and the third pillar how um, all kids, uh, no matter where they are in Indonesia, get 
access to this kind of quality uh, process and quality outcome. So equitable distribution, regardless of the geography or and also socioeconomic status. Uh, but actually the secret ingredient is uh, what is on the top left side of the slide here, which is the agency, uh, the influence and support from all stakeholders. And this is like the, um, the, the point that the minister mentioned earlier about the partnership. Partnership is the way to go. Partnership is how we operate. Uh, at the moment, or in Indonesia, this is uh, basically rooted in the philosophy of Gotong Royong. So we believe that uh, to do the leapfrogging in education, we need to get um, all, all stakeholders to work together uh, towards this, the common goal. And the common goal is about the students. Uh, this is like the, the most important uh, component too that uh, needs to be reminded time and time again. It's not uh, about the adults, but it's about like how we, we provide the best service to the students. They are the future of our nation and they uh, they are like the center of all the programs. So it's not just about the student-centered learning, but we need to create like student-centered programs and the student-centered policies. So all should be aligned towards how to help uh, the students, but the, all stakeholders need to be uh, work together. So it's not just about the schools uh, and uh, the teachers and the family, but also the, the employer, the industry, and also the society in general organizations need to work together. So the ministers mentioned about some of our programs that highlighted how we uh, transform the partnership or Pailha mentioned the emancipated partnering, yeah, the, the, the term, uh, uh, how we uh, go about uh, our business in the ministry. So next slide, please. So with that in mind, the transformation framework, especially in my directorate general, is we have like this message house or uh, the key component of our programs in a house format. Uh, the top one is about the student and we have uh, the profile for our graduate outcome in our education system is called Pelajar Pancasila. So it's about, they have to be um, like strong, like uh, the global competencies. So like critical thinking, creativity, uh, collaboration, communication, but still rooted in the values of Pancasila. So, uh, which is our, uh, the values of uh, our nation. So this is like the, the ultimate uh, uh, outcomes that we want for our uh, human resources that coming out of our education system. And then we have the lighthouse schools. Um, and this is the philosophy again, the Gotong Royong philosophy. We want schools that are already operating uh, very well and have good quality, uh, also have like this call for service. So it's not just about their school, but also how to help the neighboring schools, how to also share the expertise with the, uh, the, the, the schools or educators around them and work together with all the components, uh, the private sector, the uh, organizations in the society, uh, the universities work together and then create this learning hub uh, within their uh, communities. So then they can help uh, the educators or schools that are still a bit left behind. So this is the, the, the spirit and the philosophy that we want. So we want to, uh, to uh, this is what we call Sekolah Pengerah. We want to push this program. We are starting, uh, this is our piloting phase at the moment, uh, 2,500 school, but then it's going to get more and more uh, in the future. And how the Director General of Teachers and Education Personnel support this? First is our program in the very left pillar is uh, transforming the educational leadership. We, we feel like this is very, very important. Uh, and this is what uh, what has been uh, maybe a bit ne neglected in the past. So not really focusing on leadership. When we believe that when the school leaders um, not only like can lead well, but also can be the mentor and coach about what good teaching looks like, and they they, they are like the instructional leaders. They can help teachers to teach at the right level, differentiate, personalize, uh, and use resources, make decisions that will. Um, uh, empower the student and their learning. So that is number one. We need to uh, invest in that. So we have uh, the program called Guru Penggerak, and the Guru Penggerak is not just about the teachers, but these are like the future leaders of our education system. And this is what the, the minister also mentioned earlier. And the second one is transforming the pre-service education. This is like our teacher candidates. We believe that, and we've seen like the um, education systems across the world, the, the top ones, they, they are very, very invested in the pre-service and they do, they are very strict in uh, uh, the, the quality and who gets into the, the system. So then this is 
uh, one of our priorities at the moment, how to transform the pre-service education in Indonesia. And the third one is about how to create these learning hubs for teachers, center of excellence for teacher learning in every province. At the moment, the center for excellence for teacher learning are located mainly in Java. So then this is uh, something that we feel we need to uh, expand, we need to uh, create these hubs because each region has like their different challenges. Just like when we believe about differentiated learning for students, we also actually should approach the differentiation and personalization for teacher learning because each school, each region, they have like their own context and challenges. So their learning should also be uh, made relevant towards the challenges that they're facing. And the fourth one is to empower education communities. This is the Gotong Royong spirit. So the way that we implement our program should uh, emphasize on the importance of collaboration with uh, uh, many stakeholders in the ecosystem. And the fifth one is about governance. And this is uh, also very, very challenging because the management of teachers and education personnel in Indonesia is this, uh, shared with 514 local governments. I repeat, 514 local governments who have like their own situation and uh, authorities. Uh, so then we need to create um, like also a partnership with the local government. So to make sure that the supply and demand of the teachers and education personnel are sound. At the moment, uh, we are still not working very optimal on this and it affects quality also in the long run. So uh, if we don't uh, get this right, like the recruitment of teachers into the system with the proper mechanism and or with good quality control, uh, the teachers who are not really um, meeting the expectation, the minimum expectation can always be into the system. And this is not also uh, obviously good for uh, our kids learning. So next slide. So what has happened during the COVID pandemic? I, I'm gonna share with you a little bit in our insights and how this uh, helped us to reimagine about teaching and learning in the future. So next slide. Um, so we know that uh, there are a lot of issues in, in the pandemic as we know, but also uh, this disruption actually is an opportunity for, for us to reimagine, revitalize education the way that we have, especially the education technology sector has, has been uh, uh, sharing with us since long decades, basically. But now it's actually forced us to do this. And uh, next slide. Um, what we see is uh, the use of technology has brought the impact um, with the anxiety level. So we believe that um, now is um, the engagement is much more, um, teachers are more familiar than before and they're much less anxious about the use of techno technology in education. And it also creates uh, opportunities for differentiation, uh, different ways of, of learning uh, than before. Next, um, what we see is the basically is not about, the, yeah, we're still like learning about how to use uh, technology effectively and, and relevant because not like the minister said, uh, the, actually we, we, we learned about the limits of the technology um, during the pandemic. But the most important part I would argue is the mindset change. The mindset challenge during the COVID pandemic is enormous. Um, first, like all educators uh, and also the stakeholders, uh, especially with parents, we need to start to be okay with the uncomfortable or be comfortable with the uncomfortable. And this is the mindset to accelerate the culture of innovation, to embrace uncertainty. So this is actually um, a very good investment that we can use going forward. And the second one is surprisingly, is like to be a learner. Uh, and this is um, maybe it should be, you know, it should go without saying that, yeah, teachers need to be learners, but in the past, uh, mainly like they uh, are in the framework of just following the instruction, comply with the regulations. Uh, with COVID, suddenly it, it is disruptive because it's not working. So they need to find new ideas, new strategies to deal with multiple challenges in their situation. And this is also like the mindset of, uh, my mindset of a learner is something that is very, very uh, promising because the way they, they learn is not about complying with the regulation, but to solve problems. They put the students first. They try to teach at the right level because their students are uh, have different conditions with their family. So uh, they have to meet where uh, the condition uh, is uh, relevant to the kids. And the libraries of technology is the last one, is something that I mentioned earlier. And uh, this uh, also gives us 
more uh, resources about what to do, uh, how to differentiate strategies uh, with uh, student learning. Next. In our national survey last year, uh, I'm taking like two surveys, one uh, or in April, so just when the pan pandemic started, and one uh, September, uh, a little bit after the, the pandemic. So what we can see from uh, the, this data about uh, how uh, teachers uh, uh, taught uh, in, uh, during those, those uh, uh, time was, and the first time, yeah, all, all graphic is, it, it goes up. So at the, at the beginning, um, uh, we can say uh, from this, um, Teachers were confused about what to do. And then they figure out about, okay, they, they can do this and they can do that. What is interesting about this data is this. Number two and one and two, the first two uh, parts, uh, numbers, uh, giving students uh, exercises or questions and then assigning students to read textbooks are arguably uh, the most common ways of, of teaching. So just stick to the textbooks and then give students questions and exercises. Um, Number uh, three, four, five, and six are something that is um, um, maybe the, the pandemic made it uh, even more common. Uh, what is interesting for me is especially number three and number six, because number four about assigning students to use ele electronic resources and interactive teaching for number uh, interactive online teaching for number five are pretty much, yeah, because of people started to use technology. but. The number three about assigning students to read supplementary materials and number six assigning students to do projects or creative assignments are not just because you just use the technology, this is something something else It's more about how to enrich learning how to make it more personalized and interesting. And this these two things assigning students to read supplementary materials so aside from the textbook and assigning students to do projects or creative assignments are the ones that increase the most. So um, this shows that um, there is uh, something moving within how uh, the Indonesian teachers uh, started to teach. Uh, this is still at the beginning of the data. A lot of work needs to be done. But again, there is, there is something going on. There is a, a promising progress that uh, happens because of the disruption of COVID pandemic. So uh, we'll see. Hopefully, we can carry the momentum this year and, and years of years ahead. Next, please. Some of the insights, and this is from the data from our flagship program from the teacher leadership, Guru Pangrat. Um, so for instance, like the, the teachers started to um, develop, the, okay, they learned the technology and then they use that to develop interesting models. And this is interesting for two things. The first one, yes, they, they use the technology, but the second one is they are moving away from the textbook. So they develop models for the, for the, for the students and not just mo develop models that are uh, relevant to the students, but make it interesting. So usually maybe uh, the teachers use textbooks most of the time. And this is, this is like uh, something uh, uh, promising once again. And then the second one, the, this, uh, the, the quote about the use of online group and the teachers thought that it would be difficult because in, in, in uh, her mind, how would you do on group work online? And then she found out that actually students were more active than what she had thought before and generated new ideas, more engagement. So it gave the teachers belief that, oh, okay, this could work. And then not only that, but also it's not about the technology by itself, but how to make it enhance the, the learning. For instance, uh, this teacher learned about differentiated instruction and then using that to think about how they, uh, she can differentiate the assessment of the students. So for instance, videos, sounds, and visuals and increase the submission of the assignment during the pandemic. So this is again, like the, not just about, hey, I use the technology, but it's more about, hey, I use the technology than uh, to improve the quality of student engagement and the quality of the learning which is actually the essence of good teaching and learning. Next. Um, we also have like the online teacher learning series since October. Uh, this is actually still the data from last month. Uh, I believe the number has, has uh, increased uh, from this, but we also see how the Indonesian teachers uh, started to be more comfortable with the kind of like training um, that is, uh, given in the online platform um, and they do this voluntarily i think that is actually uh, one of the the key aspects of, of many because before 
teacher learning is more about because they are given like the letter from the principal or from the local uh, education office to attend certain workshop in the specific place for a given time. This is basically we just like, OK, these are like you can uh, join this and there is no uh, force mechanism, right? Mandatory mechanism, but it's more about you, if you want, go ahead, sign up and then you uh, participate. And um, and we have like 73 percent uh, completion rate, which is good for an online learning uh, ecosystem. Uh, next slide. What uh, also surprising is that um, when the minister and I, for instance, visited uh, like remote uh, places like the small islands in West Papua uh, some time ago, uh, we found like in one of the Desa Idete, Dara Idete, so this is like one of the uh, most challenging region in Indonesia, um, very limited uh, resources, but we found like some teachers uh, who have already been engaged in this training platform. And they completed uh, some modules as well. So it was uh, very encouraging to see that. And their internet connection was not really good, but they still won because they wanted to learn. They completed uh, those uh, modules um, uh, well. So then this is something that, uh, again, like we did not expect this, uh, but apparently uh, for the remote and underdeveloped regions, suddenly opening access to uh, how they, uh, they can increase their capacity, especially also choosing what is relevant for their uh, training. Next. Um, we also develop like the crowdsourcing model. So this is a different way of learning for, for teachers. Um, instead of like the government giving like the, okay, these are like the, the guidance uh, that you need to follow during the pandemic. We thought that the situations are so complex and so diverse and it's impossible for the ministry just like to give like, okay, follow these guidelines and you'll be fine because situations are different and situations keep changing. So we decided to, hey, why don't we use like a like a platform for crowdsourcing so teachers can learn uh, and share ideas from each other in this platform. And since uh, this is already uh, a year, the platform has been accessed uh, almost 80 million times uh, and many uh, 229,000 active users and tens of thousands of lesson plans and articles, uh, 21 million downloads and collaborative actions. Um, the, these are like the, uh, we believe that uh, how the, the teachers start to feel that they can access the best expertise from teachers from all over Indonesia. So they can go directly to their subject or to the, the, the grade that they're teaching. And then they, uh, they, they look at like the ideas and customize to their, their context. So before like these expertise are maybe like so isolated, they maybe meet in like uh, workshops, face-to-face uh, -face workshops and suddenly now they can access all these different ideas, lesson plans from all over, uh, especially um, uh, the ones that are uh, this, uh, the same subject or the same grade as, as they are. So it increases the access to expertise uh, around uh, teachers in Indonesia. Next. Um, this is what the ministers uh, also mentioned earlier about the technology platform. I, I just wanted to slide about the teaching. So we also building like this platform at the moment hopefully uh, uh, we will start like this pilot for using it in our sekolah this uh, this year uh, how teachers are given like the support to teach better uh, so technology can help them to differentiate learning uh, project-based learning and also how they, they can also continue to learn so using the uh, micro learning uh, modules uh, also giving feedback from each other and then uh, menu for training so they can select what is relevant for them Next, please. Um, yeah, this is a call up and graph that I, that I uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, what I want, can we go to the next slide? I think the next slide has the pillars. Yes, okay. So, so call up and is our main strategy, of course, is about how to strengthen the human resources in the school, especially the leadership. So we want to test our theory of change. If we invest in the human resources much more than the infrastructure, because the uh, will will it make a difference, right? So we believe uh, it does, and we're going to test it to the sekolah penggerak. Because the approach is not like the sekolah penggerak is not like the schools that have already the, like the best programs or the best infrastructure. These are like the schools that can be like a just like so so schools. But they have like the uh, the, qual the quality leaders, the, the the human resources that are willing to learn, having growth mindset, and believe in like 
all students, regardless where they're coming from or their background, can reach like, their highest potentials. So, uh, and then the teachers are the same too. Uh, all teachers can can do like complex things, can can uh, reach their highest potentials as teachers too, if they're given like this opportunity to learn and also believe in this like growth mindset that they can be better every single time if they continue to learn. So we want to test this uh, 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 theory that the uh, 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 theory of change that that we believe uh, investing in the human resources, especially the leadership, and then uh, with the paradigm about teaching and learning about the foundational competencies that minister mentioned earlier um the literacy and numeracy and all like this important like 21st century skills part of the character um we want to uh invest like 25 percent of the the program will be about the project-based learning um so uh so we, we actually started from the k-12 uh to to try to introduce the project-based learning where uh, teachers from across subjects can collaborate. So this is going to be like something new. And then um, we believe that it will actually improve student engagement and student learning. And that the school will use the technology uh, to use uh, database uh, planning. And then uh, for teaching and learning, uh, the digitalization will help about the teaching and learning like the platform that I showed earlier and also help like the principles about uh, how to allocate resources, uh, organize resources using the technology, making it more efficient so that uh, the adults in the school can focus on what matters most, which is about how to help the students learn better. And then uh, the how we uh, uh, accompany the, the, every single school, we will do like consultative and asymmetrical uh, um, a training or um, coaching with the school because each school will have like different uh, context, different challenges. So they will be uh, also uh, coach uh, accordingly. Next. So this is the plan. So hope it will grow from time to time and uh, we will start with 2,500 uh, this year and it will grow to 10,000 and 20,000 for uh, the next two years, hopefully and it will reach more areas uh, in uh, in Indonesia. So now we started with 111 actually, and then it will go to uh, the full capacity, uh, all regions in about two years. Next. And the last is about, can education technology realize its promise? This is the question. And uh, we are so like, uh, have the euphoria about technology and it made us have to pause and reflect. And next please, next slide. I, uh, I came across this report by the Brookings Institute. Um, they did like this uh, study at the end of last year. They reviewed experimental and quasi-experimental evaluations of education technology interventions, especially from pre and secondary school in low and middle income countries. This is very important. So it's not like the, the modern countries, but it's more like the low middle income that released in the past 20 years, so 2000 to 2020. Then looking specifically the, the studies or interventions that uh, try to improve student learning. And one of one of like the their findings is that a key finding is that we should actually think carefully. We should actually not suddenly, okay, let's go uh, all digital, right? Um, they they will argue about differentiation. So they uh, this study uh, concluded that we have to actually look at what problems and context that we are we are having in, in a, a given ecosystem or a given community. So we have to understand about what the needs are with the, the system and the, the existing infrastructure and the capacity, and then look at given that context. So what is like the best available evidence on intervention in that kind of condition? Then after that, we have to assess also continuously um, when we do the implementation. So basically it's about a careful uh, and more thoughtful approach about how to use the education technology um, that can actually improve student learning. So it's not just technology for the sake of using technology, but technology should be uh, a tool, place as a tool to enhance the quality of the human process in the, in the, in the, uh, the quality, human quality in the, in the process, which is most important of all is the students. Next. Because they, they also came back to this uh, instructional core. Uh, technology is not about just like replacing the adults or the, the humans there, 
but it should actually enhance the quality of the human interaction. So between educators and learners uh, with the, the education materials, the text, and are also arguably the parents uh, in, the same, in the same part here. So maybe it should, should be like a square or a rectangle, but uh, they're saying that what matters most to learning is the interactions about educators, learners around education materials. So it's about the human interaction. And that's what we should focus on our intervention in technology. Next. So as we come down to like uh, 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 the how to reimagine teaching and learning and the role of technology here, the this study uh, argues that like the four ad tech intervention models that can potentially improve student learning. The first one is what the minister mentioned earlier, right? So the lectures, lecturing, yeah, that, that can be or uh, standardized uh, uh, instruction. Yeah, it can be given uh, pre-recorded videos or live lessons. Um, that that can be done, and and, and the, I think the research also shows that this is this is uh, one of the uh, good interventions, possible interventions that we can do. So, uh, for instance, in areas where it's hard to find uh, teachers, or the high teacher abs absenteeism, right, uh, or schools or regions where the uh, that have very low uh, expertise, especially in the mastery of the subject area, uh, subject matter, and the pedagogy. This can can uh, can be replaced by uh, a scale up version of uh, standardized quality instruction, and the second one that is possible. By the way, these are not you uh, that uh, an education system should do all of these four, but they can choose which one uh, that are relevant to their context. So it's not like for everyone, but this is an option. So the second option is facilitating differentiated instruction. So we will, there's the technology about the computer adaptive learning where. Uh, they can uh, detect and then adjust uh, how each students can be given um, the instruction accordingly, or uh, we can do like um, live one-on-one uh, -on -one tutoring uh, using the technology. And the third option that is possible is expanding opportunities for practice. So for instance, in situation where teachers maybe don't interact with the students uh, much and cannot check the understanding, technology can help expanded opportunities for practice for um, reviewing the topics for the students um, after they uh, they finish their lessons in the classroom. And the, the fourth option is about increasing learners uh, engagement, like the gamification, making more uh, interesting and relevant for the for the students in their learning. So these are like the four options that can actually uh, improve student learning based on the review of research done by the researchers in the Brookings Institute. And we think about, as we think about reimagining learning, we should also be mindful about the system, the context of the systems, but either the local system or the national system as a whole, and choose what is uh, differentiate, what is most relevant to each given situation. I think that will be all for um, my uh, presentation for today. I'm looking forward for uh, the discussion of this. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Ivan, for a very insightful presentation. Um, I think lots to talk about uh, from the presentation. I would now like to invite our co-panelist, uh, Mr. Jasper Sidhu. He's the uh, founder and chairman of the uh, SIS and Inspiracy Group of Schools in Indonesia. Uh, but Jaspal, thank you for joining us. Oh, most welcome. Most welcome. Sure, uh, thank you. Thank you. And we also have Mr. Noah Yarrow. He's a senior education specialist from the World Bank. Uh, Noah, thank you for joining us. He's joining us all the way from Washington, D.C. Uh, it's been a great honor. It's a great honor to have you with us, Noah. Thank you so much. Uh, nice to see everyone. Okay, great. I think we've had a really powerful uh, morning sessions uh, with Pa Nadim in, uh, earlier, and of course, uh, Pa Iwan's presentation, lots to talk about. And I think real insights into how in Indonesia's education system is innovating and really reforming. Uh, Jasper, if I can start off the panel discussion with you. You have been in Indonesia's education system for more than 25 years. You have set up schools across the country. I think one of the key innovations that you have brought to Indonesia's education system really is schools with different price points. <coughs> I know you run SIS and Inspiracy Group, uh, and you are meeting the needs of not just 
the upper middle income, but I think the middle middle income, as we would say, and I think also going towards the lower middle income. Uh, you can share with us, uh, you know, your observations and your learnings from your 25 years uh, operating in Indonesia's education uh, sector. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. First, to my Indonesian friends, I extend my deepest condolences on this tragic demise of these very brave sail sailors. To my panelists, it is really a privilege for me as an operator to be uh, talking with you and next to you. I worked in Indonesia for more than 25 years and I've seen the country from within and I've really loved for the people. Bahasa Indonesia, Indonesia saya dan lagu-lagu dangdut lumayan lah. I'm a private sector operator and I chair the SIS Inspirasi group of schools. And it is my mission to make quality education affordable and sustainable in this country. Because my father was a satpam, he came from a poor family. Especially in Indonesia where the K-12 rankings are not impressive. And I'll share with you my observations through my work. Our model works differently. I don't start schools at the bottom end and struggle with cash flows and quality. I turned the pyramid upside down. The first SIS school we set up was at $14,000 a year. Now, hang on, hang on. That is very expensive. So I halved that to seven and I established three more schools I, in Jakarta. And I also know $7,000 a year expensive. So I halved that to $4,000 a year and I established schools in Medan and Semarang. And I know even that's expensive. So we halved that to $2,000 a year and we put a school in Palembang I also know $2,000 a year is still expensive for the general population, and we are halving that again. We have expanded in, 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 in other Southeast Asian countries and in India, and I'm continuing to find ways to bring prices down. At these kind of prices, we have students performing above world averages and going to top universities. We are in a strategic partner with the IFC, which is part of the World Bank Group. Now, people ask me, how do you lower tuition fees and maintain quality? See, when you start lowering fees, to establish schools, two things need to happen. One, infrastructure design needs to change. And two, you need to hire from local communities. But, it, but the problem is many of the teachers in some of the smaller cities have passion, but they lack best practices and they're stuck in traditional teaching methods. So what we did was we created an ecosystem that I call vertical collaboration, where every teacher in our school group up and down the tuition fee pyramid collaborates freely all year around with technology. So no one is operating in isolation. And that's the failure of many schools, operating in isolation. So our student outcomes improved. In 2019, we were internationally recognized for this vertical collaboration idea that brought fees down. And we were accorded with UK's Financial Times and the IFC World Bank with a global award for the transformational work we do in education. That was in London. Last month, we were named by Capital Finance out of London as the best international education institution in Southeast Asia for the impact that we bring. And as a pra practitioner, and I tell a lot of people, investors, the way to look at education very simply is through the three Ps of education, people, program, and place. I try to simplify this for people to understand. People, I'm looking at new and innovative ways to hire and train community teachers and fresh graduates. My view, and I'm very, very sorry, and I say the education system is broken and we really need new ideas. So I hired Deloitte to help me understand what is happening outside the education industry. How are top companies like Facebook, Google, and Starbucks hiring creative and innovative staff? What is the human capital development out there that I can bring in the education industry? I'm very happy to say that we have over the last 18 months come up with a very novel playbook to hire and train community teachers. I'm now working with Oxford University to scale this up with a open smart register platform underwritten by WHO. We are looking at international grants to catalyze pro-learning and pro-resilience interactions between teachers, parents, and students in Indonesia, India, and Africa. And some Sometime in due course, I hope to share this with the World Bank and, of course, the ministry. On program, I want to quickly stress three things. One, I'm seeing a focus on content delivery, but not on the process of learning, as Pat Nadim is saying. Now, these are skills needed for employment one day. 
So in our group, we are always looking to add to our curriculum new ideas, 21st century skills, what I call the PACE initi initiative, PACE, P-A-C-E, perseverance, analytical skills, collaboration and co uh, uh, communication, and entrepreneurism. But Nadim hit it on the head. Education cannot give us all jobs. We need those micro entrepreneurs. Number two, technology. With the price of computers and handheld devices coming down, I'm very excited by the power of this can do. We are data driven. I'm so happy to hear from pa Ivan, pa Nadim. We are looking at big data. We need to free teachers from their mundane tasks and making learning fun and, and for them to experiment. We are also uh, experimenting things like virtual and augmented reality and advocating a hybrid approach, which I'm sure we'll talk about later. Three, the program needs to focus on our environment, more so because of this pandemic. So in our group, we are pivoting to a focus on the UN SDGs with more and more of a school-based projects. I'm looking to train our teachers to be what I call novice environmentalists. Imagine the power of a teacher in front of 30, 40 students to create a movement to save our earth. And I think teachers have a big role in, in the UN SDGs. Finally, P for place which many people take for granted. School design will change and must change if teaching and learning is to change. Group settings, open spaces for collaboration, the ease of movement of learners from inside to outside. The pandemic is also making us health conscious. And, we, and I ask my team and I ask many schools to start thinking, what is a post-pandemic school? What will it look like? And I can tell you the architects of the world are split no one have real ideas. I'm just curious and I keep pushing. Uh, we are all are moving to the IFC World Bank Green Edge Certificate. So that's my input. Um, and thank you. Thank you for giving me a chance to share. Uh, Jaspal, I think the innovations that you have brought to your schools really are quite amazing. Um, if I may now invite uh, Noah from uh, the World Bank. Noah, you have just authored a very I think groundbreaking report on the promise of education in Indonesia. Um, and I think you have a number of insights from that report you'd like to share with us. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you uh, for having me here. Um, we at the World Bank have um, done a number of projections on the impacts of COVID um, in Indonesia and globally. And what we see is that uh, the uh, learning loss is, is going to be very significant, uh, particularly for middle income countries uh, like Indonesia. Some of the upper income countries have been able to maintain learning, not quite as much as uh, during non-COVID times, but have done a, a fairly good job of maintaining learning. While in some of the lowest income countries, um, unfortunately, very little is learned by students in a given year. And so the fact that schools are closed hasn't had a major, major impact on student learning profiles. Uh, while in a country like Indonesia, the, the impact is fairly significant uh, despite many efforts of the government um, to, to maintain and support learning during the school closure period. Um, so what, what we're looking at today is very much unequal impacts. Um, so uh, for example, um, students who did uh, distance learning uh, during the, the pandemic, uh, according to a, a nationally representative the survey that the World Bank conducted of 4,000 households uh, this past November, 2020, uh, we found that the average amount of time students who were doing distance learning engaged in learning was 2.3 hours per day. Uh, but that those from wealthier families, those living in Jakarta, um, did significantly more hours than those in rural areas and from lower income families. And so what we really see is this unequal impact uh, of the pandemic and of school closures on student learning. And those that are better off are able to better cope uh, with with the, the challenge of COVID. 
And it's this inequality that really concerns us. And when we look at um, some of the hybrid approaches, we see that um, you know, there, there were changes over time, right? The, the Ministry of Education launched um, online learning by, or excuse me, uh, TV learning. Um, and according to our survey in August, a little bit over half of the surveyed students were participating or, or viewing some amount of TV, uh, educational TV each week. Uh, but that number dropped to only 10% in November 2020. And so we really saw this shift toward um, other mobile platforms. Uh, WhatsApp uh, was, a, was a favorite way for students to connect with teachers. And that's very positive, um, but these types of platforms often lack structured mechanisms for feedback. So one of the complaints uh, that we heard from students was that they would complete assignment but didn't necessarily get detailed feedback uh, from the teacher on what they did well or what they could improve upon. And teachers themselves often were not able to systematically track student learning. And so this is something that um, the, the ministry um, and teachers and parents and students and all of us invested in education uh, are really gonna need to, to work on and we applaud the minister's efforts to, to change mindsets. And he talked about developing teachers and Pai Iwan mentioned school leaders. We think this is a very promising approach, uh, really about building resilience. Because unfortunately, COVID is not the last challenge that Indonesia will face, right? So there's a need to expand access to the internet, uh, expand the capacity of teachers to use technology and work to make sure that hybrid and online learning can be accessed by everyone. And this is something we really appreciate about the ministry's approach, this kind of inclusive partnership approach. Uh, we see the ministry working closely together with the private sector, the NGOs with international partners, um, such as the World Bank. We're very privileged to be um, starting an impact evaluation of online teacher training and we really feel like this is a, an excellent model, right? Nobody has all of the answers. Um, the minister has established a very clear plan, very clear objectives. And what we are very eager to do is to try and help the ministry identify those elements uh, that are working very well, and then those elements that could, could uh, benefit from additional support and do this in a rigorous and transparent way uh, for us in the domain of online teacher training. So we think this is an exciting development with lots of opportunity. Uh, we're also concerned that at the end, the ministry really uh, focus on building back better, right? Working with districts and provinces to improve the overall system because to go back to where things were um, is not gonna be helpful. But given the time constraint, I have elected not to use the slides um, that is the sum total of my remarks. I'm happy to go into the PowerPoint if that's helpful. Um, but looking at the time, I thought it would be uh, better to just summarize my remarks. Thank you so much. Um, uh, you know, it kind of gels well with, with uh, morning sessions. Uh, if I may now uh, kind of go into a Q&A uh, with, with our panelists, um, there's a you know, thinking, and uh, Nadim mentioned is that, you know, like you said, no, we cannot go back. COVID-19 has kind of really pushed the education sector forward. I think uh, by Ewan's presentation really uh, illustrated the amount of work the Ministry of Education has done. <laughs> uh, it's quite, it's, it, it is quite amazing and uh, admirable that, you know, the Ministry has put in so much effort in terms of uh, taking things forward. Uh, the theme for this session, of course, was um, from classroom to hybrid. Uh, you know, so there is this question about, of course, online learning is here to stay. Uh, it's a matter of how you use it, how do you combine it uh, with classroom instructions. But Nadim mentioned that teachers, you know, giving lectures is a no-go for uh, for you know moving forward for uh, universities and rather to have a more interactive. Um, session, one of the things he mentioned which really caught my attention was classrooms need to be noisy rather than silent. So that whole 
uh, format of you know a teacher delivering a lesson, everybody listens, and then they go home. So, Pa Iwan, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with you in terms of you know the government and the ministry, and you've been instrumental in terms of really leading the charge here yeah, in, uh, in in change within the ministry. Um, in terms of hybrid, what what is your uh, thinking or imagination of what a hybrid classroom would would be uh, going forward? Yeah, uh, thank you, Pasho. I think one of like um, uh, the strategies that I think we have been talking about even before the pandemic is like the flipped classroom. Um, so rather than uh, spending the time of the uh, two students and teachers interaction uh, when they meet face to face on just like uh, pouring like the content, right? And that can be done as uh, like an independent uh, study on, on its own by, by each students at their own uh, when you know their own time. So when when the they meet the students and the teachers meet. So what is happening is like like all of these like the assignments or projects or whatnot giving feedback. Um, so therefore, um, the quality of, of, of the interaction increases and then the, the quality of learning also increases because that is like actually the most, uh, the, the messier part where uh, teachers need to provide feedback and uh, uh, coaching the students and etc. and the, the, to, to do the collaboration. So I think that is like one model that I think uh, we should push more. Um, uh, at the moment, because of the, the pandemic, uh, it's still like a major uh, health concern. So the uh, the face to face meetings are, are still limited. So like half fifty percent of the student population, and then the uh, there is a shift, right? So then this still involves some kind of uh, how to uh, provide this kind of uh, intervention or mode of learning. Um, so I think. Um, that is one of the capacity for teachers to then uh, create this kind of content, to be a more um, comfortable with uh, producing interesting. So not only like the modules, so then they can learn online, but also like this uh, quality uh, standardized instruction delivery. Um, so then they can um, provide this for their uh, whatever subjects that they're teaching. I think that's one of the strategies that we've been talking for a long time, flip classroom. Okay, just uh, if I may come to you, I mean, you run numerous schools uh, across the country. Uh, and in the past one year, uh, a lot of, I think I, I'm sure at SIS, a lot of students have been uh, learning from home. Uh, but as schools reopen, you know, uh, how, how are you handling this uh, situation and what, how do you see the, the evolving nature of a hybrid learning and hybrid classrooms? Uh, sure, let me tell you where my worry is. I mean, first of all, we are online. Uh, we have been online and we are dying to get our kids back in schools. As Panadim said, social interaction is a big thing and that's, that's so important. That's the well-being of the children are my biggest worry currently. Now, one of the biggest worries of hybrid for me is the home situation. Now, hybrid would mean the children will have to do things on their own, but the homes need to be conducive. Parents need to be involved. Technology needs to exist in the home. So let's, I always tell people, let's not get very excited about giving children something that they can do. I would love to give them a lesson for them to sort of what you call go through at home and come back and teach as facilitators. That's where we all should get to. But the issue is when a lot of them go home, parents don't haven't bought into this. They have chores at home. Some of them are working. Environment is not conducive. So I would urge that as we look at this hybrid situation, and that's what we are doing, Shweb, looking at the home. Because school, we can control. The homes, we cannot. And that's something that it's, it's very important. And we do this through surveys to see what the home condition is, and then we adjust accordingly. Right, I think very good point. You know, the home is somewhere, if it's gonna be hybrid, the home plays a very important role. Uh, Noah, from your observations and from your research, you know, uh, how is this going to work? 
what 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 kind of what what would you say uh, for a country like Indonesia or many developing countries where the home does not maybe have the like just what says a conducive environment? It's not just about technology; it's also about the participation of parents and having a proper desk, for example, just to to study at. Right? How how do you see this evolving? Sure. Well. Um... Thanks for the question. I think the minister and Fat Yuan both mentioned uh, the opportunities uh, inherent in technology around differentiation. And something that Indonesia and many other middle income countries still have a lot of uh, room for improvement on is, for example, inclusion of students with physical uh, disabilities or uh, hearing impairment or sight impairment. And there's some really nice uh, digital applications that can Work with um, work with these challenges for students and help them access schooling, uh, particularly beyond the primary level, where we often see a very high rate of dropout. And so, I think using technology in differentiated ways can uh, provide gains in these areas. Right. So, some students um, who have other challenges may elect to mostly learn from home um, with the use of technology while many students are probably best served in the classroom, in the school, uh, with the teacher integrating technology into their instruction for some of the things um, as Mentri was talking about in terms of uh, teaching at the right level, um, uh, project-based learning, and other objectives. And so uh, really by working with teachers and students and understanding their needs and capacities, you'd hope to see not one model for hybrid learning, uh, but many, uh, where for some students, hybrid learning takes place uh, basically exclusively in the classroom and is about integrating technology into the teaching and learning process. And then for other students at the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, maybe mostly from home um, with occasional visits to school for, for peer interactions and interactions with the teacher and then other students somewhere in between. Uh, and this will take time uh, to develop. And I, I don't think any of us kind of has all of this figured out yet, uh, but this is the direction we see things going. Thank you. Um, I think we have a couple more minutes to kind of wrap up. Uh, maybe I'll just ask for your observations, uh, starting with Pa Iwan. Um, I think uh, one of the key, um, what do you call it, post-COVID uh, phenomenon that have, have arise, arisen is really the need for the education sector to engage with the private sector and not the private sector in education, but uh, the private sector in technology, the private sector in other fields, and bring those learnings into the sector. Uh, and I'll, uh, I think the ministry is already uh, engaging with a number of these so-called private sector players, especially the ad tech players. Yeah, um, and I think that that that. Synergy is becoming very critical, I think, to, uh, as, as education uh, goes forward. So the question for all three of you really is, you know, how, you know, what, for example, could the gaming industry teach the education industry? Right? Gaming is a huge industry. Uh, you know, there are a lot of learnings in how people play games and how they learn from gaming, right? Uh, would that be something that as education uh, experts and uh, pr uh, practice, uh, practitioners, would that be something that, you know, going forward, uh, there could be more synergy or more learnings from those kind of sectors? Pai Iwan. <laughs> Thank you, Pai Shoyam. That is a very interesting question. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say, and again, I would refer to um, the study that I shared earlier from the Brookings Institute, right? So it's about differentiating the intervention in how technology uh, would enhance the quality of teaching and learning process. So it's not again, uh, so the, the uh, one size fits all also uh, applies to the how technology or the intervention of technology. So you should first look at like the what we need, you know, like the uh, what kind of what kind of learning teaching and learning what kind of interaction that we want to see and happen right and then see how technology can can help that and but also at the same time assessing the infrastructure like for instance like panoa mentioned earlier about oh finally like most teachers uh fall into uh, or go to whatsapp for instance right 
uh, because of that is like the, the the infrastructure constraint, and they cannot use the most sophisticated technology to uh, to do teaching and learning because of so many so many constraints. If not from the school, it's uh, from the parents. Uh, uh, like was discussed earlier, uh, by Jasper mentioned that, which is a very valid point. So it's about for me again. It, it comes back to the the, the theme of this uh, conference about the creativity and critical thinking, look at like the problem that we're facing and see how technology and other components can solve the problem and towards the outcome that we want. So we need to define the outcome first as well. And for us at the moment with the, uh, the first Merdeka Belajar, like the first big bang uh, that the minister, the minister uh, did was to, to change the national uh, education system because we are measuring the wrong thing, right? So we need to measure what matters. So then once we're clear on that and then see then how we can improve the quality uh, uh, of technology engagement in this, then we can do like the, um, the solution. So I think in terms of the uh, game, uh, uh, gaming industry, um, it's a lot of this like intrinsic motivation and there is this kind of, um, uh, what we call the zone proximal development. This is one of the learning theory, right? So it's kind of I plus one. So uh, in, in another uh, theory, so meaning that you are given like the, the uh, not just where you are, but a little bit over like beyond stretching a little bit, but not too much, right? So then you keep continuing to learn more and that gives like the confidence for you to go forward and forward. So in that sense, yes, I think that is actually part of the, uh, the learning uh, philosophy or learning theory, right? so uh, what, what is applied in, uh, it's maybe a bit funny, maybe the gaming industry is applying that and the education sector is not so much, right? So this, um, uh, a lot of like the, the minister mentioned about we have to emancipate uh, the mindset. It's kind of like, it's a moot point. We have like all this competency. Yeah, you can do all these strategies, but it's like you have like the most sophisticated tools, but you don't know how to use them. Right, so even like actually the simple tool can actually solve your problem. So I think uh, with that in mind or that analogy, I believe uh, uh, the same with uh, how we should approach uh, education going forward. Um, uh, the hybrid model, because how do you define hybrid anyway? What 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 is the what, what do you mean by hybrid? Right? What what component? Uh, proportion? When when to use what and how much and so on. So a lot of like. Uh, it's a, still like a loaded concept and we need to unpack that to make it more relevant to each context. Ivan, uh, Noah, and then I'll go to Jasper uh, to give the final word. Sure, thanks. Um, so I agree, I agree with um, pretty much everything Fai Yuan has said. <laughs> I think he and I are, are reading many of the same reports. Um, <laughs> I did, I, I mean, I did want to note not all games are created equal. Uh, right? Some, some gamification strategies allow students to engage deeply, meaningfully with the material. Um, they use AI to make it challenging. Um, others, uh, some that my son plays, uh, frankly, he gets very obsessed with just getting to the next level. And I say, well, what did you learn? Like, what are you actually doing? He's like, dad, I don't care. I just want to get to the next level. So you, you have to be careful. Um, some of these some of these approaches work really well and deliver, I think, high quality engagement and learning opportunities. Others not so much. So um, part of our job uh, is to to support governments uh, to to choose and you know work with those higher quality options and then uh, you know hopefully empower teachers and, and families and students themselves to make choices that are going to support them to go in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Jasper. Sure, thanks. <clears throat> you know, when I listen to Pai Yuan and Pai Nadim, I get excited because Indonesia, when I see this sort of leadership, Indonesia is the cusp of a very big change. So thank you. On, on gamification, I'm a big fan. Um, I think children learn best when they have fun. But as Noah says, we've got to be very careful between addiction, learning, and, and, and engagement. So once they're engaged and they learn, versus addiction. In terms of the type of games, we are also very careful. We look at making sure that these games and the school-based subjects have a, a, a interesting mesh. But when I look at these games, there's a lot of real world applications in these games. So they're very, very interesting. And it also gives you feedback as you go along. 
uh, and the way they challenge each other, it, you know, uh, peer to, uh, peers, groups, collaboration, they, they talk. So that's a lot of interesting things that come out of this. But there are games and there are games. But I think we cannot move away from this. Thank you, Shuet. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's been an um, illuminating discussion with uh, our uh, esteemed panelists, Pa Iwan, uh, Noah. Thank you so much for joining us from uh, Washington, D.C. And Jasper, uh, thank you so much also for sharing your insights from Singapore. Uh, and as I say, I know the online, online platform really is allowing us to engage with uh, our expert speakers from all over the world. And of course, Paiwan, thank you so much again. Our deep appreciation for, to you and to the ministry for helping us uh, with this morning sessions and partnership with the Ministry of Education. Thank you so much. God bless. So that was a very interesting and uh, uh, I think uh, insightful session with uh, two esteemed speakers. Uh, we now have um, Pawikan Sakarinto, uh, the Director General of Vocational Education and the Ministry of uh, uh, Vocational Education at the Ministry of Education and Culture, uh, Republic of Indonesia. Pawikan uh, is a professor and academician. Uh, who has uh, been very involved with the uh, uh, Ministry of Education for many years. Pa Wikan. Hello, good morning. Hello, Pa. Welcome to the Indonesia Education Forum. It's an honor to have you. Yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Pa. It's very nice to meet you all. Yes. Very thank good morning. Yes, very uh, good morning, Pa, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, you have a presentation to make? Yes, I uh, would you like to share some yes. slides of PowerPoint. Sure. <clears throat> I still cannot share. A share screen? I still cannot share the... One second, yeah, now you can. Try again, Okay, Okay, now, <clears throat> now I can. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, shall I start? Yes, please. Okay. The stage is yours. Okay, a moment, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, again, very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, of course, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, let me continue what uh, previous uh, presenters have already uh, share to all of you so okay okay can you see my slides <clears throat> okay uh, uh, now i would like to share about uh, the transforming of uh, vocational education system for the future needs um i think this slide most probably have been shown by previous speakers, so I'm not going to talk about this, but uh, this is the real challenge and this is the real uh, target that we have to achieve since we are expecting the demography uh, bonus. And actually, uh, recently in uh, Compass newspapers, 24th April, April 24, um, I have. Uh, uh, share the article, what's so called vocational education and the vision of Indonesia 2045. And this is actually what I'm going to uh, explain this uh, at this moment. So in the 4.0, Society 5.0, um, again and again, I'm not going to uh, discuss this uh, aspect uh, too much because I'm sure that we've been quite familiar, we've been quite engaged with these issues. And uh, okay, and this is just uh, how we ask to ourselves about uh, our education in general. And we have also have to consider about the technologies that are likely to be adopted in 2025 uh, from cloud computing, big data analysis, and all of this should be really uh, uh, become high concerns as for our uh, teaching methodology, uh, teaching materials, curriculum, and how we improve the link and match vocational and industries. 
Okay, let me start my presentations. So we are from Director General of Vocational Education. Some people uh, sometimes say call call us Dixie. So we cover around 2000 campus, uh, polytechnics, universities, institutes, uh, sekolah tinggi, akademi, and academic communities. Around 2200 campuses, public and also private. Uh, and also 14,000 high schools or vocational high schools, we call it SMK. And last but not least, quite more, uh, quite a lot is 17,000 training centers. So we cover all of this and our policy is link and match. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's not a new, uh, it's not a new terminology. It's not a new concept to be linked and to be really matched, but somehow uh, the last years uh, for the the last maybe 10 or 20 years the link and match concept have been not so much implemented uh, comprehensively com comprehensively since um, only MU signing and put the newspaper sometimes some schools may uh, may uh, claim that they're already link and match with industry so we would like to uh, to apply link and supermatch in the whole con uh, aspects. Later, I will show you how the link and match concept. Now we apply. The thing is, we would like to see our campuses, our schools, to come up with this uh, graduates uh, type. So not not only. Uh, uh, certificates, but competence is more important. I'm competence means meaning that I'm able to perform. Cognitive used to be too much, so I would I, I, I will I will always say that I will always uh, tell to people that it used to be in the vocational in the vocational uh, educations, not only in SMK but also in uh, campuses. Cognitive was too much. Soft skills, characters, um, we really have to uh, 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 give more uh, proportions to deal with soft skills and integrity. And we've been we've we've received we've been receiving many complaints from industry and most of them i think 90 percent complaint is about soft skills and characters so i think uh link and match what so called eight plus eight eight plus i this is what we apply first is curriculum to be designed and to be approved by industries to be designed and to be approved together schools and industries that is the mass at the number one most priority further now we are modifying the curriculum for smk vocational high schools we make it to be more flexible to be more adaptive and to be more agile and we set up more portion for soft skills and project based so the number two, the concern of number two, developing soft skills. So there will be there will be much more portion for project-based learning. So we bring the project, we, we get the project, real project from industry and uh, address to the students in the class and make them to deal with, split them into teams and to deal with the real project, uh, real project. And they have to come up with a real product that satisfy the industry who uh, send the, the project or who uh, um, uh, have the, the request for the project. If they cannot satisfy the industry, meaning they cannot pass the subject. So they have to work together. It, so communication skills, present, presentation skills, uh, teamwork, and etc. will be automatically uh, embedded into the system if we apply more project-based learning. So number one and number two is the most important things. And then we also push the schools, university, at least 50 hours up to 100 hours per semester, each program, 
to be taught by teacher from uh, expert from industry to be taught by the expert a professional from industry next thing is internship minimum of one semester can be up to three semesters but minimum one semesters certificate of competence to be agreed or to be designed together uh, with the first phase when they design the curriculum together and uh, teachers or lectures should be regularly trained by industry to upgrade or to maintain their uh, knowledge uh, based on what the in industrial uh, uh, reality uh, going on uh, applied research applied research is something like this start from the end so they have they only can start conducting the research when when there is case or when there is problem on on or when there is request from industries or society don't start conducting conducting research if there is no signal from the end side but to some uh, to some case they could start conducting the research by means of uh, uh, to come up with the new invention that's also possible but that's also possible but don't start with the TRL. Start with the market readiness level and venture readiness level. Don't think that not only producing the research products just only to publish and to get the promotion to be the professors. And that's what's been happening up to now. So we are changing this. We are modifying this. We are modifying the regulations. Uh, the, the regulation for promotion, the regulation for uh, accreditations, the regulation of curriculum. So we are now have been um, in the ongoing mod modifying of, of, of those regulations. So this is what so-called uh, research, uh, applied research should be triggered by the real case, the real problem, or the real request from industry or society. So the, the result is the real product to be delivered real product to be delivered to the market or to the community but they could also publish that's also fine but don't think don't think as the priority research conducting research just only to publish publications so that's not the first thing first thing is market readiness level venture readiness level and trl coming up with the real product to be delivered to the customers or the community and then they could also publish this for the promotion it's kind of fine it's kind of good to have the publications but don't only think the publication without any uh, uh, destinations to come up with the real product. So that's number seven. That was number seven. And number eight, commitment of absorb, uh, to absorb the, the graduates. And e, uh, I, I could be scholarships, uh, donations, job contract, and etc. from industry. So this is what we uh, have recently uh, released to all. 2,000 campuses, 14,000 SMKs, and 17,000 uh, uh, training centers. So the idea is industry should come to the earlier phase to cook together. Don't wait at the end after we uh, complete our meals and then they, they try the meals and they are not satisfied, they complain, and then they, uh, they got to improve in their training centers. So why don't put the training centers system into our system? So put it together and then just put it under our curriculum. So that's why I, I, I told you that the curriculum and also the soft skills uh, aspects to be the most priority uh, that we have to, to deal with as soon as possible. The new structure of curriculum, not only the content of curriculum, content is, is of, of course, but the new structure of curriculum will be uh, will be changed uh, as soon as possible. Now we are changing that, but I'm sorry, I cannot I cannot show you up to now because we are now still in the uh, pro process uh, progress to, to upgrade that. Um, and these are the pictures. Uh, if vocational campus or SMK or uh, training centers that uh, those who have managed to uh, realize the link and match. I told you graduates should be like this. Um, competency, certificate of competence, and et cetera, something like this. So in the right-hand side, 
certificate, certificate of competence, and F in English in the left hand side, new real product from project based learning. Curriculum, I, I've, I've mentioned uh, previously, curriculum should be adaptive, agile, and flexible, and to be created and designed and approved together with the industry. Project based learning, applied research, teaching factory, teaching factory as the continuation of project based learning. Um, if we and all and also applied research so I, sometimes i call it teaching industry embedded with the research system input yes new students with passion and vision this is very 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 much important if we get new students with no patience no vision they are, they don't they don't like to uh, to study in vocational then it's going to be it's not it's not going to work on so uh, promotions branding it's also most important things student achievement not only academic but also uh, competition of applied science sports art and leadership to be to be officially recognized within the curriculum that is part of soft skills leadership strong entrepreneurship yes entrepreneurships will be uh, mandatory within the curriculum so if we can manage to to come out with this kind of graduates i'm sure entrepreneurship uh, spirit will be much much stronger uh, and etc and etc so okay the challenge is this slide but the whole concept regulations and the things that we want to achieve we have the challenge that um, the mindset of teachers, principals, lecturers, uh, the head of departments, the director of polytechnics, we really have to change their mindset. I do not, I'm not saying that the mindset is still below there in the bottom level. No, it, it increased, yes. But we have to increase this, we have to improve this more rapidly. Uh, faster because we have to change the we have to catch up uh, the the bonus demography uh, moment that we have to, to to convert this into the the power mindset it, it means like if if we uh, if we plant something to the uh, soil with no uh, very less fertile soil. So it's like the mindset of character of teacher, lecturers, headmaster, and etc. Still not uh, fertile. Then how how uh, if we if we if we set up with a, a, a with a lot of money, then it just come up with tools and buildings. But the results is not what industry expect so we have to train we have to change the mindset teachers principals lectures they really have to understand this concept completely and holistically to be linked and match with industry to understand what industry one soft skills and characters stop only focusing on hard skills that's what i meant as long as teachers, lectures, they only focus on hard skill, they cannot, they, they do not know how to conduct project-based learning into their teaching uh, delivery, then I would say the, the soil is very, very less, very not, not fertile. So we have to realize this slide, these pictures. First is we invest a lot of money. It's been one year. And it's going up to four or five years from now. We, we really, we really, we are changing the mindset and character of teachers, lectures, and also uh, principals and directors. So when it's it's get fertilized, then the funding that we invest not only bleeding and tools, but the most important thing is the results or the the fruit is just what expected. And what is that? It's this. It's this character. So 
this is also one uh, challenge. Another challenge is that another cha challenge is that uh, we are now modifying the the um, how to emphasize to which degree that we are focusing more. So we now uh, only focus on uh, applied bachelor, applied bachelor, applied masters, diplom two and SMK. So we are not focusing too much more on diplom three or maybe diplom one. And this is the scheme of the sustainability of study programs. So SMK will be a SMK of three years with the minimum one semester of uh, internship, minimum one semester, could be more than one semester, or SMK to be linked with campus and industry. And we develop what so-called SMK diploma to fast track. So SMK and campus, vocational campus, to be uh, connected uh, with Diploma 2 fast track, not for semesters, but only three semesters. And only one semester, they got to go to the uh, Polytechnic uh, for uh, uh, study in the Polytechnic. But the last two semesters, they study while they work, internships what we call dual system. So we have to prepare also the industry to work together in, with this program. So it will be faster and it will create more uh, or, or stronger uh, soft skills because they, they really learn to swim by swimming. Mm -hmm. And Diploma 2 with four semesters, Diploma 3 is not, not too many. We want to improve all to Diploma 4 or applied bachelors. And we also applied what so-called Merdeka Belajar. Applied masters and in the future applied doctors. So this scheme will attract the young generations to choose their study path based on their passions, based on their visions, and based on what they love to do, not based on what parents tell, not based on uh, only certificate that they want to get. Because if the, the parents tell uh, their children to choose the path, study path, but with no patience, it's not going to work out. So that's what also has been happening in Indonesia. Many, many young, many uh, students, many uh, 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 young, young people in Indonesia, young generation of Indonesia, they decide their study path just based on what people say, based on what uh, parents say, based on just want to get the bachelor certificate, academic sometimes, not vocationals. But actually, they are not so strong on that uh, field of study. Or maybe their passion should be on the vocational to be more hands on. And that's what happened in Indonesia. And and this is very serious problem since if the new students or input for vocational education, students with no patience, with no strong patience, with no visions, then it's not going to work out. The whole system that I've been explained to you. This is the example of Diplom, Diplom 2, fast track. Uh, for example, Polytechnic in Bali to be connected with SMK. Uh, many SMK in Bali in the field of tourism and start from the end. Many, many uh, international hotels, for example, St. Regis, Hilton, Kempinski, Horizon, Conrad, they raise the demand of graduate for these uh, jobs, front office, food and beverage, kitchen and housekeeping. If you provide this with bachelor, it's too much. So instead of bachelor, we provide it with diploma semester study in the Polytechnic Negeri Bali and then the last two semesters they study while they work in the hotel and in Madiun in Madiun City it's uh, about the uh, train train technology so diploma two of um, welding and also train technology again and again start from the end 
based on what uh, Inca company expect, what kind of graduates they want to absorb. So I think that's all my uh, presentations. The last one is, yes, we have to also consider that the curriculum, the all curriculum in the this program, all this program should also implement uh, digital technology into it. That's also mandatory for the new curriculum. Since these 15 top skills for 2025 and the futures, it will be like this. <clears throat> and yes, PISA also as well. SMK also we have to, to deal with PISA concern as well. Not only uh, hard competence, but also literacy, numeracy, soft skills, and characters. Project-based learning, as I mentioned, is also uh, important solutions. And lectures should uh, also can perform as a facilitator, mentor, and coach. Because project-based learning, they perform as a facilitator. Do not only teach or uh, tell students always, but just make the students to be the center of uh, learning. OK, this is also change directions I also uh, mentioned. Uh, last but not least, uh, super test deduction also very promotion promote. It's also promising, but still yet not too much uh, use uh, strongly, because uh, industry some somehow still there is still gap between gap of understanding between industries and super test deduction. So it can be two hundred tax uh, deducted as incentive for any companies who uh, those uh, will uh, those are willing to spend uh, investment or support for vocational educations okay i think that's all my presentations uh, thank you very much and uh, looking forward to perhaps if there are any uh, discussion thank you very much thank you very much pawikan it was a great presentation please stay tuned because we'll be going to the panel discussion uh, following following this we now have uh, gunawan susanto uh, he's the country uh, general manager for aws indonesia uh, his his, call, his uh, presentation will be on skills building and the future workforce uh gunawan are you there yes i'm here Hi, Pagunawan. Welcome to the Indonesia Education Forum. It's an honor to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having AWS here. Thank you, Pa. Uh, would you like, do you have a presentation? Would you like to sh share a screen with us? Yeah. Sharing my screen now. All right, thank you so much, um, IDEF, and then uh, um, I think we, uh, and all the audience, um, good morning, good afternoon, um, depends on wherever uh, you are at. And um, for the next um, uh, uh, 15 minutes, I would like to share with you about um, how AWS approach and how do, you, do we see about the uh, skill gaps in the market, especially with Indonesia, and uh, what are we doing together uh, to support um, Indonesians and hopefully can um, you know open for a, a further discussions later on and welcome any feedback as well as a potential partnership later. So first one, uh, I think what what I would like to share is that is looking at that the skills and and we know that is um, uh, for the last twelve months we have seen that many businesses has been forced to change and they they need to move digitally as well, right? How do we see the 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 uh, market shift? Not only the consumer behavior, but uh, it's forcing uh, all companies, be it the, not only the tech startups, but also across that the traditional businesses that we are uh, very very um, uh, in need to move to the digital, uh, and that's actually also representing uh, the most uh, important. Um, um, gap that we have uh, or the barriers that we have for the business to move uh, faster into the digital, which is the skills. Um, we did 
um, uh, taking this um, um, under, or, or learning from global knowledge on their survey about the what are the most important IT skills for 2020. And there are 10 uh, skills here um, in the, uh, the IT today. And if you look at that, the, uh, the, all the skills um, that on the top left chart is uh, cloud computing there, but it's not only about only one side, but what I'm what, what we are seeing in AWS, if we're talking about the modern application architectures, how we are actually de um, developing the uh, software for the futures, um, talking about the data analytics, uh, talking about the AI machine learnings, it's all about you know the basics needs is actually uh, cloud computing. Why? Because the cloud computing is actually as a basic foundational uh, to enable these technologies or these um, uh, services uh, is available um, for everyone and um, providing that capability so that people no need to invest in a very uh, expensive capex, but they can start and consuming very small. We have plenty of uh, um, some of the local Indonesian's companies has been already starting executing and experimenting with the AI machine learning, even that is they are already uh, uh, in the live productions, right? So these are the skills that is, we see that is coming more to more, uh, more and more. Uh, it will be required for the future. And uh, looking at that, the little bit data point uh, back in the 2019 on on the LinkedIn platform alone, and this is only a LinkedIn platform, I believe that is uh, the, the opportunity out there is much, much bigger. Um, there are more, more than 260,000 cloud-related vacancies. And out of this, 20% is actually represented in Asia and Middle East. And about 57% is about that, uh, about the cloud um, skills is related with AWS. So what, what I would like to, to share here, the point is that is, um, this percentage showing that is at least from the uh, overall 12% uh, job related on the cloud um, requires the AWS skills. And, and this is representing only for Asia and Middle East alone. And it's not on what, what the, uh, the previous speaker mentioned about Wiccan. It's not only about the, the uh, technology itself, right? Um, and we, we do realize that is uh, the technologies, um, the cloud uh, is important for us to understand about the like AI uh, internet of things. But when it comes to adoptions, um, the biggest um, challenge is about the people and the processes. This is a statement from a, the, the, the industries or the, a lot of companies uh, overall, right? So how do we then building the people and the processes, because it doesn't mean that it's a company when they just moving their uh, applications or data to the cloud means that they are already digital or adopting cloud. It's, um, it's, it's not, on, not even a, a, a half portion of that. So it is requ require a fundamental changes and the upskilling in the people and also uh, upgrading or changing the, the, the processes inside the company as well. So. Uh, what we have seen the challenge um, uh, for adopting or uh, companies or industries adopting the cloud skills on the, this um, orange box up there is the technical skills, but we also seeing that is how these professional skills or maybe using Pat Wiccan's um, terms is the soft skills, uh, not only from the teacher's perspective, but what we are seeing from the workforce perspective it is that is the, the changes that people need to adapt, right? Um, of course, uh, I believe that the first point about uh, looking at that, how we need to be uh, virtually uh, available, which is not only working from home, but we need to start from a, a technical people perspective. That is, we have to be adaptive or get used with the managing all the tasks managing all the systems remotely and virtually as well, right? So previously, that is a lot of probably the IT people will need to see the servers or this uh, have the uh,
practicing is definitely is important because um, no matter what, it's um, the the fast changing world will require the data points to become to tell us which are the, the right direction or the decision to be made. And I think the, the the next two points where we see that is the passion for the learning and the change management is critical because we have seen that a lot of even IT professionals today need to be uh, reskilled in terms of how they 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 they, they need to be adaptive into uh, and and adapting the new technology so that they can be not only surviving in this the, the new demand but also accelerate and helping the companies to innovate even further. So. Um, what we are seeing, how, how we differentiate the skills is uh, basically everything or um, a majority is, well, if we're talking about the digital economy itself, of course, that is the majority of the pyramid, uh, the, the people will be on the bottom of pyramid where at least with the digital literacy, they, we, we, we can classify them as a digital users. And uh, for those professionals, what we are seeing the gap is, is how can we you know, uh, support the, the, the Indonesian's um, talents in terms of moving from just a digital users and up to the uh, top of the pyramids to become a digital creators it, uh, uh, itself. So that's where the cloud skills will play important roles where not only about the, uh, the, the how about the users, but also about the practitioner and at the end of the day, becoming the innovators and the creating all the this new uh, initiative. For example, like it doesn't, uh, you know, it, it is very possible today for just a new company or small businesses to use AI or machine learning using, for example, like uh, computer vision experiment and providing a new services so that they can they can make the differentiated uh, differentiation of their product or services with them uh, 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 against their competitors in the market today. Right, that's actually can be very accessible and, and it's very Hello back. Uh, we are back again. I think uh, we've just lost uh, connection to Pak Gunawan. Uh, we'll just wait a couple of minutes for him to come back on. Pak Yes, sure, I'm here. Okay, hi. Uh, we'll just wait a couple, maybe a few seconds for him to come back on. If not, um, uh, we can we can proceed with the uh, panel discussion. Yes, let's just give it a minute. Okay. Uh, all the other panelists are here. I see Leo here. I see Shreyasi here, and Pavikan. We have already heard. Yes, that's right. Pavikan is on standby. Pa Pavikan's presentation was quite eye-opening because uh, I did not know that Indonesia has such a large vocational education program as well, because all the time we tend to focus on the schools and the universities. And I did not know that part of it at all. It's very interesting. No, thank you, pa. we can. Yes, actually, currently, our regulation is to, to hold new programs in academic. But on the other side, for a vocational, campuses can still propose new program. Okay. So there will be more vocational programs in Indonesia. That's good to know. Hmm. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Nalan, maybe you can proceed with the uh, with I the think, panel uh, discussion. We can get started. Yes. And when Pagunavan joins, maybe I ask him to complete his uh, presentation. Yes, that's right. Okay. So let me take this opportunity to first welcome all the panelists. We've heard Pagunavan, and that was a very interesting presentation. We have. Uh, two other very distinguished members of the panel. We have Shreyasi Singh, who leads uh, Harappa Education, is a CEO and founder of Harappa Education, uh, which is uh, doing some path-breaking work, not only among professionals, but uh, among even the student community. 
she comes off a journalist background and uh, has written books on entrepreneurship like myself so i was very inter- intrigued when i read her uh, bio same with leo fernandez i have known leo for well over 20 years he gets younger by the day i get older uh, he leads uh, he has been in corporate life he was managing director of accenture for asia pac out of singapore we worked together in the past 20 years ago he leads a company called talentees again doing path breaking work among uh, school children um, i think he's touched hundreds of thousands of children's lives for all kinds of skills including leadership and entrepreneurial skills the topic that we've got today that we plan to discuss is digital transformation to improve learning outcomes i heard, was hearing uh, pa nadim the minister speak this morning and for those who could not who my panelists who joined later he made some very interesting points i have never uh, heard a minister articulate education the way he did he spoke of things like without autonomy for teachers there is no learning he spoke about if there is no uh, engagement with students with choice then there is no learning at all and engagement means developing critical thinking he spoke about job creation creating micro entrepreneurs because there aren't enough jobs he spoke about how universities have to become project oriented and simulate the corporate environment how universities don't allow teachers to be challenged very interestingly he spoke about classrooms of the future should not be quiet classrooms they should be noisy ones and why it is not engineers we need but people with an engineering mindset in light of all that it makes it even more difficult to reach to talk about how will we achieve these outcomes with the pace of digitization we've got now digitization today has overtaken education faster than even gaming which was by choice by people and the minister spoke about how it is uh, creating ch- children who are bored who are lonely and we are probably going to hit a mental he didn't speak about it but we what i think is we are probably going to hit mental health issues with children very soon <clears throat> So Pak Gunawan, you are back again. Would you like to complete your presentation? Yes, uh, thank you so please, much. Please go ahead and then we'll come back. I'll allow the, the Shreyasi and Leo to make their short presentations and then we'll dive into the panel discussion. Over to you, Pak Gunawan. I'll, I'll do it fast then. Um, so the, practically, so I, I was um, uh, off with this um, for the cloud skill challenge number one is the role based learning paths because we do realize that this is not only just about learning about the cloud skills then it is going to be you know people will be able to perform the job but uh, at the end of the day we need to uh, align it with what is actually the required uh, overall skills cap- or capabilities to be able to perform the roles and then how to validate the skills and then uh the programs which is i will be um sharing in in uh quickly in, in more details and also the employment readiness which is what we are do, uh, prof- trying to provide uh today is how we can actually also connecting the talents that we have been trained uh with the local partners at the same time also connecting with the what's the jobs available um on the learning path itself at least the five uh key uh, uh three roles uh or uh, the the learning paths that we are providing today and uh, uh starting with the very basic about the cloud practitioners up to the architecting on the cloud and then to become a developer operations and uh, uh data analytics and then from the uh, uh the skills validations on the certifications started with the foundational at the bottom left here um and then um the uh, students or the professionals will be able to take more uh advanced or intermediate level with the associates and then going to the professional as a solution architect um uh professionals or devops engineer professionals and then moving to the specialty when when you know uh, starting with the database security machine learning data analytics and of, of course last but not least is the advanced networking so 
we are seeing that is a lot more uh, 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 people or the, the IT professionals are taking uh, this professional certification so that they will be able uh, to present themselves and validate that they have the skills uh, in the uh, job in uh, uh, to perform the job in the market. And our program today, uh, we have the AWS Educate Academy and Training and Certifications. This is practically it's all. Uh, starting from the K-12 or uh, AWS Educate is supporting the K-12 and uh, uh, students starting age 14 and above, where this is more on the self-paced learning. But when it comes, uh, you know, uh, more advanced for a partnership with the, um, uh, the university, a lot of uh, our, uh, our AWS partners globally uh, also starting to adopt the AWS Academy where this is a ready-made curriculum and um, it's um, uh, classroom type uh, and also has the hands-on lab and so on and so forth. And last but not least is the training and certifications where this is um, meant to be for more on the professionals or uh, those uh, students or uh, the, they are already graduates, but they, 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 if they find that they need to do um, a lot more professional trainings that they can do with the AWS training and certifications. Specific for Indonesia, what I would like to share with you is that is um, uh, starting 2018 until last year, we actually have been doing a lot of partnership with the different um, partners locally as well, including Ministry of Education, Ministry of uh, Manpower, Ministry of uh, ICT, and um, previously also we we worked together with Backcraft, supporting Backcraft program. And typically what we have been training is uh, so far it's annual, um, um, previously it's um, like 20,000 people a year. But um, having said that, with uh, everything goes to the digital, uh, the first semester of 2021 alone, AWS together with all the partner ecosystem, we have been training uh, more than 20,000 students uh, so far. And what I can share is also an exciting program supporting the Merdeka Belajar from Ministry of Higher Education. We are actually already working with the five universities and two of them is already starting to roll on in this semester and the next three will be starting to roll on in the next uh, uh, next upcoming semester. So happy to see that is, this will be a um, um, uh, customized program for Indonesia and supporting the Ministry of Higher Education uh, programs. And um, I think I'm just going to skip these three ex uh, details um, and um, uh, what what I would like to share to the uh, audience here is that is um, in the futures, I mean, starting even from now, uh, where every uh, single businesses needs to adapt and adjust um, uh, going into the digital and together uh, to uh, address the requirements, even the changes of the from the consumer behavior, right? Everything is going to digital. We do realize that is it will take not only just one or two companies or a government alone for um, uh, 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 filling the gap on the skills. And it is remain true where the potential for Indonesia um, in the 2025, it is there, but it uh, for the becoming the, the uh, top 10, the, the, one of the largest uh, economy in the world, but that's definitely needs a skills, right? The, um, and for that matters, I think the, the partnerships, not only with the um, Indonesia governments and AWS, but uh, definitely a, a lot more uh, digital partners, uh, the trading partners and a lot of uh, ecosystem players in Indonesia, including that this hopefully that we can connecting the dots with our customers or partners locally here who needs the jobs or opening the jobs for these skills so that then, you know, um, uh, to be able to provide a closed loop um, uh, uh, solutions, and that's going to be also aligned with uh, Pak Wikan's presentations, right? Starting with the curriculum to be aligned with the industries, which is from our point of view in, in this matter is a cloud, and then um, uh, providing uh, the various programs up to the level, then, you know, uh, connecting with the jobs requirement. So I think that's my... Uh, presentations. Um, I'm back to you. Um, thank you. Oh, thank you, Pak Gunawan. Yeah. It was very interesting. We work with AWS in Indonesia and we can vouch for quality of work being done. 
Thank you, Nalini. I do have questions for you, but I'll take it up after we hear from the other two panelists. Uh, let's go to uh, Shreyasi. Shreyasi, will you be sharing a presentation? Sure, I can. I'll take five, seven minutes. I yes. If you can Thank share you. your presentation, over to you. Thank you so much. Okay, hi everyone and good morning and thank you so much for having me, Nalin, and um, the entire team. Um, I hope all the other panelists are doing well. Um, you know, I just thought that let me just present a slightly different uh, view of what learning is because I think learning is a journey for all of us and I think learning um, enables us and empowers us obviously to do so much. So I wanted to take sort of a moment to uh, make this much more a personal story of what uh, learning has been able to do. Of course, I'm the founder and CEO of a tech-enabled, venture capital-funded uh, online learning institution. But uh, being able to do that, and as Nalan was saying, being able to do that as I uh, charted a fairly unlikely journey to the point that I am an entrepreneur needed me most of all um, to learn efficiently um, and learn all the time and learn things I'd never imagined I would need when I was in college or the early part of my career. Um, and, and, and in trying to do that, in trying to be an efficient learning machine, really to be able to, you know, um, give wings to my own ambitions, and especially now being able to lead and build a learning company. Um, I feel like I have picked up a few tricks that I think are very, very important to talk about because I think we have to take learning away from just the systems approach to how each one of us personally adopts it. Um, this is really a nod to the unlikely journey that I have charted. And, and you know, I always say this, especially to young professionals and, um, and people younger than me or older than me or my age, is that, you know, um, if as a non-techie, non-MBA um, uh, person, I'm the founder and CEO of a digital uh, tech-enabled business, uh, you know, if I can do it, you can. But yes, you have to commit to learning um, learning a lot and, and being really excited about learning and being very efficient at it. And what has helped, helped me, right? What has been my building blocks of learning? And I think for me, um, especially as adults, for all of us, um, uh, especially as professionals um, who learn, at least in the sphere of professional, to be able to achieve something, I think we really have to understand that learning is not about knowledge. It is about action as an adult out in the world. You learn, you do, you know, you you figure out what works, you go back, you learn again. That loop is very strong and it's it's not about consuming knowledge or hoarding knowledge, but it's about learning everything and applying everything to action. So I do want um, us to have a very strong sense and that's exactly what we do at Harappa as well, is to give our learners, empower them with the ability to take action on the things that they are learning. Again, even at Harappa and, and certainly for my own personal learning system, um, I believe a lot in the power of behavior science um, as well as habit creation, whether that's wellness, nutrition, you run a marathon and being able to gym, work out, um, into this whole science of behaviors and good habits. And how have I used that? Podcasts are the way. And 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 the other thing that we need to realize is we love, you know, even though as 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 the world is just so challenging and difficult right now, especially in India, you know, our, our hearts break at what is happening right now. We also know that it is a golden era of learning and that the learning has been unshackled from um, the way you know uh, of bundles and packs the way that we assumed it you can learn from a variety of mediums and formats and you can learn in a variety of ways and you can learn from a variety of people my chosen form of learning which has really worked for me is podcast right I constantly say I'm like the biggest podcast junkie and everything's Certainly, to be an entrepreneur that I've had to learn over the last few years, I have learned through podcasts from some of the smartest people in the world without paying a single rupee um, in learning because these resources are obviously available to all of us uh, uh, for free and to get to And these are, of course, some of my favorite podcasts. And what has and how have I used that? How have I used podcasts, which just seems like an entertainment device and, and not maybe a learning device and converted that into becoming um, a way for me to actually learn is one, one that, you know, the art of science of learning calls that, you know, you have to create this loop um, 
of learning behaviors, reinforcing behaviors, contextualizing behaviors, and applying behaviors. So for example, how have I made podcasts my learning behavior is I, and now we've all been working from home, so that's been one of the biggest casualty of my podcast uh, consumption habit. But otherwise, I had a 40-minute commute to work um, every morning, and I would listen to a 30, 35-minute podcast every morning, right? It just became a routine. You're spending that time while you're, you're having breakfast in the car, you're also listening to a podcast, and I'll in the car and I'd start a podcast and by the time I went to work I would have listened and that became a behavior that I would do that I didn't leave the learning to chance I combined it with something that I was doing every day and I really built that behavior that 8 15 to 8 45 8 55 I was listening to a podcast five times a day right and of course that I kept reinforcing that behavior by ensuring and I think I've done that really two years in a, on a trot um, uh, before obviously uh, work from home out there and contextualizing behaviors I ensured that I would I would do is if there was an issue that I was going through at work we had to create a performance management system for employees at Harappa. I had to learn about branding and marketing for a B2B clients. That whole week, what I would do is I would uh, look for podcasts that naturally were talking about the issues that were top of mind for me. So I contextualized that learning to my specific situation, right? And I have the power and autonomy as an online learner to be able to do that. And because these were real life problems um, that I was dealing with in my work life, I could very quickly learn and apply them sometimes almost in real time so that the feedback loop is really important. I think that's, um, uh, you know, to simplify, I think in, in doing that, we just have to remember, and I constantly um, think about this, whether it's for our learners, and we have more than 300,000 learners on the, on our upper on education, um, or for myself, is there are essentially three parts of learning, the skill, how well you're able to do something, your proficiency of doing something. Now, it doesn't apply very well to podcasts, because everyone can be proficient in listening to a podcast, but for example, let's say running or let's say playing the guitar or let's say being able to present um, at a forum, right? And, and public speaking. What is your skill of being able to do that? First, you must understand that. Then most importantly, it's not about skill alone. It's about how much effort you put into practicing that skill. Some of us feel like we have actually great skills, but we don't put an effort into practicing them. Some of us don't have great skills, but just the sheer dint of effort we're able to um, really enhance our skills because of just how much effort and commitment we put to it. As well as the last is the confidence and the ability to overcome barriers that come in the way of us practicing a skill, right? So that it could be fear of public speaking. It could be fear of negotiation. It could be fear of talking money um, uh, if you had to do that with your manager or your employer or at an interview, right? Like you might actually have great skills, but you haven't honed them because you haven't made the effort and you don't have the confidence that if you come into an air pocket, you'll be able to solve it. So whether you're learning anything and whatever, wherever you are on that journey, think about the fact that whatever it is that you're trying to learn, what is really the skill that you have on it? What is the effort that you're putting in it? And what is the confidence that you have that you will be able to do it? As I wind down in just a couple of minutes, what I have learned in being able to learn, uh, run a learning institution that we've been very focused on learning outcomes and completion and engagement of our learners is one that, you know, curate the formats that work for you. The true power of online learning is just a variety, like I said. So think about, Genuinely think about how do you learn better? Do you learn better asynchronous or asynchronous? Do you learn better in blended or live classes? Do you learn when you write? Do you learn when you speak? Do you learn when you listen? Everyone learns differently. So please experiment and enjoy that. Set yourself mini milestones. I think learning is really tough. Um, I don't think we say that enough. So be kind to yourself and set yourself up for success so that you you're you you're not waylaid because the challenge just feels so big. And set yourself mini milestones and set those milestones in behavior what you can control. Can I control that I will listen to a podcast setting? Yes. Can I control that everything that I listen to, I understand and I'll be able to do? No. So let me create the milestones that I can um, uh, achieve. And in, in trusting that process and being able to run that process, you will eventually um, learn. You know, uh, they say what gets calendared and uh, schedule gets done. Put that, don't leave learning to chance, right? Uh, it's 
it's too tough put it on your calendar um and that's the only way to ensure that it will happen um you know we we talk about in 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 this world of technology and and online learning that um, data is our biggest um, um, um uh, source of strength of course it is but i think really motivation is everything and think really a lot about your own motivation i genuinely think that thing to crack the real innovation in learning is not data or technologies it is about motivation it is about how do we crack the motivation so ask us why do you want to learn something right um uh, and like i always say don't assume uh, motivation we really need to engineer it and by and you'll only be able to engineer it when you know um what really motivates you and as importantly what are your enemies of motivation or your enemies of learning so that you can stay away from them i'm going to stop here and go back to you namit thanks shreesi that was very interesting i mean uh, the toolkit is worth emulating and trying to practice uh, i'll come back to you for, with some questions that i have let's hear from leo and then we'll open up the panel uh, over to you leo are you going to share a screen Uh, yes nalan i'll just share screen go ahead um, can you uh, see my screen all right uh, nalan yes i can yeah so uh, good morning good afternoon um uh, to everyone um you know uh, like jaspal did i'd like to convey my condolences especially to the uh, 53 crew uh, the families of the crew of the indonesian submarine um on a happy note um, i think uh, delighted to be here especially with the um you know all the uh, uh, uh my indonesian friends particularly from the education sector um um until now the the my, my favorite indonesians were iko uwais uh, yayan ruhain uh, alex abad arifin putra from the raid movies so delighted to to meet other indonesian friends from the education sector so uh thank you nalin and uh, the team for having me um and uh, greetings to my fellow panelists honored to be uh, along with you on the panel um i thought i'd break this um, um brief uh, sharing into three parts uh, taking the the words from the team which is uh, digital transformation improving uh, learning outcomes um so i'm just going to move on to the uh, uh, first slides and we'll we'll take the word transformation um so i think uh, the first important theme that i think is useful for us to reflect on is that uh, design transformation must precede digital transformation uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes has been mark twain's i never let my schooling interfere with my um, education um and i think um, for us as we look at digital transformation in the education field i think it's extremely important to not treat digital or technology as a magical wand and i was delighted to hear park uh, ivan talk about that this morning that technology can't be uh, kind of slapped on uh, to education and uh, uh, automatically solve problems um, i think we can't afford to take a control c control v uh, approach uh, we need to be able to genuinely look at what transformation would mean um, i've personally walked uh, through many of the schools that uh, we work with at talentees which proudly announced themselves as digitally enabled and you would uh, as you walk past the classrooms you will see the uh, digital uh, board smart board firmly ensconced at the back of the classroom with the teacher you know still teaching at the blackboard some cases the teacher would use the whiteboard instead of the blackboard but not as much else has changed and i think uh, the challenge for us is to ensure that we really uh, reimagine uh, what the classroom should look like and and aim for transformation and not improvement i i think uh, just the the picture that i showed you earlier of the the car being pulled along on the bullock cart imagine putting a you know a 100 horsepower or 200 horsepower engine in that car uh, you're going to do damage to the car to the driver or the bullock uh, bullocks themselves so i think it's important for us to be able to um, you know look at what what we in our experience have found is that the soft part is the hard part i think uh, you know um, just just the previous speaker to me from um, uh, amazon park uh, gonoban also mentioned that that it is not technology that is usually the hard part it's usually the people and the processes that are the hard part and therefore if we look at the digital transformation opportunity i think we should not just look at um, you know managing knowledge 
but stimulating imagination. If we take the uh, Amazon books um, example, uh, we had Amazon take uh, physical books and digitize them in, in Kindles. And that was the first uh, kind of step in the journey of transformation. And much the same can happen in education. If we you know, just digitize and ensure that children are able to consume content um, online, it saves storage, it saves cost, and that's a good beginning. But I think Amazon also went ahead with audible books. So you're able to personally consume in the way that you like to consume your book. You're able to um, you know, move behind just reading times. And like Shreyasi mentioned, listen to it in the car uh, while you're driving to work. So the learning experience becomes a lot more continuous. And then finally, Amazon came up with Create Space, where you could create books and um, you know, publish your own books. And I think there are some useful signals uh, in, in that uh, parallel for us to look at digital transformation. I'm uh, reminded of the uh, Eric S. Raymond white paper, which he wrote in 1997 about software development, where he said that we move, needed to move from the cathedral style of software development, which was the traditional top-down, centralized, very structured, to the bazaar style, which was what Linux was doing at the time, right? The bazaar style of uh, technology development. And I think we have the same uh, lesson to learn in the education sector. Uh, I was so delighted to hear that uh, word of noisy classrooms from the education minister of a country, because that's exactly what we do at Talentees. We always say that if our classrooms are quiet classrooms, then it can't be a Talentees session going on. It has to be noisy. Uh, and I think um, hearing from um, Park Ivan this morning about crowdsourcing, about uh, you know, inputs being taken from teachers. That's exactly the kind of bazaar transformation that is required uh, if education really has to make the best of the digital opportunity. Uh, the second theme that I thought we'd take on is the word learning itself. I think most of us would agree that a lot of the, what we call education, um, you know, that, that passes for education in our schools and colleges is push education, right? Where, where children, uh, young adults are, are thrown onto an assembly line uh, where we have curricula designed for them. We have, um, you know, teachers um, um, trained in a particular way for them, and they're kind of pushed through the system. Uh, rarely do we find a, a full form of, of education. As Winston Churchill would say, personally, I'm always ready to learn. However, I don't always like being taught. And I think that is a beautiful um, uh, lesson for us when we look at this word learning. The challenge I think for us um, in education, whether in India, in Indonesia, or anywhere uh, in, in countries with challenges like ours, is to take the classroom and convert it from a teaching place to a learning space. Um, as as uh, Erno Rubik would say that it's, uh, learning is not the accumulation of knowledge. It is building the capacity to find new possibilities in novel circumstances. I think all of us educators um, on this uh, uh, webinar, I think must ask ourselves if, are we doing this in our classrooms? Are we really building the capacity to find new possibilities in novel circumstances? Um, so if we go back to what is the digital transformation opportunity for learning, we, for, for all of us as educators, I think going back to Bloom's taxonomy would help. Uh, we all recognize that the bottom of the pyramid is all that happens in most of our classrooms sometimes, which is, I remember. But are we uh, getting children to understand? Are we getting students to apply? Are we helping them to analyze, to connect and synthesize, to evaluate, uh, to create? You know, that really is what learning, um, uh, the, the learning pyramid is about. I remember when I used to teach my son um, algebra uh, and I wanted to be sure that he had understood a concept, I would always ask him to set a question paper. And when he set a question paper was when you know, I felt that he had really understood the concepts. So I think the digital transformation opportunity is how do we make Bloom's taxonomy real in our classrooms? Can we use digital to help children climb uh, the, the Bloom's uh, pyramid all the way uh, to applying, to analyzing, to evaluating and creating in the classroom? Um, Park Ivan spoke about flipped classrooms and I think that's a huge opportunity to be able to really take the teaching and keep that outside the classroom and convert the classroom into where the learning happens, the discussion, the debate, uh, the collaboration, the peer-to-peer -peer learning. And I think technology has an immense uh, uh, potential to be able to achieve that. And finally, I think learning is an extremely personal 
uh, journey. I think many of you uh, familiar with multiple intelligence will know that uh, every child in our classroom is, is intelligent, just in different ways. But our current education system often uses a standard one size fits all approach. And here we, we have the opportunity that technology could give us of create, creating that ideal classroom of one where technology can help children consume um, knowledge, learning in the way that best suits them at the pace that best suits them and helps them develop their own unique gifts uh, and strengths. Um, Third theme that I thought we'd spend time is on those words uh, about improving outcomes, which is all about measurement. And I think uh, uh, we, we briefly um, saw this uh, theme in, in, in the earlier presentations as well, which is what if we are improving and what if we are measuring from the wrong base? Um, Einstein would say that I never teach my pupils. I only attempt to provide the conditions in which they can learn. Um, and therefore, I think for um, us in, in looking at digital transformation, many of us will agree that uh, we are preparing students for a 21st century future with 19th century measurements. Uh, examinations often create what we is called the ludic fallacy that Nassim Taleb in his book, The Black Swan, talked about the ludic fallacy, where we can uh, you know, think we have prepared students, but they are ill-equipped to handle real life challenges, real life problems, because we have not given them the skills and values to deal with that. Um, in the outsourcing world that Nalan and I used to be, we used to often joke that metrics and data are sometimes used like the drunk uses of lamppost for support rather than illumination. Um, and we should not uh, fall prey to that same danger in education where uh, you know, we just measure data, um, we, we just look at all the metrics that are possible but fail to understand what are the insights that we, we draw, what are the right insights that we draw, and how can it be used to benefit every single student. Uh, UNESCO speaks about four learning goals, right? The first being uh, learning to know, uh, but uh, the next three talk about learning to do, learning to live in harmony, and learning to be. And I think, again, most of us will recognize that our classrooms today generally take that first goal of learning to know, but rarely spend time on the learning to do, learning to live in harmony and learning to be. And I think again, um, the digital transformation opportunity gives us a pathway to be able to try and do that. Also looking at personalized outcomes. My good friend, Dr. Arun Pereira, who used to be a faculty in charge of faculty effectiveness at ISB uh, Hyderabad. He used to talk about the metaphor that as teachers, we sometimes look at children as blank canvases that come into our classrooms on which we have the license to paint. But in reality, each child, each learner comes into our classroom already painted on with their colors, their experiences, uh, their background, their gifts, their talents. And therefore, we are painting on already painted canvases. So when we paint blue, uh, it's painted on a yellow, it's painted on a red. And therefore, technology can really try to develop those personalized outcomes rather than the cookie cutter approach that today's examination system takes. So the digital transformation opportunity gives us the ability to try and get a 360 degree view of student capability, look at dynamic assessment rather than just static exams, uh, customize content for students, help them learn at their own pace. Um, and therefore, I think uh, if we look at these three areas of you know, transformation, not just improvement, if we look at learning, not just teaching, and if we look at what, what we can do to improve outcomes by measuring the right things and uh, measuring all of this, I think, with the child at the center. I think what, what uh, education and the digital transformation needs most to do is to ensure that we're not putting curricula, we're not putting school infrastructure. It was music to my ears to hear, um, you know, uh, uh, Pake Van talk about uh, teacher training being more important than school infrastructure. Uh, I often joke with school principals that we meet that they are often focused on great school buildings, but that's not the same thing as building great schools. Uh, so that's really going to be the effort that we will all need to take as educators. Um, uh, one, one final uh, word, I think, in terms of the soft part being the hard part, and forgive me if this is a political hot potato, is that I think we also need to treat English not as a language, but as a skill. 
uh, very often in many of our countries when English is not given priority, I think our students lose out both in terms of contributing to a global workforce and also in terms of being able to absorb the global learning resources that are available. So I think it's important to treat uh, English as a skill, not just as a language, and ensure that it becomes part of this digital transformation journey. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. Over to you, Nalin. Um, as as uh, I think you would say in uh, uh, Bahasa, it's Tarima Kasi. So thank you so much. Um, uh, at Talentees, we are very proud to be part of this journey, working with children and young adults on leadership skills and values, and delighted to be able to spend this time with my fellow panelists and all the guests you have on. God bless. Thank you, Leo. That was very insightful. Some of those pictures were hilarious, and the sports brought back memories of school myself. Uh, our company is likely to partner with yours as well as Shreyas to bring the, some of your the top end uh, courses and curriculum and learning uh, content to Indonesia after suitably adapting it to the country. But let's get into a few questions. Uh, I'll come to you, Pavikan, first. You spoke, first, you surprised me uh, with the scale of your vocational program, right? I did not realize that it was that large. But you spoke at length about internship, industry partnerships, and how to bring all of it together. How do you how do you foster this collaboration in the digital age? How do you bring them together? Uh, are you facing? Uh, do you find ready acceptance in Indonesia from industry to partner with uh, uh, the ministry? Oh yes, um, yeah. Of course, we are we are facing some challenges. First thing is from our side that the teachers, principals, lecturers, their mindset is still back there. So we need new mindset, more open, um, not only teaching, but to develop the learning ecosystem. That's the thing that we have to, uh, to deal with and to make our college to be able to understand what industry need, what the labor market want and then to put it into the curriculum and teaching methodology. That's one thing. But of course, on the other side, from the industries. Um, um, actually, it's been progressing. It's been Im improving. I mean, uh, we are improving that. Uh, in the last few years, uh, in the last few years, uh, it gets better, but of course, the industries, those industries that we have to, to keep penetrating them to understand um, if they wait, if they await the products that we cook, that we produce in the, uh, in the back there, it's not correct. Just move forward and then make the recipe together, make the menu together, cook the together, and then prepare the internship uh, together so they can get uh, attached with the talent in the uh, in the beginning so that's the thing that we we have to keep uh, explaining to the to the to those industries but it gets better in the last few years it gets quite much better that's cool. and and then and then we also also have to uh, improve some regulation as well and also super tax deductions that's also quite promising. Yeah. The uh, amount of uh, work and the number of areas that your ministry is touching is phenomenal. For those who don't know, Indonesian education system is probably the most diverse and challenging in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. In India, many people think India is difficult, but then if you broke India up into 17,000 islands, you will know what I mean. It's really diverse, really difficult. Great work there. Uh, Paguna one, I uh, heard you speak uh, and I was very interested by, by uh, you know, the aim of ultimately making digital creators, or facilitating digital creators rather than just people who are digitally aware. Now, you spoke about a human adaptability to technology. In, in, with what is happening in the pandemic, do you see that accelerating from uh, your AWS perspective? Is, are people more adaptable? Are they more open to adopting? Yeah, I think um, uh, for obvious examples, um, uh, we are all being forced to uh, work from home, right? 
the concept of ideas of um, doing this um, was never been there before, or at least uh, not easily accepted, right? Um, most people tends to have a face-to-face -face meeting rather than having a, a conference call. But nowadays it's like the uh, people the other way around, right? It's better to have a conference call or the, the Zoom call or whatever platform it is. And that's actually uh, one, one more thing that is uh, unlocking um, um, the potential through these uh, virtual meetings. Uh, number one is productivity, obviously. Number two is that is uh, from the access to the um, reaching out to the subject matter expert and uh, executive globally to support Indonesia companies. It's even bigger, right? Because previously with the face-to-face, -face, of, of course, that is facing the challenges of scheduling these global experts to come down physically in Indonesia. But now it's more the matter of um, scheduling it correctly so that, they, that we can cater the, the different time zones. That's one particular example, the real examples, how we are changing the behavior. But uh, the other key indicators, for example, like how we are seeing that is our user signups is growing significantly um, for the last 12 months. That's another, uh, another uh, metrics that we are seeing where you know the uh, uh, people adapting to the technologies, not only just um, uh, only realizing that is cloud is important, but we are seeing even now now small medium businesses are onboarding to the cloud faster than before. Thank you. That's uh, that's good to know and that's interesting as a trend. Shreyasi, you are more into you know uh, as going through your company's website, probably started more with training professionals into specific skills and then moving backwards and now you have university programs as well. Preparing people, campus to corporate kind of programs, preparing them for the corporate world. You spoke about proficiency, skill, practice, confidence, gave a toolkit. How, how are you able to do this in the digital world? How do you do it digitally? Or, or is it just a phase you have to wait it out? Uh, hi, Shannon. Um, we work both with students um, in higher education institutions as well as professionals uh, as well employees in, in enterprises. So in that sense, that we transcend learners between 18 to 45 really and um, and therefore have a lot of people um, that we can observe. No, I actually feel like a lot of the um, elements in the toolkit of learning that I spoke about and if you were to drill down just on the skill, effort and confidence bit, I think um, I think we have to understand, I think Leo was saying this and I missed some of the earlier discussions obviously in the morning, um, but I think it's really important to understand what you use technology for when, right? Like I said, that of course it can't just be a magic bullet. It is not a magic bullet that works for everything. And I think uh, the two, the, the couple of two advantages of um, of using ed technologies or, or online uh, for learning is being able to um, set some of these frameworks and process like the so for example if we were to say about um, uh, skill right um, now constantly for example speaking effectively is one of the flagship courses on Harappa uh, that's a course that a lot of people I, I think feel the need and the pain of if they're not don't have the confidence that they're able to speak well and we've got so many people to get on now now a skill like speaking is whatever uh, however great one course is or not there is no way that you can make a meaningful difference in being able to acquire that skill through a one-time intervention right it is a skill that needs almost a continuous drip feeding of of both exposure to content, good exercises, and then for you being able to practice, right? And you need that over a larger, uh, over a long period of time. And not for all of those things, can you obviously always have an instructor or a faculty with you. So for example, we have created something called the habit drills, right? And if somebody is on our speaking course or program, can you every day send them a five minute habit drill in which they can actually do and practice rather than just consume because some skills like this can only become better because you do. We have created a video submit feature because one of the big things cognitive neuroscientists will tell you, especially on skills like speaking, is if you watch yourself do uh, how you've done, that is, and you mirror your own sort of, you know, work product to yourself, that has a huge um, uh, uh, trigger to improvement. So I, the platform 
asked me in a fully asynchronous manner a question i'm able to record my 40 second one and a half minute response i'm able to submit that right the, you, the platform gives you some automated response but more importantly what it constantly keeps triggering you to do is saying hey watch what you said watch yourself do it it's like practicing in the mirror right and then repeat again and then repeat again and that that kind of practice is almost impossible for us given sort of the challenges both in indonesia and india of the large number of people that we need to train you need to be able to set up systems that work asynchronously and go towards um uh, practice of skill effort right you can give goal setting for learners on the platform to do so you can immediately capture and intent right you have to, especially when you work with adults you can't treat them like captive prisoners in a classroom right you have to give them agency uh, so that they can do so you say hey what is your learning goal for this week do you want to spend 45 minutes do you want to spend 30 minutes do you want to spend 60 minutes right and then once somebody does that it's almost like on instagram or whatever you did hey today you know you have a timer your 15 minutes are up can you say listen this week you didn't come back to the platform and did did your 60 minutes you only have 3 days to do can we send you two whatever so there are i i feel like on some of those on being able to mass personalization at scale and this mass trigger towards the right learning behavior is almost only possible if you use technology um, especially if you want to work with a large number of them and we do some of that i experience some of it myself you know i i tell some of my sessions that the best way is watch one of the your own videos when you were at a party Absolutely. or something and you won't recognize yourself and if you hear yourself you won't believe it's you because in our minds we all have this heavy booming voice but when you actually hear yourself you sound like almost squeaky <laughs> that's that's the way recording oh works. you are so very filler words right you know I, there's only that much you learn and there is a thing about role modeling so there's only that much you learn from watching great orators like a barack obama but there's much more you learn from watching and observing yourself right so i think this practice of self reflection and self observation is very critical to learn so coming to you leo you made uh, interesting points it was not just one topic of english skills which was question, uh, you know debatable from your side the point i liked was you need a design transformation before digital transformation all the tools technologies infrastructure is set for a particular curriculum to be taught in a particular way in a particular setting suddenly you go digital people are doing the same thing except that they are in front of a camera right. what needs to change what is this design transformation that you see happening now thanks thanks nalan and i think uh, that that's extremely critical for us i i think you and i we've had some experience in the outsourcing business before and we used to always tell our clients that if you throw throw dirty linen over the wall it's going to stay dirty on the other side just in someone else's uh, you know backyard so we used to always insist on reengineering on transformation to to proceed uh, that kind of an outsourcing journey and i think the same thing needs to happen in education uh, the biggest challenge i think as most of the speakers have highlighted is the battle in people's minds um i think for us to be able to look at the classroom as a place where the child is the boss and not the teacher where the child's uh, needs and uh, you know are more important than a curriculum's uh, you know requirements i think that is the first transformation that needs to happen in all our classrooms whether in india uh, indonesia or anywhere where we realize that we are in the service of the child i think that's the first big transformation the second is for the teachers to re redefine their own roles I, i i do know that several teachers have an insecurity that uh, technology may replace them uh, that uh, you know technology will make them less important uh, i think that is a, a myth you you you're just uh, dancing with ghosts on that one i think the teacher's role needs to be redefined but it will only strengthen i, I think technology will only be a tool so teachers need to redefine and say that look i don't need to be the person who knows everything i don't need to be the person with all the knowledge at the tips of my fingers uh, i just need to be able to facilitate that happening for the student and and here are a lot more tools at my my disposal so i think these are the kinds of transformations and particularly for policy makers i think policy makers uh, rarely take that uh, ground up view it's very much a top down what i call the cathedral style 
of, of policy making. Whereas what you do need for education to genuinely transform is a bazaar style. And this is, I think, particularly true of a place like Indonesia, where you're geographically uh, spread out, local situations will so be so distinct that uh, are we listening to the teacher on the ground for what will best serve her in her rural classroom? And one of the voices that I think nobody listens to, policymakers, principals, is the voice of the child. I, I've, I've uh, seen so many surveys and you know assessments of a school's effectiveness done where everybody is asked questions except the child. Um, and I think it's important to get that back. So I would say in, in a nutshell, that's the kind of design transformation that needs to precede um, any digital transformation. Otherwise, we may just end up with improvements rather than the transformation that we are targeting. Right, so you make important points. I, I, I repeat it myself. In every industry, people go speak to the client and then set up a business and a product. In education, nobody speaks to the students. Yeah. Nobody asks them what they want. Nobody asks them what they feel. Till of course, they scream at home. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'm going to come to each one of you for your closing comments and to answer one common question. And just take a minute or a half to close with your closing comments and to answer that one common question. I hear from parents all the time that children today are smarter. They have information at their fingertips. They're smarter than even the teacher in the classroom. On the other hand, we have seen digitization in various industries has made things faster, cheaper, better. We could argue, but generally faster. So the, my question to you, common to each one of you, to answer with your closing comments is, why does it still take the same amount of time to get the same degree? Engineering four years, medical five years. Why do we have 10 plus two? Why do we have K-12? Why is not K-6 now? If children are smarter, if information is at our fingertips and everything has become faster, digitized, et cetera, and in every other industry, things have shortened the time span. Why are children being put through the same grind Nothing has changed for them. Uh, Pave Khan, I'll come to you first with for your closing comments and answer to that question. Yes, thank you for the very challenging questions. Um, as I as I mentioned to you that um, yes, we still uh, we still. Uh, implement the same durations of period for uh, studying or learning for our children. It's 12 years uh, and another, uh, and uh, yeah, 12 years at least, and for the higher education. But uh, as I mentioned to you that, um, first thing is that we improve the curriculum. We improve, we, we do improve the curriculum. So it's it's more what exactly the labor market or the industry expect. Um, more likely, it used to be a push system, not pull pull system. So we, we we improve that quite significant, quite significant. More soft skills, more project based learning, and etc. And next thing is that um, as for the SMK. They don't have to go for the campus or university. They are more ready for the uh, for the job market, and we also implement or we mix some uh, innovations. For example, connecting SMK and campus, SMK three years and a diploma two, but not two years, but only one and a half years or two semesters. So it's it, it's faster, one semester faster, and only one semester studying in the campus, and the last semester fully they go to the to the industries with the dual system uh, methods of uh, teaching. So they they work while they study. So we make some change. We make some change, um, and then we improve the curriculum. And last but not least, I, I forgot to explain to you that currently our minister. Is uh, developing uh, a platform that that will connect the supply and demand uh, from from early phases, from earlier um, uh, industries can can put uh, what they want, uh, 
what kind of graduates they want and what they expect. Or in the other hand, the, the students can be also quickly uh, detected by the industry since they start uh, study in the SMK or in uh, campus. So, but the flat platform, I think, will be some some more time to to uh, to implement. Thank you. I Bobby. think that's my that's it. that's all my my answers. Thank it's, you, Bobby Khan. It's very that challenging and very back to you, Banali. <laughs> Yes, Nalin, very great questions. And um, I think from, from my end, I'm, I'm not an expert for education um, uh, to be able to speak, uh, uh, to, to answer so why, but what I can share is that is from AWS point of view, what we, what, what we are seeing that is uh, the demand for becoming faster and faster, uh, it is there. For example, on software development itself, um, a lot of companies, if we uh, want to cut down the, the uh, time to market for developing their product or services, right, from months into weeks and into days now, it's made possible, but it will take uh, a lot of process. And from AWS point of view, we believe in the culture of experimentations. So in this case, for supporting Indonesia, what we are doing is that we do currently doing a, a few experiments not only taking our programs like uh, already available globally through AWS Educate Academy and training and certifications, uh, the, the Merdeka Belajar program together with the Ministry of Education definitely is one of the experiments that we're doing. Uh, we do realize also that is uh, uh, beyond a classroom. Uh, IT is actually need us, uh, um, is, is one of the industries where the applied skill is actually more relevant than just a degree, right? So. Uh, what we are doing now in another experiment is working with a local partner like uh, Decoding. Uh, we, are we, we are working together with them uh, developing a back-end developer programs where inside that it's already been embedded uh, cloud practitioners and also architecting on the cloud. The expectation is that is people who is graduate from this program will be able to become a de back-end developers, which is one of the role uh, uh, job role that is required in the Indonesia market today. So that's the second experiment. The third one is actually we are also looking at that how our programs through the uh, local partners, uh, um, uh, Sagasitas Educating uh, K-12, uh, absorbing uh, some of the AWS Educate programs, but modified in such a way, at least for a, a starting point, our uh, experiment uh, target is to get this K-12 uh, uh, students uh, if they graduates, they can at least build a website. That's a, 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 a small experiment that we want to do, right? Because we, we believe on the innovations, it will require um, a, a, a small steps of innovation. So these are the, the existing experiments that we are doing currently for Indonesia. And we do expect that is, you know, welcome to the, any kind of a partnership so that we can uh, do a lot more experiments. And with this, uh, the, uh, setting the right goals, setting the right metrics, it's a very important one so that we will know that it's not only just because of, you know, training how many students uh, the, the, uh, for, uh, for the publications and for looking at that good in, in front of media, but what we are looking for, it's really on the fundamentally, which are the one that is will give a significant results for the market itself, which is at the end of the day, creating that uh, skills that is ready for the market. Thank you. Thank you, Pagunawan. Uh, Ibu Shresi, we'll come to you and then to Palio, uh, but in a minute, that question and your closing remarks. Sure. So I think that is a really provocative uh, and interesting question. And, um, and you know, we don't work with uh, school students at Harappa, but of course, I'm, I'm a parent and I have a son in middle school. So I'm not sure about them being much more intelligent. Uh, I think they know more uh, and they can work many more machines faster. But I think that it's really important to understand that uh, um, I think with uh, what the pandemic, especially and this complete move to online learning, especially for schools, have taught us parents all that 
school was a great bundle product, right? It's a daycare plus a sports center plus a recreation center plus a uh, pl plus a place where you uh, polish and refine your interpersonal skills when you learn discipline and regiment and routine. And I think in a true life skills education, I think each one of those has value. I don't think schools is just about um, imbibing content. And then just think about when you know when you start to think about multiple intelligences. Um, is 10 plus 2 right? Is 9 plus 3 right? Is 8 plus 4 right? Right for whom? Right for what? Right for when? Um, I, I think it's very, very difficult to substitute this system with one system that works for all. I think what would be really useful, and I think eight is to have these conversations and think from a first principle thinking into why does my child, for example, really need this system, right? And I think to be able to create, I think both for school systems as well as higher education systems and professional learning, multiple entry and exit points into back and forth into education, right? To say that you don't have to finish everything at one go. So for example, you can do a one year college um, uh, uh, leaving certificate or whatever, work for five years in an apprenticeship model, go back and then do a master's or a degree of depth, right? So I think what's more useful is in this great unbundling is for us to be able to chart truly unique parts where for a breadth of skills where I just need to be above average, right? I need to do a certain kind of basic minimum criteria. And then almost like in, in my model of a T-zone or whatever, the T, e, the vertical depths that I need to build in, uh, in skills of my choice or my interest or my aspiration, I go deep and do longer term programs, right? I think systems move at glacial pace um, um, and, and I think we've just gotten used to a system, but I, I, I do think that it's going to, um, I do think it's going to change. And I don't want to put this onus just on educators. I think this onus is as much there on employers and parents to value the right things because as educators, we will, um, uh, you know, we will tell educators to be progressive but then as a parent you you have to catch yourself and uh, uh not you know uh, go after your child uh, for ensure that they get the right grades and do the right things and employers also then have to be able to a first value the kind of new skills that they want and b then have a fair system for measuring the kind of new skills that they have so i think it's a very very complicated um, uh, solution if you had to really um, disrupt the system Thank you. Leo, if you could have a final word, we are absolutely at a hard stop. Yeah. Thank you, Nalin. I think uh, uh, your provocative question, I don't think the, the right question is whether we need to shorten the time. I do believe that uh, age-wise, just as you would say that a, a young person has a marriageable age, which is the right age to get uh, you know married, I would say we don't need to shorten the time. I think the re right question to ask is what are we doing with that time? Um, I think left to policymakers, uh, it's Parkinson's law, right? You know, uh, expand the curriculum to fill the time available. So that's why we learn, uh, you know, benzene ring and periodic table and, you know, things that we never end up using with, uh, in, in life. So I think the question to ask is, what is the purpose of education? Uh, I think it would be uh, uh, foolish to assume that education's only purpose is to prepare people for careers, to prepare people for work. I think the question to ask is that education needs to prepare children for life. And I think that's what we need to ask ourselves is, are we spending time not just on knowledge, uh, not just on skills, but also on values? Um, and I think that's where the time is best spent, uh, giving children the right things in that time that we're preparing them for both work as well as for life. Thanks, Nalin. Well said, Leo. Uh, thank you very much to all our panelists, Pavikan, Pavunavan, Ibushesi, Leo. Thank you very much. I think it was a very good session. Uh, have a great day. We look forward to you joining us again sometime in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Back to you, Shoaib. <clears throat>
Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Nalan, for hosting that session. It was very instructive, I think, and uh, for all of us, uh, even as adults, to see how we can continue to learn. Uh, and also thank you to all the speakers for sharing your valuable insights and time with us. Thank you so much. Uh, we are now going to move on to our next speaker. Um, uh, Mishwata Kurana. She's, uh, she's going to be talking about building an AI ready generation. Uh, Shweta, of course, is a good friend and a long time partner with us. Uh, she's the director of APG Global Partnerships and Initiatives Group at Intel Corporation. Shweta, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Nice to see you again. I hope you're all safe. I'm good, yes, keeping safe, uh, tough times, but uh, I guess we'll all sail through it sooner. Yes, okay. yes, I think so. Down the line. Okay, yes, uh, so uh, we'll, uh, you have a presentation? Yes, I'm just sharing my screen, please let me know if this comes up. Okay, we can see your screen. Perfect. All right. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. So I'm going to be talking about what is it required if we want to build an AI ready generation in Indonesia? And why do we need to do that in the first place itself? Why is it that today AI is taking such acute importance in all our discussions, whether we are talking about healthcare, whether we are talking about keeping people safe, whether we are talking about safety, whether we are talking about analytics at large. So what is AI and why is it important? If you just trace back to a couple of decades, right? Um, 1980, I still remember there was this era where we wanted to compute or digitize everything. If it can be digitized, let's do it. This was an era when spreadsheets, Word documents were just gaining importance where everybody wanted to learn technology, everybody wanted to understand how to use technology to improve their productivity in order to function better. And I'm not just talking about education at large, but even in the work environment. Moving a decade ahead, we are all started focusing on networking everything. Let's get connected to the big bang network. So it was, there were conversations around how do we network our devices? And when I talk about devices, it's not just the laptops or the computers or the desktops or the whatever we are using, but how do we create a network where we can share communication more effectively through all the devices which we use? A decade later, the mobility phase happened. Everybody started talking about building apps, apps to make our lives far more convenient than what they were at that point in time. And Another decade later, which is 2020, just recently, is where we started focusing on cloud. How do we cloudify it? How do we ensure cloudification can keep our data, our resources safe? But today, what we're talking about is something which is an amalgamation of all that we've learned, not just a couple of last decades, but I would say through the industrial revolution as and when they've progressed. So we are talking about 100 billion intelligent connected devices being available to us. And there is this whole pattern of distributed intelligence. Now, why is this important to us? This is not just important to us because we are concerned about education. We are concerned about jobs of tomorrow. We are concerned on how do we develop our workforce, both current and future workforce. But this is important for us because we need to live in this environment. It's the way we live, the way we work, the way we play. So if you're going to be living in this entire uh, system where we have 100 billion connected devices around us, I think what is acutely important is how does humanity, which is coming online, which is creating this digital footprint, handprint, network, how do we uniquely build and deliver on it? So in this era, 
there is this conversation where it says that artificial intelligence has the potential to deliver global economic activities of 13 trillion dollars by 2030 which is 9 years from now and indonesia specifically is saying that the contribution which ai can give to indonesia's bottom line or the economic growth is 336 billion us dollars which is pretty significant so with ai everywhere precision agriculture optimization of energy resources delivery of education i mean given the pandemic the situation has changed right we were talking about disrupting education today we are disrupting not only just education in entirety but where do we deliver education children are working from home they are trying to understand learn comprehend and gain knowledge no matter where they are people are working from home so the workplaces have got disrupted governance using ai for better or good governance finance blockchain analytics are not unknown words any longer in the terminology of finance and it goes on and on so no matter which industry do we all associate ourselves with we may not essentially work with but we associate ourselves with no matter which industry do we really want to garner skills in ai is an underlining component across all of them so going ahead if we talk about the way our world has functioned has changed which means the future of work has changed which means the job landscape has changed now work tasks have changed tasks which could be delivered or can be delivered easily by machines are being managed by them we are slowly in a position where we are handing over all the repetitive functional tasks to the machines to do in turn what we are getting is a huge demand of tasks which human beings we as human beings can do and the human machine interaction in itself is a huge subject of study today there are there is a lot of research going on on how would human and machines correlate how would they function together what would be the association of what is it that a machine can do better and what is it that a human being can do better and how would they work together or in fact how would they work with each other going ahead so there is a growing job demand and those jobs are basically it's not that many are new jobs that's what we get to hear but in many cases the jobs themselves work so let's talk about certain skill sets which are required what humans do best right humans can lead they can improvise they are brilliant creators and specifically in indonesia with my experience of being in indonesia there is one huge takeaway which i got back with me once i moved out of indonesia and i spent almost 3 years there was the level of creativity and ingenuity which exists in the youth in indonesia they can judge and they can empathize whereas machines can do transactions so whether it's one or whether there is billions and trillions of transactions which have to be done in a given period of time machines can do that better they can iterate they can predict better because they have that capacity to process and synthesize all the data which can be made available to them which would be extremely difficult for a human mind to do so and that accordingly they evolve they can make themselves intelligent as much as human beings can through that process of what we all know as lifelong learning so there is this rise of fusion skills which is happening today between human beings and between machines let's talk about a couple of tasks what are the tasks and how are they really taking a radical shift to understand what are the skill sets which we as human beings need to learn not just at any age we may be but also get into the education system and that is how we build an ai ready generation so there are certain jobs jobs like a videographer right who would manually control his camera adjust it to meet a changing environment who would work on the settings but in the future our expectation is that the actual task of videography may be managed by a machine but the videographer would be involved in how do you create an engagement between the machine which is the intelligent camera and between the subject which has to be photographed or videographed rather than just changing the camera settings 
or a bank loan officer, right, who today would manually perform calculations. He has to assess credit worthiness of applicants. But tomorrow, the assumption is that there would be AI-generated recommendations. In fact, a lot of insurance companies and banks have already started deploying that for loan approvals, where an AI would study the pattern of an individual and then define whether a loan has to be accredited or not. And the bank loan officer would instead then focus on how, do you, how does he or she generate new value offerings for the customers. Similarly, a customer service officer. I mean, we all love to shop online, right? And we also know that when we shop online, the first level of interaction is with the chatbot. So at the end of the day, it's with the machine, but the machine cannot really resolve an issue directly. So instead of savings, of, my apologies, instead of letting a human being interact at the first level and spend a lot of time on basic interactions which a machine can do, the human being's time is being spent better to actually solve problems which a machine cannot do. Similarly, tasks are evolving towards human-machine partnerships. How do they work together? But when human beings and machines get to work together in that world which we today are living in, which knowingly or unknowingly, we may not even have started deploying an element of artificial intelligence, there are a lot of emerging socioeconomic issues which we can talk about. There is a whole social contract at risk, right? The new way jobs which we talk about, data annotation, image classification, speech transcription, these are the new era jobs. Is there a social contract which is not being looked into while we prepare the future workforce for those jobs? There is a lack of diversity. We've all heard that, that the algorithms which are being created and run by um, multiple entities today, algorithms which can possibly enable me, for example, in the given pandemic, to get a hospital bed much easier than somebody else. Is there a diversity data set which is being used to build that algorithm in the first place? Or does it recognize me as a different entity which does not belong to the part of that data set? So there is a huge conversation happening between where do we get the data from? How good or bad is it? How clean is it? Or how do we clean that data? How do we utilize it to ensure that we take care of all the diverse occurrences which have to be um, looked into when we are creating algorithms to make our lives easier using artificial intelligence? Similarly, there are issues about fairness, ethics, bias, privacy, explainability, transparency, right? What there are certain terms or certain notions which we give. For example, if I talk about education, a typical picture which an algorithm would throw up, given all the data set it has across the last 30 to 40 years, or maybe even longer, would be a teacher with a back towards the student teaching on a blackboard. But that is not the scenario any longer. That's not the way education is transacted. Now, similarly, those biases or those challenges happen across cross section. Or are we talking about jobless growth? In the morning session, uh, the Minister of Education in Indonesia spoke about, well, we can prepare the future workforce, but are there enough jobs? So are we really talking about a productivity paradox here? We're talking about jobless growth. And is our natural intelligence at risk? Now, this is not to talk about the negativity or the negative factors at play here, but just talking about challenges which would be there in any given domain which is emerging. And so is the case with emerging technologies like artificial intelligence. But what is interesting is the answer or the way to solve all these challenges lies in a concept which we at Intel promote acutely, which is called digital readiness, building digital readiness at large. So what is digital readiness? Right, we've all heard about digital divide. We keep talking about it. There are multiple conversations. People talk at conferences that there is a, a huge digital divide which we need to bridge. Fair enough. But somewhere down the line, we've progressed from just bridging the digital divide to building digital readiness. Now, digital readiness is a combination of not just learning technology, but a combination of picking up the right skills having the trust 
to apply those skills effectively and ensuring that the application is impactful in a way that the solutions are more productive and more efficient rather than just applying technology for the sake of applying technology. So it's a combination of three vectors. You're talking about skills, you're talking about trust, and you're talking about the ability of people to use the skills they have gained responsibly. And when I say responsibly, it is for larger socioeconomic benefit, which is specifically important when we talk about emerging economies like India and Indonesia. So it's a very outcome-driven approach. It's not just, I learn a skill, I, I can pick up, let's talk about AI. I can pick up AI online in any of the portals today flat 30 minutes and say, yes, I know AI, but am I digitally ready? Am I ready to live in an AI world? Perhaps not, because do I trust what I can possibly create after what I learn? And can I use it effectively? Those are the questions which we keep asking ourselves. So digital readiness is going beyond the traditional concept of digital access and inclusion, or going beyond the concept of really just bridging the digital divide. It is trusting the skills which we've learned and being in a position to use them effectively. And this is a key component of what Intel has announced as the 2030 strategy. So there is a commitment which Intel made last year which says that we would be expanding digital readiness across the globe. 30 country government partnerships with 30,000 institutions providing them access to AI tools and skilling or empowering 30 million people globally for current and future jobs. This is to meet the 2030 commitment and it's a very bold call to action with government partners across the world. And I'm really happy to share that Indonesia is one such partner. We have a footprint of all our initiatives on the building digital readiness in 15 countries today. And Indonesia, of course, features in that list as on date. So what do we really do is the question, right? How do we build digital readiness or how do we, again, going back to my key conversation, how do we create an AI ready generation in any country? There is a complete portfolio which we have that's our solution for building digital readiness which talks about public awareness, which means every citizen should be aware of how to function in an AI-driven world. It talks about high school skilling. Intel AI for Youth is the program which we actually have. We just done a pilot in Indonesia with the Ministry of Education and with the organizers, uh, the Habibi Festival organizers. And this program is something which enables school children in the K-12 system, not just to learn the AI skills, but to be effectively able to use them to solve a challenge to see in and around their communities by applying and creating an indigenous AI project. Then we also have solutions in space of AI for future workforce or current workforce as and when required and digital readiness for government leaders. The idea of expanding digital readiness is to make it completely inclusive, is to make it available depending upon the goal of the government in a given country and the audience requirement. So let's talk about AI for Youth for some time. AI for Youth is a program, it's an initiative which is typically used in the K-12 environment. And that is how, that's our mechanism of building an AI-ready generation across Indonesia and across the globe subsequently. We, the objective of the program is to enable children studying in schools, maybe grades six to 12, develop a deep understanding of AI, really demystify what artificial intelligence is and pick up the required skill set and enable the right mindset to be able to understand, comprehend, and apply artificial intelligence. It allows them access to AI tools. That. So there are three critical parameters we focus on. Enable mindset, which can help them really understand not just the application of AI, how to live in an AI world, but even the pitfalls of artificial intelligence. Access 
to or creation of skill sets. Skill sets is what really would allow them to build, to go through this journey and build their AI project and access to tool sets because without that, they will not be able to apply the skills they have learned. And then the youth go onwards to create those brilliant solutions of solving problems which they see in and around them in their communities. And um, shortly we'll be releasing our report which would talk about what youth in Indonesia have created after going through this entire journey. But more towards of what do we really skill these youth on or what is the learning journey? So the learning journey starts from how do we inspire youth to know about artificial intelligence? And just a disclaimer, they need not have any prior knowledge, not just about artificial intelligence, but about technology at large before joining these programs. So, so this is primarily meant as an AI readiness initiative. It is meant for youth who have no prior knowledge about artificial intelligence or about coding, or even would want to make a career in the stream. So we inspire them, we get them to understand what is it to live with artificial intelligence all around us. We get them to understand the pitfalls, talk about ethics, biases, all the socioeconomic challenges which I'd shared earlier. We get them to acquire certain skill sets, which are gets them to understand the three key domains of artificial intelligence, which would be computer vision, natural language processing, or using data for AI. We get them to experience going through certain guided use cases and then subsequently be empowered enough to build their entire solution. I'm, I'm not going to go through this. This is a lot of material to process, but just wanted to stress on the fact that becoming ready for an AI driven future, as every, most of the speakers have been sharing since morning, it is not just essential to learn the technology skills, but it's equally essential to learn these social skills or what we call as the core skills. And that is where throughout the journey, what they pick up is not just about learning what an AI life cycle is, how do we, what is the, uh, you know, how do we collect data? How do we process data? How do we clean data? How do we visualize it? Things like that. Not only do they understand about the domains of AI, not only do they understand the whole life cycle of how artificial intelligence works, but they also pick up skills of leadership, organization, collaboration, persuasion. Um, a very skill which seems very simple, but is the most difficult thing to do is sharing technology or a tech project in plain and simple language. And then of course, they can demonstrate an outcome. That is what we have as an offering for the K-12 or the school education system. Going ahead, I really want to take another five minutes to talk to you about a new program which we have in offering, which is the AI for Future Workforce, which would create the job readiness, which would help people, enable people to become ready for the jobs of tomorrow. Now, this is beyond K-12. This is typically for the SMCAs or the vocational institutes, which again, no prior coding experience is required. But here the attributes become a little different because we are talking about not just demystification of a technology, but we are also talking how young learners need to gain the technical confidence of functioning in an AI world. So it, it kind of focuses on picking up the skills which are related for employability and career growth. And again, it, it's a combination of both technology and social skills. Social skills like leadership, of uh, core skills like the Power BI tools, which today we as employees are learning ourselves to use so that a learner who goes through this entire journey can produce an evidence of employment. They can really demonstrate a solution through the capstone project and have for creating industrial or social impact and go through an internship as well. Uh, this is a new program which we're going to be offering to Indonesia shortly. It moves from getting aware about artificial intelligence, building the foundation of the basic career and social skills or career growth skills, experiencing the three domains again, but also includes a capstone 
which prepares an individual or a youth for an apprenticeship and a practical training and exposure. Now we know because of the current pandemic, many times exposure cannot be face-to-face, -face, so we are looking at a virtual solution to do that as well. We will not go through the module summary, but I'm just putting it out there so that I can talk about the kind of skills, the length, the breadth, the body of knowledge which a learner would be gaining to be ready for the job of tomorrow or to be ready to live in an AI-driven world. But like in the school education space, we focus on technology skills and social skills. There's another layer which we are adding out here, which is called the career growth skills, which talks about self-management, which is one of the most important aspects today for uh, being in, uh, for having a job, right? How do we develop a growth mindset? How do we really use smart goal setting? What are the kind of frameworks we work with? What are the social emotional skills we need to work with to prepare ourselves for careers? In fact, so much so, we even cover entrepreneurship as a part of this entire piece because there is a level of entrepreneurship or the entrepreneurial skills one needs to showcase in a work environment today. With this, I just want to uh, end my presentation here, not go into the details of application. I have a lot of examples to really talk about how students in Indonesia have picked up AI for youth, the kind of projects which they are creating and building, but we would be sharing that subsequently, but I want all of you to experience what I've spoken about. And to do that, I have an AI for youth coach from my team, Ambika, who's gonna play a small game with you on artificial intelligence. So I hope you're all ready to play that game. And uh, if so, then Ambika, can you take over please? Absolutely. So as you all have seen how some of the students in Indonesia have gone through artificial intelligence already, it's time for you all to experience AI in a similar fashion. So I'm going to share a very basic introductory uh, quiz with you all, which you can explore at your end. All you need to do is to uh, put the game pin. I hope you have heard about Kahoot before. If not, it's a basic quiz platform which um, helps you engage students and other people into a quiz competition in which they can uh, not only participate, but compete with each other on the basis of the correct answers that they give and on the basis of the time in which they answer. So here is the link. All you need to do is to go to kahoot.it platform and enter the game pin, which is reflecting on the screen right now. As soon as you log in, it'll ask you to put a name. So you can put any fun name um, that you wish. You may put yours or maybe uh, you may put a nickname to you. And then uh, as soon as you log in, your name would st uh, start reflecting on the screen. Once we have enough participants, we'll begin this quiz. So you have two minutes, go ahead and log into the quiz. I love the names which are coming up. And uh, once we are done with the quiz, Ambika is going to share the lead the board. And once she does that, uh, there would be some prizes which be shipping your way through the Indonesia Education Forum. That's going to spice the whole thing up. So there, there are going to be very basic AI related questions to test your uh, current knowledge on AI. Uh, it's not going to be too technical in nature, and I'm sure you will enjoy it. And the rules for this quiz are to answer as quickly as possible, because the lesser time you take, the more points you score. Okay.
Okay, so we have 24 participants already. Let's wait for 20 more seconds before we begin the quiz. Okay, so I guess it's time. Let's start the quiz. The question would appear on your screen and then would come some options. And the first question is, what is artificial intelligence? The options are there on your screen. Select the one which you think is the right answer. I can see all of you are answering Quickly, that's great. Okay, three seconds. Amazing. We have 21 correct answers and let's see what the leaderboard says. So we have Blue Finch on top with 890 points. And then we have Soaring Puffin, Expert Stock, Magic Egret, and Cute Raven. Great going everyone. Let's go to the next question. Which of the following is an AI application? Now, some of these might seem to be an AI application, but in reality, they might not. Okay. 29 correct answers. It's good to see how you all know about AI already. So the leaderboard has changed a bit. We have Soaring Puffin on top with 1,840 points, Blue Finch, Expert Stock, Cute Raven, and then Happy Seal is the new one who has come in the top five. Let's go in the next question. Which among the following is the fuel for artificial intelligence? Now, what is artificial intelligence based on? Okay, five seconds left. 11 correct answers. Although it seems that wires, internet, and processor are the things which support AI, but the fuel for AI is always data. It is data on which an AI model is trained and that is how it is made. So let's see. The leaderboard has changed completely this time with expert stock on top, trade going. Next question. Which of these industries is not influenced by artificial intelligence in today's time? We can see that AI is impacting a lot of industrial sectors, but is there anyone which is not impacted by AI? Twenty-eight correct answers, none of the above, because healthcare, automobile, and space technology, all of them have some sort of AI element uh, in today's time. Okay, the leaderboard is changing after every question, and those who are still not in top five, don't worry, because you sure can get a chance to be there. Next question. Which AI technology helps a machine identify faces like humans do? Okay, 23 correct, 23 answers yet. Twenty-seven correct answers, facial recognition. Although it seems image processing is the one which helps us identify faces, but actually the AI technology that we're talking about is facial recognition. Image processing has a role to play, but it is facial recognition. Okay, 
Witty Bunny still on top with 4,435 4, points. Great going. Next question. Which of these apps does not use AI? You might have heard of these apps and you have to tell me which of these does not use AI. Twenty-eight correct answers. When you say none of the above, because all of them are using several machine learning algorithms and AI techniques to make uh, to give customers an enhanced experience. So you all are right. Amazon Dolphin is amongst top five now. Great. Next question: What does NLP stand for in AI? Now, NLP is one of the domains uh, on which AI works. Now, all the options seem to be a little bit similar. Let's see how many of you get this one right. Only two correct answers. Although it seems because it is AI, so it might be neuro-linguistic programming, something which is too technical in nature. But honestly, NLP stands for natural language processing, wherein a machine tries to comprehend what a human is speaking and also tries to reply in a similar manner. Chatbots, voice assistants, all of them are based on the domain of NLP. Let's see if the leaderboard has changed. Cute Raven is now on top, Amazon Dolphin and Witty Bunny on third. That's great. Let's move to the next one. Which of the following can't be done by AI? Now, is there something which AI cannot do? What is it? Twenty-six correct answers. That is great. Because AI in today's time is an emerging technology which can handle huge data sets. It can give us a personalized experience as it is giving us through various apps. It can solve complex mathematical problems to aid uh, the human intelligence. But until in, now, AI is unable to feel pain. Of course, a lot of research is going on uh, towards emotions, but feel pain, not yet. Okay, Q Raven still on top. Great. Let's go to the second last question of our quiz. What does ML stand for in AI? Again, similar options. Let's see how many of you get it right. nine correct answers so similar to artificial intelligence another term which is interchangeably used is machine learning multi-level learning machine language mind learning all of them seem to be a good full form for ml but actually it is machine learning when a machine learns from its own mistakes and experiences it is termed as ml or machine learning let's see the leaderboard Witty Bunny again on top with Rocky Panda, Dr. B, Amazon Dolphin, and Happy Seal. Okay, so this is going to be the last question now, and it might change the whole leaderboard. Let's see how many of you know the answer to this. Which Indonesian startup does not work with AI? You must have heard of all these startups before because they are very actively working in Indonesia, but one of them does not work with AI. 11 of you got it right. That's interesting. Okay, let's see the final podium. Who were the top three? 
Dr. B on third with 7,588 points. Rocky Panda second, 7,688. And the first is Witty Bunny with 7,835 points. Congratulations to you three. You have won the quiz. And it's good to see how all of you knew a lot of answers to these questions to AI, which means that you already are a bit acquainted with it. But of course, you can definitely go ahead and explore more about it. Back to you, Shweta ma'am. Thank you, Ambika. Thank you for driving this. Um, I'll request all the winners to maybe just uh, drop an email to Shoheb or Sachin so that we can get your prizes to reach you. But the whole idea to actually just get you to experience this entire piece was to reiterate the fact that every time you book something on Gojek or you go to Tokopedia or you use an app to improve the quality of your life, save time, source something, you're actually interfacing with AI, which means all of us need to be ready to live in an AI-fueled world which means that the future generation needs to be geared up for artificial intelligence, not just to be a consumer, but also to understand how to live efficiently and effectively in an AI-driven world. With this, thank you so much. And uh, it's back to you, Shoheb Nalin. That was indeed very exciting. I think the game really gave us an, a good idea of what AI can do and how it works. And, Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think you will be uh, uh, staying on with us. Um, I would now like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Ingriani, Chairperson of Bebras Indonesia NBO. Uh, she's going to talk about the power of computational thinking. I think we've heard a lot about what computational thinking is today. Uh, Dr. Ingriani, of course, is a very well-known researcher in the field. Um, and I think she's probably one of Indonesia's uh, leading thinkers on uh, on computational thinking. Uh, Dr. Ingriani, welcome. Hello, I'm here. Hello, Ibu. Apa kabar? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, yes, very clearly, very clearly. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor to have you with us. Uh, do you have a presentation? Yes, please, if possible. Yes, we will let you share screen. Let me try. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Silakan, Bo. Okay, thank you. And it's an honor to be here invited by you. So I will present a little bit about the power of computational thinking. Uh, how do you, because computational thinking is very important for surviving in this world. What is city and AI? But I think I will skip many things because the previous speaker talked more about AI and how to bridge between city to AI in Indonesian education. So everybody knows <clears throat> that we are living in industrial 4.0. And when the industry become 4.0, our society become 5.0, where we, we will live in a highly integrated cyberspace and physical space. And we have to consolidate and to, to make an uh, optimization between economy, uh, economy and well-being of human. But don't forget that we live now in a VUCA word, that is uh, full, our word with volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. This is a very word. If we live as usual, if we give our life to nature, and for responding that, our mass mantra has announced that computational thinking will be part of the curriculum. Computational thinking and compassion with, will be the fifth C and sixth C. And it will drive us, drive all Indonesian students to 
profil pelajar Pancasila. What does it mean? So that with good heart, we will have clear thinking. Then we will have an independent and independent way of thinking to become critical and creative. Because the world is so big, we cannot do ourselves. Then we have to collaborate. Gotong Royong is a is a special way of Indonesian to be in collaboration. And of course, we are part of global society. This is the aim of education and it will be uh, all foundation for the curriculum. And in one minute, computational thinking is problem solving for having an effective efficient and optim optimal solution. So um, um, this thinking skill is highly needed, not only with technology, but as human. And for doing an effective, efficient, optimal problem solving, the four cornerstone of Computational thinkings are decomposition. It means that we see something as a structured things so that we can break it down to pieces in a good way. We can break real things, concept, and even problem. Abstraction, it means that we have to to put our priority in the important things. And we have to write step-by-step -step solution to, daily, uh, to give it to the machine so, can, so that the machine can do it. Having a pattern recognition uh, ability, we can use our previous solution and we will have a faster solution. City is for all and not only for computer scientists and computational thinking will be a fundamental skill by everyone in 21st century. So city is not about only using tools. We have to, to train and the children should learn computational thinking from small things, simple thing, and then bigger problem and then when they are professional, they will build a system like this metaphor. For there is a long way to go to big data. We have to start with small data and then with tools and then to go to big data. This is only the definition. Computational thinking is a thought process. Why it is difficult to teach and the student should learn because a process must happen in the children itself. So how to formulate the problem, what is my solution, and how I can delegate the solution to human or machine. And we will, we will grow the city disposition to the children when they will have confidence in dealing with complexity, persistent in working with difficult problem, tolerance with ambiguity, ability to deal with open-ended problem, and the ability to communicate and work with others. And computational thinking is for all. In our curriculum, uh, even from elementary school, we introduce computational thinking, then informatics, and Part of them will be will work as startup or informatician, computer scientist, software developer. But computational thinking should be the foundation of everything. And unfortunately, in Indonesia, there is a, a misconception about digital literacy. The previous speaker talked about digital literacy or digital readiness. Uh, they confuse our teacher and society confuse about ICT and digital literacy, ICT and informatics. If we see the digital literacy framework, 
It includes problem solving, communication, and all soft skills that have been uh, that have been mentioned by the previous speakers. So, digital literacy comprises of problem solving and reasoning and thinking. Thinking skill is the foundation of every literacy. And computational thinking itself is 21st century literacy. And there are some mistaken about city and also about AI. Uh, this morning, Mas Menteri told us city is not just coding. It's conceptualizing. It's a fundamental and a way human things, not computer things. This is very important aspect of city. It complement and combine mathematical and engineering thinking. This morning, Mas Menteri told us, even if you are an artist, you are not engineer, but you should have engineering thinking. Computer science inherently draw from engineering thinking, and it's about idea, not artifact. And now going to AI, there are some mistaken about AI that they told us AI will replace human. Every computer is AI program. Uh, it is uh, funny. I follow the quiz before. There are some misleading. And AI is machine learning is mistaken because AI is not just machine learning. And AI is not just robotics. Uh, high volume data is big data. This is a wrong perception because big data is not only because it's a big value, but it's unstructured, complex, etc. And computational thinking has been mentioned in our national strategy for AI in Indonesia. It is written that computational thinking should be given since earlyhood, early child education. So that's why we put computational thinking in the curriculum. And this morning, many people talk about autonomous. Mas Menteri told us that teachers should be autonomous. Uh, there, are, there is still misleading about what is automated and autonomous. With highly standardized and procedures, our teacher become automated. But what we want is autonomous. But however, uh, in an autonomous system, human must be uh, decision makers. So it is important to build reasoning capability in the human first before we put in the machine. So as we, if we see the history of artificial intelligence, uh, we can see this is a third wave of AI. When uh, AI moves to the third wave, the system has more and more capability for reasoning. See, the first one, just perceiving and reasoning, because but for a very specific. So it is a very specific, uh, the system can do very specific things, like robot that can move a container, from one place to the other. The other one is for playing chess. It's fully intelligent because we put the, the strategy how to win in the machine. And the second wave, um, the system start for learning and abstracting. That's why learning abstracting is very important and if you remember abstraction in one of of the cornerstone of computational thinking and the third wave the computer can explain why i make this decision what does it mean it means that uh, the machine can make any decision and the other things now uh, 
um, every people talk about data analysis. So they learn how to analyze the data from and interpret the data. It's a part of computational thinking skill. It is very important when you see a data and you become a critical, that's as if there is an improper scaling, you can see that if you see for the first image, it is three times, it's not true. You can see percentage, all of this needs reasoning. And now data visualization is combined with arts. They combine all visualization and make, a pe make people uh, easier to make any decision. And so AI come also to education. Now there are some robots who can help teacher or who can help student for learning. But you know now the problem is every teacher in the elementary level talk what is computational thinking. All professionals talk about artificial intelligence and big data. And we have in the middle for our high school students, now they have to know in their study what is artificial intelligence and big data. But maybe it's not as professional, but as starter. Maybe it's different for SMK, but for SMA, it's just giving idea, make a system, a small system, but in this era, they have to know about AI and big data, although the big is not very big. So if we see now our reality in Indonesia, uh, the reality, the real intelligence is in computational thinking, and we have to bring it to artificial for bringing reasoning to our mind to a machine. We have to have knowledge, skills, competence, and this is the big gap that government now try to to bridge. So we make a new way of implementing curriculum so that we will grow uh, intelligence skill, artificial intelligence skill, small by small from the first year of elementary school to K-12, year 12. So we have 12 years to develop uh, artificial intelligence at the end, but at the first, we pay attention to computational thinking. And we have to put technology, practice, conceptual knowledge, and thinking skill in one package. We should not separate technology, practice, conceptual, and thinking because thinking without knowledge is dangerous. Uh, thinking, having thinking skill and knowledge without practice is nothing. In this era, if we practice with technology, it will be more efficient, effective, and optimal. This is what we refer to our founder, our father of education, that pendidikan mass growth, budi pekerti, pikiran, and tubuh. Mind, heart, heart, mind, and also put into action. And on the left side, this is the framework of informatics curriculum in Indonesia. And how we implement it? Computational thinking starting from elementary school infused in every lecture. And now until 2018 curriculum, informatics is optional. It planned to be mandatory from middle school, middle school and year 10. 
and become optional in year 11 and year 12. Uh, year 11 and year 12 is for students who will pursue their study, study in informatics. The problem of implementation is digital gap between urban and rural society, but we will try to teach our students with some method without computer in school and university. So PEPRAS make uh, 87 bureau, we call it university, who is ready to help government to implement informatics curriculum in Indonesia. This is the pattern of um, our PEPRAS bureau. We are not ready working to help government. And Google has given to us a grant for introducing computer science to 22,000 teachers in 22 regions of Indonesia. Thanks to Google, thanks to uh, that gave us the opportunity to introduce computational thinking before informatics curriculum uh, is uh, is decided to be mandatory and i think lack of teacher is not only the problem of indonesia if uh, even in us they report that um, there is a lack of teacher a computer science teacher why because computer scientists is highly demanded in the industry. That's why we have to work fast and we have to train many, many teachers for being able to teach informatics. And one way to introduce computational thinking to children, uh, Indonesia is part of an international initiative called Bebras. Bebras is Beaver. Beaver is a community that want to introduce computational thinking from three years old to 18 years old in a challenging and funny way. So uh, the children will learn about computational thinking and informatics without previous knowledge about informatics. We are part of it and for giving you uh, illustration about paper task. This is about uh, pattern recognition when they become uh, become a bioinformatics. It's uh, like DNA pattern sequencing. That's why they learn from three years old, learning about how to make abstraction, graph theory without previous knowledge about graph theory. This is paper task. So it is a, a yearly challenge where we ask students to solve an uh, interesting problem related to informatics. Very challenging like graph. This is for high school. This is the base of graph algorithm or this is for greedy algorithm, sorting, optimization. So we present it in an interesting way. And for region who has no computer, and also for who has computer, we create games where they play and learn computational thinking by activity-based learning. So this is a robot programmed by the, his friend, a programmer and a robot. So before programming robot, the children has experience to play as robot. And this is another way of learning. Uh, line follower robotics, Mackey Mackey. This, this will be part of our curriculum. I think it's the end of my presentation. Sorry, it's, it is raining very hard <laughs> at my home. And we would like to thank you for this opportunity to thank you for Google to give us grant 
IPP4 giving us a online platform and GDP venture for supporting us for a Bebras challenge from the beginning. We, we have also a platform for competitive programming. It has 20,000 and more students who will compete in International Olympiad in Informatics. Thank you. I think that's all of my presentation. Sorry. Riani, very interesting. Nice. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. And I think you're, you're an inspiration for all of us in terms of how we can continue to be continue to learn no matter what uh, age we are. So age should not be a barrier. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation. Uh, I would now like to invite Mr. Sachin Gopalan, co-founder of the Indonesia Education Forum, to host the next panel. Sachin? Thank you. Thank you, Shuhaed. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, first of all, thank you very much, Shuhaed. I think uh, you know, this is going very well. We have very, very interesting speakers. And uh, the input of the speakers, I believe, is very important for you know the topic that we're going to talk about now in the panel, which is upgrading the national curriculum. Some of the uh, reasons why uh, upgrading the curriculum has only been accelerated because of the pandemic, it has forced us to relook, rethink, reimagine where we are going with preparation of youth for the future. And I think uh, this discussion today may be a little bit more tech oriented, but we have uh, covered all aspects of the upgrading of the curriculum because tech is a part of it. There is an overall holistic approach to where the curriculum needs to go. And uh, I think the panel today has um, you know, a good mix. Uh, Ibu Ing uh, Inga uh, or Dr. Ingraini, as uh, I know her, she is a fantastic uh, you know, example of carrying out programs that are actually reaching teachers. She has 22,000 teachers in our program with Google and it's fantastic. I think, you know, Ibu, what you're doing is uh, actually making a difference at the ground, uh, you know, grassroots level, which is, I think, one of the key re uh, ways that we will be able to go all across Indonesia. Shweta has uh, been with us. Uh, uh, in, in fact, she used to live in Indonesia and uh, she has never forgotten Indonesia as she encouraged us to make Indonesia one of the countries, 30 countries that have been chosen by Intel to be AI ready with its youth. And I think Intel's program in India is very, very successful. I personally went and visited what Shweta has been doing there. And she has been instrumental in creating this program across, I think now 15 countries. So uh, there is a very interesting component of what AI can do here because AI is not actually just about tech. It's about influencing everything we do even music, even languages, even history, everything has got AI in it. So we find that is one technology that cuts across all barriers and can get into anything we do. And uh, with sometimes robotics and you know some of the more techy subjects that we are not able to do. So it's a very uh, fantastic platform. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, and then we have pa Anindito, or as we like to call him, Panino, who has consented to be here. Panino is actually you know, the person who is behind this curriculum upgrade. He's been working very closely with Pa Mantri's uh, team, Pa Nadim's team, and he has been uh, putting together a framework for the curriculum upgrade. As we know, it's not a one-time thing, right? Uh, curriculum has to be upgraded continuously. And it is sometimes to be upgraded in steps because you can't do a complete change in curriculum immediately. There has to be a phased way of how you would build the curriculum going forward. So we're very fortunate to have these key speakers. And I think, uh, Panino, I'm going to invite you to go first. Pa, I believe you have a presentation to share with us that will set the framework for the discussion because I think we, what we need to talk about is an approach strategy. I know both Ibu Inga working with, you know, uh, making, giving inputs on the informatics strategy in Indonesia and Shweta has already done this in India. She has already put AI and related curriculum into the national curriculum of uh, CBSE board in India. So she's been through that process and she's seen the you know, ups and downs and difficulties there. So we can share a lot and you know, look, learn from each other's experiences. There. So Panino, over to you, Pa. I'm going to ask you to present. Uh, I think you have screen share. Please confirm it's working. Perfect. Um, yes, is it visible? Yes, Pa, go ahead, Pa. Great. 
Terima kasih banyak Pak Sahin. Thank you so much Pak Sahin. Um, it's an honor to be part of this esteemed panel. Allow me to start by sharing some thoughts about the ministry's current approach to curriculum reform. Um, I will do so by talking about two things. So first I will elaborate on several key tensions which I believe define curriculum design anywhere and the need to prioritize student learning in resolving these tensions. Um, after that, I will also elaborate on what exactly for curriculum design. Okay, so the curriculum is a contested field. Um, I think that is the first thing that we need to acknowledge as curriculum designers. Um, policy making is not just a technical process. It is not simply finding the best optimal solution from a technical objective perspective. Rather, policy making has a very strong social and political dimension. It is always value laden and it is always, it always involves a tug of war between various stakeholders with different values, different interests, and hence different agendas. Um, this, I believe, applies even more so with regards to curriculum reform. I mean, critics of curriculum reform like to say that tinkering with the curriculum is futile. Changing the curriculum, they say, will have no effect on the quality of teaching and learning. But actually, those very same people care a lot about changes to the curriculum. And this is because they know, and everyone knows, that the curriculum is a powerful conceptual infrastructure. Once it is in place, the curriculum sets the direction, the scope, the speed, and the sequence of teaching. It has a powerful influence on what and how teachers teach, and hence, on how and what students ultimately learn. And therefore, yes, we have to take into account best practices, empirical evidence, latest theories about teaching and learning and designing the curriculum. But there is no escaping the socio-political dimension of curriculum reform. The contestation of values needs to be navigated. Now, more specifically, uh, this contestation can be expressed in terms of four key tensions. The first tension is between continuity and change. Any curriculum serves to preserve societal values, traditions of the past. But on the other hand, a curriculum should also anticipate an unknown future, which often means preparing for change, and hence it requires novelty and future-oriented thinking as well. The second tension is between the collective and the individual. Um, here, any curriculum serves to provide students with social and cultural roots. Um, we all need to know where we come from. Right? This will be the basis of our collective identity as a society, as a nation. But on the other hand, every curriculum should also honor students' individuality their uniqueness, their potentials as individuals, which do not necessarily conform to the ideals of society. So that's another tension that needs to be resolved. Um, third, there is a tension between going wide and going deep. We want students to have a lot of knowledge, um, but only in passing. Or would it be better for students to learn about fewer topics, but, but in more depth? I know that in theory, uh, perhaps all of us in this forum would agree that it is much better to go for depth. But in practice, this is, this is not an easy choice to make because every single topic in the curriculum are there for a reason. Every single subject matter has their own advocates. Last, uh, there is the tension between control and autonomy. Right? Um, the government 
tendency is to control, is to um, have uh, oversight over the education process. But how much flexibility should the government give to teachers and schools to develop their uh, school level curriculum? Right? Um, obviously, the government cannot standardize everything. One size fits all doesn't work in education. Again, this is not an easy tension to resolve. So the question is, how should we resolve these tensions? Um, how can we find the right balance? Unfortunately, maybe there is no right balance, objectively speaking, because what constitutes the right balance will depend on the values we choose to prioritize. And in Merdeka Belajar, we do have this value. Uh, Kemendikbud, the ministry, chooses to give primacy to student learning and well-being. This is our main value in the design of the curriculum and in many of our priority programs. Okay, now what are the implications for curriculum design? Um, when we say that we prioritize student learning and well-being, what implications does it have on curriculum design? Well, in general, it means that we need to think seriously from the student's perspective, from their needs, their aspirations. We need to honor their agency and autonomy as learners. Um, specifically, first, this means that we need to recognize that deep learning requires a lot of time. It takes time. Decades of research into student learning tells us that developing deep understanding never comes easy. Um, whatever is worth learning um, doesn't come easy. And this is because learning requires relearning and in many, many cases also unlearning. In mathematics, for example, to learn about fraction requires to unlearn some of our intuitions about whole numbers. In physics, learning about Newton's laws of motion requires unlearning about the intuitions we have about how the physical world around us works. In the humanities, um, we learn about other cultures and languages. And this requires us to unlearn the knowledge we have about our mother tongue, and maybe also the prejudices we have about the values and traditions of other cultures. So without deep understanding, without going through this difficult process of unlearning and relearning, knowledge of a topic is rarely um, useful outside the short-term need to pass school examination. So the implication for curricul curriculum design is very clear. We should prioritize depth over breadth and hence needs to be reduced and refocused on the essentials. Again, this will not be easy. Second, we need to recognize that our kids, our children, our students have a long future ahead of them, hopefully much, much longer than our lifetimes. With the rapid pace of social, cultural, uh, technological, economic change, Students will need to go through the process of learning, relearning, unlearning throughout their life. And hence, the curriculum should focus on powerful transversal competencies. These are competencies that are foundational and applicable to many contexts. These are the competencies which Hu um, Inge spoke about and previous speakers have highlighted. Computational thinking, problem solving, self-regulated learning, critical thinking, uh, collaborating with people from different disciplines and different cultural backgrounds. The implication for curriculum reform is again very clear. We need to prioritize competencies that are transferable over content knowledge. Um, and third, students have different starting points in their learning journey. Um, obviously, we know that there is a huge gap in learning in terms of um, sometimes gender, but most often in terms of socioeconomic status, 
uh, students from poor families, students from rural and remote locations start their schooling career with a severe disadvantage compared to their middle and upper class peers. Often these students have not picked up the basic academic skills, ways of speaking, ways of thinking, um, which their middle and upper class peers have picked up from their home environment. At the individual level, every student has their unique talents and interests. They also learn at different paces. And hence, the implication for curriculum um, is that the curriculum needs to encourage and help teachers to teach adaptively, to cater for the needs of individual students. So we need to design somehow a curriculum that provides a lot of freedom for teachers to make decisions about learning materials, about the sequence of learning, about the methods of teaching. Um, we need, and schools need to provide and support teacher, teacher autonomy and continuous learning um, with regards to curriculum um, adaptation. Um, also, the curriculum needs to provide a lot of room for students themselves to select and formulate what and how they should learn in schools. Okay, well, I will end there and hopefully this provides some points for us to discuss. Thank you. Anino, Anino, that was fantastic. You know, I think, uh, you know, going through your presentation has given us a very grounded way of looking at curriculum reform. And uh, I think the first thing that comes to me is that getting an education is far beyond just learning a few skills. It's an ongoing process and there are so many factors that need to be built in, which creates the character of a nation. So that is essentially uh, the gist of your presentation. And I also see that, uh, you know, the balance that you talk about that keeps has to be tugged at. Uh, it's a constantly changing balance and the balance would be different in different parts of the country, depending on, you know, how the culture and uh, people adapt to uh, their life around them. So I think this is a great um, starting point. Pa. And uh, I would actually now try to create a conversation among all three uh, of our uh, panelists. Uh, the questions would be posed actually not just to one, but I would like you all to jump in and you know add your viewpoint so that it becomes a lively interaction between three of us because I think we bring different perspectives to the table. So I'll kick it off uh, with the first uh, question. Actually, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, that the curriculum is uh, on uh, constantly being upgraded and you have a framework which you just presented. But what is the starting point? I'm saying today, what is the starting point? I'm sure if you looked at it tomorrow, you have a different starting point. And next year, you'll start differently. What are you doing today? How is it being approached right now with the situation you're facing? You know, there's a pandemic. There are other, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenges thrown at you. What is your starting point today, Pa? Uh, the starting point I already mentioned actually is to think about curriculum design from the student's perspective. Okay. Um, of all the various stakeholders that has a say in curriculum design, the student voice is almost always missing. Yeah. And that is, I think, what needs to be given more uh, room, taken more seriously in curriculum design. Right? Um, whatever the context, um, yes, we have a pandemic, but even without a pandemic, that is true that students are the subject of education. And hence, we need to think about what they need. What kind of curriculum would they need for their future? That is my starting point, Pasahin. I think that's fantastic. You know, we've had this discussion earlier in the education forum where we listen to everybody, but we never listen to the end customer. That is the student. <laughs> so that's a great uh, thing. Shweta, do you want to add a little bit about how would India be looking at this particular aspect? Sure. Thanks, Sachin. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, comment, on, you know, I, I think you spoke about the socio-political aspect of curriculum framing, which a lot of I've, I've seen very few people in very few countries talk about so my compliments for bringing that out because we do feel it's a very, very essential component. Uh, coming on to how India has gone through their entire curriculum framework or the new national education policy which got announced in 2020, again in the midst of the pandemic. 
Um, couple of things, A, the need to constantly revise, the need to get a student's voice in, because at the end of the day, they, the young generation is extremely smart and savvy, and uh, they are consuming knowledge in a very different manner than the previous generation to them. So to understand that becomes extremely important. Also, the study place has changed. They're studying in a different environment. They're getting their knowledge from multiple zones. So when India was reframing its curriculum, it looked at certain aspects. It looked at interoperability between subjects. So which we typically picked up three key stratas, which was music, sports, and artificial intelligence, and how they, all three of them, would apply in conjunction to improve learning outcomes across other subjects. So it is whether you're teaching a poem in English or maybe even the local language as in Hindi, how do you really use artificial intelligence to improve the learning outcome or a tool of AI to improve the learning outcome while trying to figure out what that poem is all about. Or if you're teaching mathematics, of course, it has a direct connection with math and science, but similarly for sports, similarly for music. And they called in a lot of these voices together. They created a body of knowledge as to what the old curriculum is, what should the new curriculum look like. And what I really like is they fast tracked the implementation of the new curriculum on a test bed, certain number of schools and studied the impact. So it wasn't that it got created and it'll take another five years to revise and come back with a new curriculum. It was being revised as it was being created, as the changes were made, there was constant feedback given within the system itself to see how would teachers and students react to these new verticals which were being introduced. Another important part, which uh, Sachin, I'll just take a minute to mention is how countries like India, Korea, and now in fact, Taiwan recently is doing is introducing new age technologies, emerging technologies as artificial intelligence as a skill subject, which means as a child, if I'm in grade eight, I can study a biology a physics, a mathematics. I can also pick up AI as a subject, or I can pick up technology as a subject, or I can pick up psychology as a subject. So that choice, I think, which uh, Pani, you know, which you spoke about, giving the choice and making it extremely modular in approach is something which all the new revisions which we've seen countries going forward with are uh, uh, keeping in mind. Thank you. Back to you, Sachin. Thank you, Shweta. In fact, we have uh, Professor Johannes Linder who's joined us. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor. Thank you for being here. I think you're following the conversation. Uh, we, we are looking at having uh, some input on uh, are we listening to the youth uh, in getting inputs for how we look at uh, upgrading the curriculum and professor johannes actually here is an expert on entrepreneurial uh, curriculum uh, he has been uh, with the eu and uh, you know in his home country works with the ministry of introducing curriculum for young people to be job creators and uh, I think it's an important component because to be a job creator, you need a wide variety of skills and the education framework becomes even more important because uh, the reason to become an entrepreneur are many. Some want to make money, some want to change economic change for their society. Some are just, you know, innovators and they just want to see a product out in the market. So, it, you know, different kind of people become entrepreneurs. So I think this very well fits into this conversation. So, Professor, maybe a quick input from you. How do you see, do you talk to your youth when you design your curriculum? Do you see the young people being consulted? Uh, how, what has been your approach? Over to you, Professor. Thanks a lot. Um, I think on the first point, it's important always to speak, what do you mean with a curriculum? When we speak about the syllabus, we have a very diverse situation of syllabuses. In our country, we have a primary education, one syllabus for the whole age group between six up to 10. Then we have one syllabus between 10 up to 14. But after that, we have 500 different syllabuses in my country. We have a very diverse situation of very, and a lot of possibilities from the student perspective to choose different ways where they like to go. Um, that's one point. The second point, when we are creating a syllabus, we always are doing an evaluation study in the beginning, uh, which is going on the one hand uh, to the students back uh, when they are behind five or ten years when they were going through the school. And we also go to the labor market, uh, particular for the, uh, for the age group in the secondary upper level between 14 up to 19. 
um, this evaluation study is always a crucial point uh, to check is the syllabus from the student perspective and from the labor market perspective an acceptable approach how it is now. Um, it's, uh, for the 21st century, we also made strategy approaches. Inside the European Union, we have filtered out that there are eight key competences which each citizen should learn inside school or later. And there are some points inside which are totally new, which were never a part of the syllabus. And, or maybe not, you didn't see it so much. It was more a question of methodic maybe. And as you mentioned, entrepreneurial learning is one of the points. It's the key competence number 70, that each student, when he passed through the school, he should be able to be a shaper, to be an entrepreneur, uh, to change the society and to know how to do this. This has a lot to do with the questions, how can I participate in my society? How do I get the passion? Um, and this, the eight key competence model is a very important uh, point for all uh, changes inside the syllabuses in our countries. Uh, and we also use a lot the 21st century uh, research, which the American was doing. There's also something very comparable to the European one, where you have four elements inside. And where we see, uh, they also call some points as total new approaches. And we see we have to change our syllabus much more than we ever were expecting. And it's not so much oriented with digital because digital you can do in all subjects. Uh, it's much more with the questions, how we are learning. This is the crucial point. Can we give our learners the possibility that they take over partly responsibility? And they start with that in primary education and going up uh, as uh, one of the previous speaker were mentioned, learning um, is not easy. I have a different opinion. I think when you find a good way of learning, it's very easy. Uh, and it's not always that you need to learn hard that you have the feeling that you learn something. That's, uh, it's an important point to see. Um, and, but I agree totally with that. It's very important to go deep in some areas, um, but it's particularly important that you are able to use your knowledge. When you only learn knowledge and you are not able to use it, you lack a tremendous point. And I think that's uh, quite a problem of many school syllabuses that they are very content oriented, knowledge oriented, and that they are missing uh, the handling, the use, the skill aspect, and the attitude aspect. And we can learn a lot from the sports syllabus. In sport, you always had this insight that you have a training aspect and you have a coaching aspect. And I think it's, it's very smart when we are able to put this also in the syllabus of some other subject that our teachers see, they have a, a knowledge and a skill aspect, but they are, the American call this character, the European call this attitude, that we have something to develop the personality. I think that's important to see. We have three aspects which are always important. Knowledge, it's very classic. Some things are totally new in this knowledge area. We have the point how we can use it, handle it, um, skills aspects. And the third one is how can we support that our students get a good attitude, a good, good character. And I like a lot, as the previous speaker were, uh, mentioned, it's so important to be student uh, oriented because many students uh, do have very different chances inside the family. And we have some students who, where the family cannot support uh, the learning process. So they, they, the school have to take over this in particular for the attitude point that they have a self-esteem and development and things like that. Fantastic. I think that's for the, yeah. for the point of time. No, you Thanks make a good a point. Actually, you know, this broad philosophy, Professor Johannes, can be applied across the board. Uh, I, I completely get where you're coming from. Thanks for sharing that insight. Ibu Inga, I want to ask you actually, you know, because you have this big program where you're interacting with teachers and you're preparing the teachers to interact with students. Are you able to also create a reverse flow of uh, feedback from the students to the teachers, which you're able to use uh, effectively for getting input to how you recommend you know, upgrading curriculum? From our interaction, 
Uh, in fact, the problem of curriculum is implementation. We have to change the mindset of our teacher. Because uh, before they are uh, like uh, it they said, they are automated. So uh, teaching thinking skill is not as easy as teaching practical skill. Yeah. You can show and then the student can, uh, can uh, imitate you and then that's all. Teaching thinking needs for the teacher to make the thinking process of the student visible. Yeah. So it takes time and we have difficulty with this period of distance learning, you know. Yeah, it's it's not point. easy to teach thinking scale with uh, only distance learning like uh, like now, but we try to overcome with small small group, and uh, this is our difficulty with the teachers. But when I introduce unplug activities, it reduces the fear of of the teacher who are not having enough infrastructure because they thought always computational thinking oh it's computer i have no computer i don't know ict so uh, we introduce uh, that this is the thinking skill is not only about technology and from the children's side it is um i'm very glad that by small exercise like vibras the children told us, oh, for the first time, I have to solve a problem without thinking with whether it is mathematics, it is physics. Uh, our goal is to solve a problem. Oh, I, I like it very much that the children love our paper stuff because of, uh, of uh, I, I don't know, funny, and then they don't feel they learn single subject. I think in this aspect, Vibras can cover a transferable skill that Panino said. Okay. So going back to you, Panino, you know, uh, I think, uh, you know, the message is clear. Uh, uh, you know, this is something that is uh, put everybody's thinking cap on uh, because so many aspects of this has to be handled in different ways. So I wanted to ask you, Pai, you know, you, in your presentation, you talked about a lot of uh, soft angles of the curriculum, like you talked about human, social, and environmental aspects that need to be there, compassion, collaboration, global competence, so many different moving pieces are there. Pa. What is your approach? Is this built into a separate subject or are they built into each and every subject? What? How do you see uh, such kind of agendas being built in so that students are actually imbibing and learning and it's not just a subject by itself? What is the approach? Pa? I think Panino, you're on silent. Uh, you're on uh, muted. Just check your oh, Yes. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, but clear. Okay. All right. So the question was about the approach that we should take in developing student competencies, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, well, theoretically, there are two approaches: infusion and um, developing it explicitly explicitly through activities that are designed specifically for those competencies. And I think we should take both approaches. It's not an either or um, proposition. Uh, subject matter teaching has to teach basic competencies as well. I mean, the passion to read is not just the language teacher's job to develop. I mean, um, Teachers teaching uh, religious studies, teaching history, teaching science, it's also their job to develop students' uh, skills in reading and also in their passion for uh, the world of text and imagery. Right? And yeah. the same applies to different, um, different competencies, um, problem solving. It's not just the, the, the job of the mathematics teacher or the science teacher to do that. 
right? It's every teacher's job to develop uh, those basic competencies. However, we, we also need to recognize the difficulty of teaching basic competencies while also teaching for content knowledge, which uh, subject matter teachers have to do as well. And hence the curriculum needs to allow activities that are more unstructured, more open, more collaborative. And uh, these project-based um, uh, activities should be designed specifically to develop the kinds of competencies that we want students to develop. I so, hope that you, answers the question. No, no you're absolutely right, uh, Panino. Uh, the question I actually want to bounce off uh, Ibu Inga's uh, comment was, uh, uh, you can do this, but how do you get the teachers to be able to train? I'm saying, what's the process of uh, teaching teachers to be able to do this consistently across? Because that's a different challenge. I know it's not under your yeah. directorate, but you have to work with, let's say, with Ivan, right? Yes. Yeah. So how does that happen? I mean, so what is the interplay between your different uh, directorates? Uh, yeah, I wanted to pick up on Inga's point about teacher mindset. Um, that is obviously key, right? Um, and, and one of the basic mindsets um, that we need to change is about how teachers view their own agency as autonomous uh, actors within the education system. Right? Yes. Um, yes. We, we know that many of our teachers lack the sufficient competencies to teach, content knowledge, pedagogical skills, and so on, and mindset about teaching. Um, in previous approaches, the government has tended to take control back from teachers because they, they see that, oh, it's not working. Giving autonomy to teachers and schools is not working. And then the intuition is to, okay, let's give them more instruction then. Let's be more structured, give them more regulations to follow. And we believe that's the wrong approach because then when will the teachers start to learn to become autonomous? agents to become a masters of their own um, course of learning as teachers. So we have to start somewhere, but we, we recognize that we need to provide a lot of scaffolding. And that's what all of this um, guru penggera, sekolah penggera, SMK, pusat keunggulan is all about, is providing scaffolds for teachers to take on the mental of uh, course designers. Yeah. It's not about just imparting what the government wants them to teach. They actually need to think about the learning objectives, how to achieve those objectives within their the context of their own classroom and their, their students. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to go to Shweta. Actually, this uh, question is to you about, you know, you've been doing this program for youth uh, in India and in many other places. And I know you, you've just completed a uh, uh, pilot project with the youth in Indonesia, which I think 14 different provinces kids came across and did uh, AI project, uh, which is basically project-based learning. The question I have for you, Shweta, is that, you know, kids are all born into the technology world. Right? All these kids are native digital. You know, they're born with handphones in their homes. And uh, when you introduce these kind of new topics to them and new ways of teaching, what's the reaction? What's the general um, receptivity of youth to these kinds of new programs, which may not be in the formal curriculum yet, but they are going towards, you know, things that they like to do and they're familiar with, et cetera. Some input from you, Shweta? So, so I think uh, one general common understanding across all the countries, all the 15 countries uh, where our programs are, kids love it. And I'm not saying that because we are program managing it, but we're interacting with it. But just let me give you an idea, right? There are six children from India who've actually filed a patent. Yesterday was the International IP Day, the Global IP Day. 
And there are six children who filed a patent and their projects are ranging on how do you really help uh, people with autism to communicate better in real time, to how do you really predict the right usage model for generating power across a developing economy. Now, these are ideas which only, as you said, you know, uh, children, youth of this age who have access to the right skill sets, to the right tool sets, who can think of. Indonesia is extremely creative. Even when we were working with the makers in Indonesia, with SMKs, what we realized was that the projects which we got out of Indonesia were incomparable. We still have those case studies which have created waves on the global stage. And they all come from far corners, remote corners, as, as remote as South Sulawesi uh, across the country. Uh, stories which are very heartwarming, which have a social impact, which would really be advantageous to the community at large. So children really adapt well to it, but surprisingly, even teachers are doing that today. See, there was an era when we were all talking about how technology in education was a struggle for most of the teachers. But today, the silver lining of this ongoing pandemic, I guess, is that teachers have realized that that is become an essential component of their lives. They are relating well to it. They knew that technology will keep evolving, will keep changing. They're exchanging lesson plans across the globe. We did a youth summit which had participation, participants from almost 100 countries, which is unbelievable, where educators come together and they share best practices, they share their lesson plans, they share their teaching methodologies, they share their thought processes, youth come and share their practices. So that kind of, uh, I would say collaboration is only possible on digital platforms. And that is how it is working. Um, but the response has been great. And anything new is exciting. Professional development is a must for teachers. Uh, investing in developing their capacities is equally essential if you want to make something scalable and sustainable. And that can be any subject. It's not just artificial intelligence. It can be design thinking, computational thinking, algorithmic thinking, even basic skill sets of leadership. So there needs to be a lot of investment which a country needs to make in developing capacities of the teachers, of their educators, in order to ensure that it becomes completely scalable across the country as a solution. Yeah. Veda, in fact, I have seen how Intel does some of its training. It creates a very fun work environment for kids, a you know, fun learning environment. They play games and they, you know, they see animations. I guess that's one way to relate something difficult to them by bringing it down to a level that they understand. So yeah, that's great input, Veda. I'm going to go to Professor Johannes. You know, Professor Johannes, one of the things, the challenges of countries like uh, India, Indonesia, developing nations is, uh, you know, um, it's not often that somebody becomes an entrepreneur by choice. In many cases, they learn entrepreneurship out of necessity and they are thrown into a world where they have to create a job for themselves because maybe the industry is not producing the kind of job they train for. It's a complex, it's a complex answer. But it actually is a positive thing because, you know, many of these economies have been built by these grassroots entrepreneurs. They are the ones who have really created the engine of economy in their little towns and villages, and they're powering on. So I, I feel giving them the right skills of entrepreneurship to do it the right way, to scale up, to learn new things, will really empower a nation because it's not actually a negative thing. It's actually a positive thing. If there are people and people want to learn skills to create economic value, we must find a way to engage with them and give them the right skills. So I know this uh, for Indonesia, the position is different from EU, the country, the, uh, you know, the situation may be different. Any inputs from you, uh, Professor Johannes, about uh, how you know, entrepreneurship can be embedded early into children's minds uh, with the syllabus or maybe any other methodology? Over to you, Professor. Thank you. Um, I stress this point a lot because I'm coming from a country which is very rich today, yeah. but in the past it was not rich. We were a very poor country uh, and we had periods uh, where there was a, a tremendous war and all was destroyed. Therefore, I think when we speak about a modern style of learning, it doesn't mean automatically digital and so on. A modern style of learning is that we make open-minded persons 
that we give the students the possibility to be creative and innovative in many cases. It's an attitude development. And this attitude development needs to start in primary learning. When we want that our students later on take over responsibility and are, are able to, to handle larger challenges. Therefore, we support a challenge-based learning. Like our colleague before mentioned the problem-based learning, I prefer challenge-based learning. And you need to start this very early. Um, and therefore, I also like a lot what the colleague before mentioned. In the syllabus, you need to bring some experimental things inside, like fix a project each year, a week where in the, uh, in, the, in the design of the syllabus is mentioned, yeah, in this week, everybody is allowed to do a project. Because then you will have a lot of teachers who will be creative what you are using with these possibilities when you are thinking out of the box in the way of syllabus. I like also that each teacher needs to take over basic competence. But we have learned it's important that you have to write down cross disciplinary competences, and you also have to link it to some subject. Otherwise, um, you have maybe written down things in the syllabus which are very modern, but no one is responsible really for that. Because when you say everyone is responsible, sometimes it means no one is responsible. Um, I also would like to bring one more line. When you develop a syllabus, it's also important to see how you are doing your assessment. How is the assessment culture in the country? Because the assessment has a tremendous effect about the openness of a syllabus, about the way how you can make an interpretation of the syllabus. And when you have a fixed assessment, which is very knowledge-based oriented, you destroy all this openness and these possibilities. We have in some subjects written down, the students have to do a project. This is a part of the assessment. And our final examination, all each student has to do a project. It's a part of our final examination. It's a total different approach. It was a long development. It was not a jump. But I think this is, has nothing to do be, to be a rich or a poor country. This has more to do uh, with the point that you, you experiment some things. Because to make a project, it's not cost intensive. Um, and uh, I think. There are some things which we are easily uh, able to share, uh, and we are doing this also in many countries. And it's important to find things where you see you can share uh, creative and innovative approaches, which everyone can use. Doesn't matter is it, do you have uh, uh, the infrastructure, or maybe sometimes you have a larger group, um, because we are working with some Asian countries where the students are 50 in the in the class which is unbelievable for us because our largest number is 25, but still with 50 people, with some circumstances, you can do a lot. And of course, with digital elements, you can jump to several things, but it's cost intensive, but in some cases, it's worth to invest this money. Thank you, Professor. Yes. I'm actually going to yes. jump to Panino. Yes. Would you like to react to that, Panino? Yeah, Pasahin, I was going to jump in. Um, <laughs> you read my body language uh, as well. Um, uh, very much agree, pa, uh, Professor. Um, and that's why in Indonesia, one of the things, the first things we did uh, in the ministry was to get rid of UJIA National, the national examination, which is a content-based um, uh, high stakes exam for all students. Um, in grades nine and 12. We also got rid of a content-based exam, uh, regional exams at grade six, nine and 12. Uh, and that's precisely because we know that teaching and learning is driven by what is assessed at the end of the day. And uh, we are replacing that with a national assessment, which we hope would reorient teachers to teach towards developing basic competencies instead of going wide and knowing a lot, a lot of knowledge, but useless, as, as you say, inert knowledge. Um, what, what good would it be for them uh, um, outside of the uh, school exam? Um, so yes, Pasahin, <coughs> completely agree. Assessment is key there. It, you cannot separate assessment and curriculum.
But yeah. the challenge, and I also agree that we need to encourage assessment of project-based learning, but that is much more difficult than uh, establishing a standardized ass assessment at the national level. And uh, because this means that, yeah. Yeah, I got you. Uh, Panreno, I just want to ask, uh, because we are running out of time, I'm going to close in the next two, three minutes. I wanted your last view on, you know, Pam Mantri this morning had mentioned that, you know, they are in, actually undertaking a data uh, project of uh, using technology actually to get inputs that will help the ministry. And it's a big data project, uh, though he says he doesn't call it a big data project, but essentially it's the first time big data is being used to make an assessment of the entire system uh, across all different aspects. So using technology to refine curriculum is a fantastic way of you know, identifying early what are the uh, pressure points or the pain points and uh, finding, uh, you know, therefore creative solutions which are based not on just uh, you know, gut feel or opinion, but really based on data. Uh, would you like to say something about that, what you're doing? Because I know that you've been very much involved in this. Yeah, what Pak Menteri was uh, saying is actually the national assessment. Um, we are re re redesigning uh, from the bottom up, really, the, the way the education system is evaluated at the moment. Um, and as Pak Menteri said, we are putting student learning front and center of it. So what we consider good schools are schools that are successful in developing student character and competencies. Uh, the kinds of competencies that, that I mentioned and but we can mention as the profil pelajar Pancasila, right? Creativity, problem solving, critical thinking, um, ethical thinking, and so on. Um, and we do that by um, going into schools and getting a sample of students from each school um, and assessing their literacy, numeracy, and all of those characters. But uh, on top of that, we are also asking students about what they think uh, in terms of the quality of teaching and learning and the school as a learning environment, their school as a learning environment. And this is what I meant by asking the student, getting the student's voice um, in the process of evaluating uh, curriculum reform and educational reform more broadly. So for the first time next year or the end of this year, we will have students' perspective about the quality of teaching and learning, the quality of the learning environment, how safe is their schools, how inclusive do they think their schools are, right? Uh, from the students' perspective, not only from the teachers and principals' perspective. And just adding one more thing, we are also collecting data from teacher platform. So uh, Pak Menteri has a separate team um, developing uh, an education super app, if you will. Right? Um, Hopefully when teachers across Indonesia use this app, we will be able to collect real-time data about uh, the kinds of toolkits that they value, right? um, how much time they spend in teaching topics A, topics B, topics C, and so on. And this is obviously um, the initial phase of, of the development, but fingers crossed. That's fantastic. <laughs> No, but you know, next year when we do the education forum annual, we definitely want you to be there to you know give us an update on what's coming out of this new study. In fact, you know, Professor Johannes, uh, we have uh, 560,000 schools in Indonesia, and there are more than 50 million students. So you can imagine what kind of rich data that will come through. There are five million teachers. It's a huge system. It's the fourth largest education system in the world. So I'm really looking forward to these inputs, Panino, and you know, we're very honored to have you here today all my panelists uh, shweta professor johannes ibu inger thank you so much for being here today uh, we'll continue this conversation because we have the education forum having monthly roundtables and we take up different topics at every time and we'll definitely be great to have you panino on one of the roundtables where we can you know probably do a little deep dive into something else that you may find of value to interact with the others sure, thank, thank you so you much to all our panelists, and uh, I'm going to hand this over to the uh, to Pashoeb back in the studio. Thank you, uh, thank you, Sachin, and thank you to the panelists. Of a great discussion. I think as we've seen as as the day has unfolded, 
we have gone deeper and deeper into, into such a, some of the key topics surrounding the education sector. And I think having speakers of the quality that we've just had has really enriched the conversation. And I think uh, a lot of our particip participants would have benefited tremendously. So thank you very much, uh, Panino, Shweta, Ibu Inga, and Dr. Johannes. Thank you so much for sh uh, sharing your time and knowledge with us. Uh, we now will move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Rani Butchmore. Uh, she's the Asia Pacific Education Industry Lead, uh, K Child Strategy, Sales and Program for Microsoft. Uh, she's going to speak about the digital transformation of primary and secondary education. Uh, Dr. Rani, welcome back. It's good to have you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the warm welcome. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, very clearly. Okay, awesome. Um, okay, so shall I start? Yes, please. The stage is yours. Thank you. Okay, first thing that I want to do. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here. And um, today, before I go into the conversation, um, I have witnessed over the last year or so the incredible work um, and the adversity that our teachers and our leaders and our educators uh, actually went through. So I always find, look for an opportunity to thank them. And I want to thank them. Uh, I have a 13 year old and with the amazing work that these teachers and, and leaders do, without that, I think um, things will be a little bit more graver than it is um, at the moment. So. I want to start by thanking all of the wonderful leaders and educators in Indonesia, the teachers who are in the trenches, who bring the knowledge and outcomes, no matter the challenge, the conditions, the students, um, or the you know, tools available. I would also like to thank our Microsoft partners who have made success possible in so many ways in Indonesia through so many challenges that they themselves were facing in the past year. And I think finally, it's uh, great to be here at IDEF and, and the MOE. Thanks for actually organizing events like this for thought leadership because forums such as this are very vital in my opinion for sharing ideas, for nurturing and promoting thought leadership to bringing all the different stakeholders who are here listening together. Let me just start with a quote um, from our CEO. Indonesia is a vast melting pot of such opportunities that he talks about. From the many individual islands and the tens and thousands of rural villages uh, to hundreds of cities, uh, this is a land of many communities and many opportunities. And the impact of a proper education and skilling strategy um, benefits many, many fold. So each one has its own microculture and its microeconomy and all of them are ready for local initiatives, innovation, and entrepreneurs to drive the nation forward. So I, I see this COVID influence and driven education transformation uh, really optimizing on uh, Indonesia, which, has, which is rich in, in potential. With that said, let me start a little bit by sharing, and I know the previous speaker also shared some stuff from India, and I want to sort of bring that to one, one example from India. Um, the last 12 months has brought us so many lessons. Um, so looking at India, we can learn from some of the recent efforts and their research to identity, uh, identify the key factors to success. If you look at the brookings.edu um, um, study that happened, um, while lamentable, um, the um, the disruption to education systems worldwide during COVID-19 offered valuable lessons and provides a unique opportunity to reimagine uh, education, the curriculum as you're talking about today and pedagogy. So this is like the optimum time, I, I believe, for us to really go through what all this means. Um, Address the digital divide. Technology has the potential to achieve universal quality of education, which I've heard many of the um, you know, speakers today talk about and improve learning outcomes. But in order to unleash its potential, the digital divide and its embedded gender divide 
uh, must be addressed. Digital capabilities, the required infrastructure and connectivity must reach to the remotest uh, and poorest of communities. Uh, you know, access to technology and the internet is an urgent requirement in the information age. It should no longer be a luxury, it's a necessity as some of you have shared. Reorient the curriculum. The curriculum must be grounded in students and it's really heartwarming to listen to the debate and the conversation today because it really reaffirms what we see across, across the world. Um, developing a symbiotic relationship with our environment has taken on a new urgency and teachers must help students think about their relationship with the universe and everyone and everything in it. And that requires a, a different way of looking at curriculum as, as we've been just talking about. Empowering more teachers, the shift to distance learning has afforded many opportunities that we saw in, in India in this study to teach differently, encouraging self-learning as the um, Minister Nadim shared very early in the, in, the, in, in the session, flipping the way that we think about education, providing opportunities to learn from diverse uh, resources and allowing customized learning, um, customized learning for diverse needs. Uh, through high-tech and low-tech um, sources, improving the education system requires um, a decentralized and democratic community-based approach. And we are seeing that not just in India, but across the world, where the community ownership of education is cultivated, which includes you know, the parents and the entire community. We are forced, and it's about time to really reimagine how we will solve both the new and the old challenges. So I really love Einstein's quote, right? Um, often coming from a, uh, the commercial part of the business, you know, we, we always love to problem solve and we love the solutions. But, you know, in the era of 2020, the COVID education around the world has forced us to rush into solutions naturally. It's time for us now though, to spend the necessary thinking to reinvestigate the problems and the challenges, just like Indonesia is doing. Uh, what an exemplary thought process that we went, I witnessed this morning for this. Uh, what once was a sprint to not, to, not too long ago is now a marathon of a journey and the finish line is always moving, as all of us know. Um, so how do we plan for this new journey? So in, in Microsoft, we look at um, this journey very holistically. First, let's learn what education transformation is. Education transformation is about reimagining how you bring people together, data, and process together to create value for the stakeholders, right? That, that's educators, parents, students, etc. And maintain a competitive advantage in the digital first world for the country. Empower students across all demographics with the skills they need to succeed in an AI-enabled world. That's what we are trying to do with education transformation. In Microsoft, we use the education transformation framework, which is not the right answer. <laughs> it is there as a guide to ask the right question. I think it's a journey of investigation and discovery with a set of principles to guide our path. Because by finding the right answers to these questions and by applying um, these principles to our strategy, the education transformation framework can be a guidepost um, to success. Uh, for all of our countries, we are seeing an enormous amount of a holistic approach, 360 degree view for transformation, bringing all the stakeholders to the table, getting a clear transformation roadmap and learning from others' mistakes and successes, right? So we are not reinventing the wheel. So this full framework that we have is applied at different levels, whether it's at the ministry level, coming down, doing workshops and exploring what are the, you know, what are the right questions to ask and how to solve problems, or at the DINAS level in Indonesia, at the provincial level, um, using the same methodology um, to think and talk about how um, we can scale adoption and engagement whilst also thinking about um, technology interventions and how data is collected, you know, the whole plethora of things. 
So we use these 16 um, components for this, um, this thought process and workshopping. The leadership and policy is really about embracing a culture of exchange with flexible policies and processes that enable um, data-driven decisions, delivers an autonomous teaching and learning environment for the students and educators. And when we talk about you know, exploring the intelligent environment, we talk about creating uh, creative collaboration in flexible learning spaces, enabling energy efficient ways of working and providing responsive and coordinated security to keep schools safe. It's very, very important student and school success, a reliable, responsive, data-driven uh, technology environment empowering leaders, educators, uh, and learners to achieve more every day in, uh, achieve more every day in the modern classroom. Whether that classroom is inside a building, it's at home, or it's at a park. Um, and teaching and learning, the flexible future ready skills teaching curriculum that you again, we talked about just then, that enables educators to personalize learning for students, creating a more um, tailored experience. So that's how we use um, the transformation framework as a guide to ask questions so we can do systemic uh, change management. Now, we have done this over the last you know months years and you know for indonesia we've worked with uh, several of the stakeholders to come up with what a school digital transformation roadmap would look like it is leveraged at scale so you know we were talking about you know all this amazing work that is being done uh, by the ministry and the change management process how does that then land in every school? You know, I mean, Nadim talked about that this morning, you know, how do we take all of these and he's reviewing and working out how does that then land uh, at the school principal or the school leader level? And how does that land with the different teachers or that one IT person, if there's an IT person in the school, all the way down to the very remote areas, how does that change land and how do we, um, provide some sort of equi equitable uh, access um, and learning for the students. So this cannot be done on its own. It, it needs to be done through an ecosystem. So we work with all of the local partners. The reason for me thanking them is during COVID, oh, we had a mobilizing of all of these partners who really wanted to go out there and make sure that there was continued education wherever possible, that uh, went out there and just trained thousands and thousands and thousands of teachers on how to use basic collaboration tools. And now, you know, taking that base and um, working with the teachers on how to build uh, lesson plans that are catered to all the things that we were talking about just then. So let's look at how all of this is relevant in Indonesia from a Microsoft lens, right? So. We heard this morning about Scholar and Grant. So I'm going to take a small piece of the many technologies that the ministry is uh, having, and I want to take a small piece of that and then provide a, a, a vendor's lens on it. We already have we have excellent leadership. That's you know by you know not it's undeniable. You all are familiar with uh, Guru Pengra. There are some core pillars in this Guru Pengra program established by Director General Pat Gamari. Uh, I'm gonna translate this into English. The Mobilizer Schools program is an, it's, you know, it's an evolu evolution of the Merdeka Belajar. Uh, let's take a look at the fifth pillar specifically in this. Um, and that fifth pillar really talks about collaboration between uh, MOEC with regional government, whereas the commitment of the regional government is the main key. Uh, holistic intervention starting from schools, human resources, learning, planning, digitization, and assisting the regional government. Having scope that cover every school's condition, not only the top schools, so we're trying to get uh, a, a sense of equity and access. Uh, assistance. Uh, will take place for three academic years in the schools to continue transformation efforts and programs will be conducted in an integrated ecosystem. So since we are focusing how to 
test try scale of the program, let's have a look at pillar number five. So the National School Transformation, this is the pillar that we just went through. Um, number one, consultative and asymmetry mentoring assistance to schools. We do change management services through our global training partners and partner networks. So we have uh, our feet on the ground, a whole lot of partners who are part of a training program, who we train to be able for the partners from a pedagogical sense, from a technical sense, how to use technology in a classroom environment, how to be able, how to enable the technology to be used in the first place so that it is working. Um, and that's, that's a partner network that we, we pull on. Enhancing human resources in schools. We have um, several programs uh, for empowering education, educators and leaders with the right tools and support, which I'll talk about in a bit. Learning with a new paradigm, technology integrated lessons. You know, I was asking a minister this morning about Minecraft, you know, um, learning games because this really gets excited. There's millions and millions of people who are already using, kids already using Minecraft. How did we take all of that energy and make sure that that's applied in a school level and also training the teachers how to be able to do that? Database planning, um, the technologies come together to do telemetry that provides insight into how teachers and students are developing their future ready skills. And then the school digitization, you know, access to connectivity, deployment and adoption of the technology that I talked about. So we have uh, mapped all of this. And, you know, the amazing thing is when we try to map and how has um, stakeholders in Indonesia, we're going to help this strategy. It, you know, it was a very, we were not surprised, but it aligned with our core principles of what we, talk about when we talk about transformation of schools, almost 98% of it uh, aligned. So when we did this exercise, the accelerated journey started with about 100,000 teachers trained to be able to conduct remote classes, impacting about 3 million students. And by the end of the year, we planned um, to, to work with, um, with, the, with the Director General. We have plans to to work with the Director General to impact maybe 350,000 teachers. Because the 100,000 teachers that we reached came out of 34 provinces from June to August. 34 provinces where we were doing training with our partners, all directed from uh, Jakarta and believe it or not, from, from Asia and, and, and Jakarta. So, Today, we have trained approximately about a million teachers to integrate technology in their teaching and learning practices, the things that we, we, you know, we talked about just then. How do we do it? You know, there, there's a question, and again, um, Mr. Nadir mentioned this, it, it needs to be scalable, it needs to be leveraged. Um, and we run events to bring a community together um, for these teachers. So the global, annual global event that connects the classrooms from all over the world with one another, technology experts and IT professionals giving an out of the classroom experience. So this is like a fun exercise. Every one of us in Microsoft participates across the world to bring schools together, schools in Indonesia to meet somebody in the US or schools from Myanmar to have a talk to somebody in Sri Lanka. The, the connection and the relationships that form and the community that is created uh, really allows um, our, our, our teachers and our students to sort of think outside the box and look outside the box and be outside the box. Uh, and this then creates a community of how do I problem solve? How do I achieve this or that? And who can I talk to? So it's, it's an amazing um, uh, program that we see Indonesian um, schools. We had over 250 schools and 12,500 students in Indonesia participate, and they participated in de uh, 10 different countries, providing you know, the huge networking opportunity that I, I mentioned. The next thing um, about Minecraft, you see the Minecraft there. Believe it or not, this is awesome. 
Uh, we had a student from Indonesia who was the winner for Asia Pacific coding competition using Minecraft uh, um, education edition in, in, in the world stage. So, uh, you know, we always know that there is enormous appetite to increase the activity and the energy in the classrooms. Um, so the training on the Minecraft for education programs for teachers um, will be started this year in 2021. So we are moving to make sure that all of the teachers have an opportunity to actually learn uh, how to use Minecraft and how to create lessons. And it's not just about coding. I'll give you an example. In Korea, the Minecraft um, world was used to do graduations. In, in New Zealand, the Minecraft worlds were used to create um, cultural studies on the nuances of, um, you know, and also the social and emotional learning components. So um, it is not just about the coding aspect, it is about using a fun environment um, to create lessons and also assessments uh, by watching and doing um, with, with the students and the teachers. We also have, we, we, in Indonesia, we run the Education Exchange, which is the annual event to celebrate the most innovative teachers and educator leaders across Indonesia. I think these are all really, really critical components because to create the community means to then create excitement and enthusiasm. Now, I said earlier, when we looked at the, the, the Mobilizer Schools plan and we looked at our Showcase Schools plan, it was amazing because um, it was 100%, 98% aligned. So we have been able to do the alignment as part of becoming a showcase school because we do quite a lot of training for across. This is our engagement programs where we, we go out there with our teachers. And just so for everybody's knowledge, uh, all of the tools in what we use in Microsoft, all the tools that you're seeing on that screen is at no cost. So the, re the provinces actually engage with us to say, all right, let's go and deploy this out to everyone. And we do the deployment for the provinces. And then at the school level, what we are providing them after doing that is um, school leadership workshops. And this is the change management. How do you think about your school and how you manage and how you take care of your teachers and how you think about the PD? So there was a point made earlier today that it is really important to find those innovative leaders who, who may not be necessarily sitting in a very well-equipped um, school, but who wants to transform the way that teaching and, and how, the, how the lessons are conducted, uh, how we include uh, social and emotional learning, how do we uh, think about the whole person when we are teaching them um, any subject for that matter. So, and then we go through the culture of learning and growth. This is part and parcel of the workshops that we do with the leaders and the teachers. And then we talk to them and we help them personalize the learning and the inclusion component. For those of you who don't know, one of my favorite things that has is the immersive reader. So the immersive reader allows for students with um, challenges to be able to, whether they're dyslexic or, um, you know, it, it allows, them to focus on what they're doing and it's done in such a fun way the immersive readers uh, one of the technologies that is you know comes at no cost with our portfolio of products like minecraft as well as the portfolio of our products so that we take care of all the all the students um, you know as much as we can who, who need that additional help and we talk about future ready skills, computational skills, we talk about problem solving skills, all of those things that all of you have been, have been talking about. We have a series of lessons, uh, courses, and we are really talking about how to handle, um, you know, uh, the different level of attention that a student needs in the classroom um, from uh, how do you bring the learning process into the classroom. So, we don't leave anyone behind in the classroom. All of these are skills that we provide to the teachers, um, you know, maths and science and all of that is almost mostly taken care of. It's all the in between the gel, the glue that needs to bring all of that in a sustainable and a meaningful way 
um, for, the, for the students is what we are trying to do here. And then we do data-driven decisions. As part of the portfolio, they, the schools and, and the regions actually have access to Power BI dashboards um, and you know, to look at data the way that they want to see if they can assess how students, you know, what else, what other interventions they need to make when it comes to teacher development and adoption and usage. Now, uh, learning impact is enabled by the, the suite of stuff that you are seeing there. So let me just talk a little bit about what, um, what support, I, I, I talked very much about all the different things. When we say support, we are really trying to do is capacity building for leaders and teachers digital transformation guidance, and access to a whole lot of courses and latest research based on latest research. When we say recognition, we are really talking about making sure that the teachers and the leaders who are going through the transformation process are really proud and they're recognized and, and, and you know, they can showcase what they are doing to build, um, to build a network, to, to make, uh, to enthuse everyone else to follow and learn. Uh, the next thing we talk about is impact. The impact is really about, um, believe it or not, this group of um, schools and teachers also give us uh, uh, input on how technology can evolve to do things better for them. They innovate. It's amazing. A lot of the uh, amazing tools that you see, whether it's an inclusion tool or, you know, um, how do I present something but make it fun? A lot of the Minecraft um, character, you know, uh, specs and requirements and characteristics that come out are from a lot of our teachers who are providing us working through the lesson plans and saying, you know, I really want to make sure that this is easier. So I think that they contribute. They contribute to us. They contribute to the other schools around the world and as the quote said it, it's building community uh, engagement and we also they also increase the influence when we you know celebrate uh, the innovators um, amongst our teacher population and lastly you know building the community to show make sure that we, we talked about it again today how do we build a community so that the teachers don't feel like they are alone on the journey um, how can they leverage other lesson plans that has been made? So we've got the Microsoft Educator Community site, and we've got thousands and thousands of teachers from, um, from uh, Indonesia who are part of that, so they can actually collaborate with teachers, not just from um, their province and the province outside, but also outside of the country with other, other schools and other teachers. And this is the great way for the um, leaders to share insights and so let me tell you what is next for us. Um, because I'm really only talking about, you know, this component of how do we land the showcase school or school in Iraq, how do we land it in, in the schools? We are officially working with several of the deaners already to be able to help them deploy the right technology in the schools train the teachers and the school leaders at the school level, and also use a programmatic way so that they are part of a community. Uh, what you are seeing here is, you know, um, Senjai, Ponorobo, uh, Jawa Tenga, uh, Papua, Surabaya. So we are in the process of making sure that we are inviting any province that is looking at this today to reach out to us because this is part of Microsoft's mission to be able to empower every student and teacher um, in the world to do more. So as part of a mission, these activities that we do has really, really um, comes together uh, and not just by ourselves, but a whole partner ecosystem. Those folks that we train to go and make this happen in the field. So collaboration is not just at the ministerial level. We all have already created these partnerships for the institutions to bring the tailored localized solution for their community. So in some cases, we are redeveloping what is norm to take into nuances of differences um, in, in the community. 
and approximately 380,000 teachers and 6.5 million students impact from just uh, this relationship. I just wanted to put it out there. Um, and have I done that in time, Sachin? Yes, uh, time is good, perfect. Time is good. Do we have any, any time for questions? Oh, you have gone silent again. No, we do have questions, but it's in the panel. We have one presentation after this. Uh, okay. And I then get into the panel. Thank you, Sachin. And I want to say thank you to everyone, because I think um, you know, none of this is possible by us if the country itself isn't willing to transform. And we've had those instances as well. So I, I just think it is awesome for the partnership and the trust that has been put with us. So thank you very, very much. And I really appreciate it. And please contact me and you can see all that on the, on the call as well if you've got any questions for us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rani. That was a very inspiring presentation. And I think you can clearly see the amount of uh, engagement from the private sector with not just the ministry, as you say, but the entire educational ecosystem in Indonesia. So thank you very much for that uh, uh, very inspiring presentation, Dr. Rani. Um, st do stay tuned. We'll be back with you. Uh, we have one more presentation uh, by Ibu Nur Futriani. She's the instructional designer at the Directorate for General uh, Early Education, Early Childhood and Secondary Education at the Ministry of Educa uh, Education and Culture. Uh, Ibu Noor? Yes. Hello, Ibu. Welcome. Hello. Welcome to the Indonesia Education Forum, and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this afternoon, uh, we look forward to listening to your presentation. Uh, you have about 10, 15 minutes for your presentation. So the stage is yours. OK, thank you, Dr. Rani. Good afternoon. <laughs> OK, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Norfitriana. You can call me Fia. I'm representing uh, Mr. Chumeri, the Director General for Early Childhood primary and secondary education. And please do apologize for not be able to directly join this meeting himself since he has to attend another strategic meeting with the Minister of Education. We also send a warm regards for all delegates, participants, and committees who attend uh, our meeting today. And before I'm going to a presentation, we have a uh, uh, maybe a video to watching together because uh, this afternoon maybe also sleepy maybe uh, and then so tired uh, since this morning all presentation and all panelists is really really excited and then full information uh, especially for the priority program from ministry of education and culture and then uh, ministry of education uh, ministry of education and culture we have a supported uh, IT facilities for school ranging from elementary to uh, secondary level, school to prepare them with uh, technology as learning for all students. This also prepares school in implementing what uh, we can call the assessment of minimum competency or AKM, like Ms., uh, Mr. Nino uh, said that, uh, which is the will measure the competency of student and also school regarding the literacy and numeracy. Uh, we have also provided training for technology adoption for the teacher to, optimal, uh, to optimize these uh, ICT facilities and digital learning resources that can be freely accessibly accessible in the website in Ministry of Education like Ms. Uh, Rani, Microsoft, Google, we collaborate with another uh, partnership. Maybe before I'm going for presentation, we can play this, uh, the first video. So please watch. Hello, 
teknologi dari hari ke hari semakin tidak bisa dipisahkan dari dunia pendidikan. Kami merespons hal tersebut dengan menjadikan digitalisasi sekolah sebagai salah satu prioritas dari Merdeka Belajar. Melalui pengembangan platform pendidikan nasional berbasis teknologi dan pembangunan infrastruktur kelas atau sekolah masa depan. Pandemi COVID-19 Pemanfaatan teknologi yang optimal dapat menghadirkan lompatan kemajuan di bidang pendidikan. Pemerintah melalui Kementerian Pendidikan dan Kebudayaan menghadirkan akun pembelajaran untuk mendorong pembelajaran berbasis teknologi. Kami mengucapkan terima kasih kepada Menteri Pendidikan dan Kebudayaan Mas Nadiem Makarim, kepada Dirjen Pakut Bidas dan Bidasmen Pak Jumeri, kepada Direktur Sekolah Dasar Ibu Sri Wahyuningsi, dan kepada seluruh pihak yang terkait. Atas bantuan berupa 15 unit kerombuk kepada SD Negeri Pendidik 01 Kota Tangerang Selatan Provinsi Banten. Kejar Mutu yang dilaksanakan oleh Direktorat Sekolah Dasar Kementerian Pendidikan Indonesia bekerjasama dengan Kualita Pendidikan Indonesia yang dilaksanakan di Kabupaten Nabire, Tanah Papua ini adalah sebagai bentuk dari hadirnya pemerintah untuk melakukan pendampingan psikososial kepada anak didik kita yang ada di sana dan juga implementasi modul pendampingan kepada siswa. Guruku pernah berkata, sekolah kami akan mendapatkan bantuan akses internet dari pemerintah. Aku senang sekali. Aku bisa mencari informasi apapun yang aku mau. Aku juga bisa berbicara dengan orang lain melalui internet. Jendela informasi sudah terbuka luas untukku. Terima kasih akses internet rakyat. Terima kasih Bakti. Ini aku menyadari begitu besar manfaat akses internet untuk negeri ini. Lima, program pemerataan pendidikan dan infrastruktur sekolah. 
yang bertujuan untuk mengurangi kesenjangan di wilayah terdepan, terluar, dan tertinggal Indonesia. Di tengah masa darurat COVID-19 kemendikbud menghadirkan terobosan berupa bantuan subsidi kuota data internet sebagai salah satu solusi untuk meringankan beban ekonomi guru dan keluarga serta mendukung pembelajaran jarak jauh. Ini merupakan pertama kalinya pemerintah menyalurkan bantuan masif berupa kuota data internet kepada puluhan juta masyarakat yang membutuhkan. Oke, okay, thank you so much uh, for the next slide. Oke, okay. Indonesia uh, Education Vision, maybe the Mas Nadim and then Mr. Iwan or maybe Mr. Nino, they said uh, the same things that realize, uh, realizing a uh, moving forward Indonesia with a star of uh, independent and uh, personable personable truth the creation of pelajar Pancasila we are a critical creative uh, independent faithful godly to God and then the character building work together and then global diversity for uh, included to pool to uh, pelajar Pancasila and then next slide it's too small for me <laughs> <laughs> Just to read this uh, presentation. And then the first thing in technology, school digitalization, technology literacy are an implementation of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematical like uh, uh, ICT facilities assistance in a form of a Chromebook for school digitalization for uh, AKM or assessment competency uh, minimum, providing learning sources of technology-based learning media in the form video and digital books. Uh, we are partnership with and collaboration with another like uh, NGO or another ministry or GSR. And then the data services and then A services for all form or services and reporting like uh, Bantuan operasional sekolah, we reporting not only uh, using a paper for reporting, but uh, now everything is uh, online services or a layanan. Webinar services to uh, answering issues and the need from school to access technology services related to policy uh, during a pandemic especially, and then how to target all the school all over uh, Indonesia were at a uh, remote area or urban area, program sekolah penggerak which all uh, which will uh, synergize and collaborate uh, collaborate for new learning paradigm in 21st century skills and then program kampus mengajar the equality of education uh, quality especially at a remote area um, for especially for a school in a primary school which uh, indicated the C accreditation and then inclusive school services of education, equality services, or non-formal education to fulfill right of education services all for all the students. And then the collaboration with all partners be able to uh, realize a six indicators profile pelajar Pancasila, and then how the achievement profile pelajar Pancasila, and then a sekolah penggerak or education transformation. The first excellence, uh, human resources and realizing the profile pelajar Pancasila, realizing a student with attitude, uh, think globally and act locally. Uh, synergize with a local government to encourage them to for giving education services in uh, that in line with a local potential and local wisdom. 
and then the inclusive education and anti-bullying, uh, equitable internet access. And then the next slide. We know about the uh, in revolusi industry 4.0 we using a uh, technology like um, Mr. Rani that uh, maybe uh, Microsoft like uh, Kahoot is uh, really really interesting really really excited for a student or for teacher because it's it's really easy and then uh, in Ministry of Education we having a uh, rumah belajar is accesses is free and digital books and all etc but we know it's not uh, all area in indonesia is having a connection internet and having uh, the connection of electricity is uh, some of them having a blank spot area so we we need a collaboration with another ministry like a uh, cominfo and then the prior uh, priority uh, activities next slide Priority activities uh, in Directorate General Early Childhood Education, Primary Education, and Secondary uh, Education for fiscal year uh, 2021, the first provision of educational facilities, ICT and APA, alat permainan edukatif for early childhood. Uh, so the first thing, support for learning and implement, uh, implementation, AKM through uh, ICT assistance, because uh, not all school, uh, especially for primary school, is is uh, from this year is the first time using the ICT for uh, national examination or national uh, examination for primary school. So maybe uh, the school is not having a ICT tools. They can join with a school in that are having a ICT tools maybe in the same level in primary school or another level in secondary maybe or senior maybe senior high school or maybe in vocational school because we having a system, zonation system. Zonation system is not only for uh, new students in the new year uh, of education, but uh, also the sharing all facilities in this uh, zonation. And then the second one, ICT equipment for special education. And then the third one is a profession APA, alat permainan edukatif, uh, especially for uh, early childhood. And then the second one is curriculum and assessment. The first, uh, socialization and coordination implementation national assessment with the local government and all schools for all principal and supervisor because until now uh, even we we always uh, having a socialization coordination with the local government uh, with a webinar or another another way but but a school they they don't want to uh, move on in the national uh, national examination so they they not having a uh, implement uh, merdeka belajar uh, the first episode and then the second one is uh, assistant to in the implementation of the simplified uh, curriculum. And then the third one is drafting of the special education uh, curriculum module because uh, when they're during a pandemic, we, we have a uh, independent module for especially for uh, literacy and numeracy by Pusmanjar, uh, especially we distribute in the remote area. Uh, we collaborate with the uh, GSR, Danone, to distribute and then maybe in the urban area or capital city they can uh, download this uh, module uh, free uh, to, uh, with a uh, website in ministry of education or in pusmanjar or in portal rumah belajar and then the fostering learners strengthening uh, strengthening of program extracurriculum and co-curriculum like uh, bela negara pramuka the radicalism uh, spirituality entrepreneurship leadership and then uh, with uh, game, uh, traditional games, interest and talents through the sports, science, art and culture, talent on academic and literacy. And then improving program school health program, especially during pandemic and then preparation for reopening school with a standard uh, health protocol. And then uh, special education, special services, communities, education and disaster. For the first, uh, we having a program ADEM, and then the second one, assistant for open school operational, like uh, SLB, Sekolah Luar Biasa, and CLC. And then the next one, uh, assistant for literacy and equality. 
because um, maybe in remote area, uh, remote area especially we should uh, improve and engage uh, how the literacy and then equality of education and then the, the last one a disaster emergency uh, response and then the quality insurance sekolah penggerak dan daerah penggerak coordination with the local government to create a 2500 school uh, school sekolah penggerak uh, in the uh, primary school in the secondary school and a senior high school is totally is 2500 school atau sekolah penggerak advocacy local government to follow up the resolve for national assessment scorecard school and then the scorecard uh, district to, to sustainability and then to correct to evaluation and then to make a new program is having a big impact uh, for a student and then for uh, to engage the quality of education and then the facilities and supervision school uh, quality insurance and then strengthening human resource local UPT like uh, PP2 PAUD or LPMP. And then next slide, distance learning services uh, during a pandemic COVID. The first is digital learning resources. And then the second one, module for independent learning, literacy and numeration. And then ICT devices assistance, credit a quota assistance, and then community learning uh, center in the borders area. Uh, uh, between uh, Malaysia and Indonesia. So we're talking about the quota assistance, created a quota assistance. So many school and then many teacher, they said also many parents, how, how we can, uh, so this, this quota is not useful for us because in our area is not uh, internet connection or the electricity uh, connection is playing spot. So we can facilitate uh, for the module uh, for independent learning, uh, literacy and numeracy, that's pretty cool. And then the six, uh, we have a partnership. In our uh, partnership is more than a 68, uh, 30x uh, partnership like a uh, Tanoto, Innovasi, Microsoft, Google, and then uh, Ruang Guru, and then uh, so many many uh, many partnership like a uh, PT Nestle, Danone, and etc. The services of all school uh, to provide a profil belajar Pancasila and then to uh, pro uh, preparation reopening schools. So we we make sure that all is uh, well prepared to all students, especially in primary school, in the uh, early childhood, uh, secondary, and in senior high school uh, in Indonesia, and especially in remote area, that they are is not having uh, enough bantuan uh, operational school because having a, a little uh, students. And then, so uh, the next, uh, pursue a quality and a psychosocial services like uh, and then a video in remote area we we have uh, services for a psycho uh, psychosocial to make our well-being and then happiness joyful and meaningful learning to reopening school and then the uh, campus mengajar campus mengajar we having this program is a really really uh a uh, big impact because uh, in the 20, uh, 2020, we we have a campus mengajar, we have a program campus mengajar perintis uh, in elementary school, uh, especially in remote area. And then we have uh, also prepared a various services, especially during a pandemic to optimize our learning and quality of education, such as uh, provision and distribution independent modules, which are the implementation of curriculum and simplification. And then relaxation of the use of uh, bus funds, bantuan operational sekolah, providing internet quota assistance for students, as well as uh, assistance from uh, campus mengajar. Uh, this program having uh, made, uh, more about uh, 50,000 students from Director General Higher Education, dispatch, uh, dispatch a student to remote areas, help with learning for three months. And then as well as uh, what we call a sekolah penggerak program and also various webinar that answer need uh, for school, especially during a pandemic. And then uh, 
We also optimize, uh, optimized uh, partnership services. Currently, there are uh, approximately uh, 36, uh, 38 uh, partner who works together, both uh, from ministry, NGO, or TSR, to be able to optimize the quality of education services and uh, create uh, pleasure Pancasila, who are a creative, innovative, independent, uh, through the preparation of face to face learning or preparation for re reopening school. Uh, and then for this transition, we, we having a project STEM, a project based learning uh, uh, with a STEM education, science, technology, engineering. So we, we want to, uh, all students is permain sambil belajar. So they, they feel a joyful and meaningful learning and then not feeling bored uh, with the learning load that is uh, considering life behind for the one year carrying or uh, belajar dari rumah or uh, online distance learning and then during the pandemic and preparation reopening school. We also trying to collaborate with the various parts, especially to realize more comprehensive and holistic school digitization program. We are uh, collaborating with a uh, Ministry of Communication and Information to identify which area that are still having uh, internet connectivity is playing spot. And then it is hoped that uh, the gap in infrastructure limited uh, limitation will no longer occur because we have a try optimally uh, meet this requirement. So uh, we, we do the best for all students in early childhood, primary, secondary, and senior high school. And then also include for non-formal or inclusion of education. So we're having uh, the second video. Maybe you, you know that this uh, program about a campus mengajar, uh, all students in uh, higher of education, they they teach uh, and they coaching and then they, they so are happy to be a volunteer in a primary school, uh, especially in remote areas. So please play and watching this video. Protokol kesehatan ya, kalau ada tata muka ya. Iya, jangan main-main, jangan nyentuh-nyentuh, cuci tangan, dan jangan pernah lepas maskernya ya, jadi ya. Mengenai uh, berbagai macam program, terutama program guru penggerak, ya, dan juga program P3K, ya, uh, mengenai program honorer. Dan ini luar biasa. Saya mulai menyadari setiap kali saya datang, kemarin saya baru dari Papua, sekarang di sini. Reaksi para guru-guru terhadap program guru penggerak ini seolah-olah ini satu program yang belum pernah mereka rasakan sebelumnya. Perubahan paradigma mereka.
Okay, thank you. Uh, we want to make sure the last uh, slide in presentation. We distribute our uh, equipment and digital tools in, uh, especially in primary school and secondary school to digital, uh, digitization school. And then we also prepare, well prepared for reopening schools. It's not only for the health protocol, uh, standard health protocol, but also we make sure that all teachers, they having a strategies to uh, improve their student life skill, and then they want go to back to school because many students they don't want to back to school because it's a really boring, and then they too long for uh, distance learning, and then they don't want to uh, maybe. So writing is only writing, maybe only answer the question, and then with a complicated uh, uh, question, maybe. So we 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 having a well prepared for a teacher, for a supervisor, and then principal to having a training of trainer for a project based learning using a STEM education, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So they they know about how to make a joyful and meaningful learning for their students. So when, with a transition, reopening school, so they is more confidence to uh, say hello with the all students, especially in uh, early childhood maybe, in the primary school and secondary school. So uh, the students can be a uh, independent learner and then critical thinking and then curiosity, they, they want to, go back to school even uh, is difference with uh, with the shifting shifting and then it's only maybe a uh, uh, fifth uh, five until uh, 10 students in in classroom and then only two hours or three hours they meet uh, on another student or uh, another teacher but uh, maybe during a pandemic maybe uh, students or teachers they meet in the home at home for the door to door program so they they we we make sure that it's not a learning loss during a pandemic or during a distance learning so thank you so much uh, for this presentation and thank you thank you Ibukia. thanks a lot for your presentation very interesting and uh... I think you know we should go into the panel discussion now. We got some good uh, inputs from Ibukia's videos as well as a presentation. Uh, Dr. Rani, you are here as well. Uh, I, I'd like to comment quickly on you know your presentation. It was great because I you know I got a chance to see some of the work that you're doing in some of the provinces, and uh, this is exactly the kind of topic that we want to take up in the panel. Uh, but before we get onto that, I'm going to ask Agogot, who's here today. Uh, to talk a little bit about giving some background to the topic, but I, I want to introduce Pal Gogot earlier because you know he has been on the advisory of the Indonesia Education Forum since we ever started two years ago. Uh, Pal Gogot used to be the head of Pustekom, and a lot of these digitalization initiatives were under him uh, for many years. He is one of the pioneers of uh, creating this entire uh, infrastructure within the ministry which is now allowing the ministry to go into all these digital initiatives with the pandemic. It would not have been possible if uh, Gogoth had not put into place that infrastructure and that kind of uh, system in place many years ago, I think four or five years ago, pa Gogoth worked on this. And if Indonesia was able to adapt to online learning and digital learning, it is because of the efforts of people like pa Gogoth and his team. So fantastic, thank you pa Gogoth. Uh, you know, you know, without realizing a pandemic is coming, you yeah. would have actually prepared the country to be ready to be at least do what it's able to do today. That's a great achievement by itself. Also, I must mention that you know, Paul Gogot, uh, while, uh, while he was in Pustekom, he was also in charge of the TV Edukasi, which is a digital television channel of the uh, ministry. And uh, you know, these are all stepping stones. It has come a long way for Indonesia to be digital ready in the education space. And it has taken a lot of people, a lot of steps, a lot of initiatives that has brought us here. And so I believe that you know the best person to have on this panel would be Pagogot because he has a new position now. He's right now in South Korea, 
and he is the education attache there. And he is now uh, exploring ways to innovate with uh, an innovation nation. Everybody knows South, uh, South Korea is uh, way ahead of its uh, neighbors, uh, especially in the education sector. So Pagogat will be able to bring back many learnings and you know find ways to uh, engage uh, different world models into how Indonesia would grow. So Pagogot, uh, without further ado, I'd like you to make your presentation of a few slides that you have prepared for us. Thank you today. And after that, I'm going to get into an engaging conversation with uh, Dr. Rani and Ibukia, which will help us to you know, understand better of how do we build this kind of a scalable model for anything we're doing, whether it's a small idea or a big idea, to take it across the nation, 34 provinces, 16,000 islands, 270 million people, 550,000 schools, 50 million students and 5 million teachers. It's not a joke. It's the fourth largest education system in the world. It is compounded by different challenges which the other three largest education systems don't have. US, China and India do not have the challenges Indonesia has of being a maritime archipelago with different kinds of challenges. Diversity, yes, even India has diversity, but language diversity, and, you know, it's a plethora of so many different problems that need to be solved at a regional level, not just at the national level. So I'm going to come on to that topic, but over to you, Pa Gogot, to set the stage for, you know, some of the things that you would like to share with us. Thank you, Pa Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Burani, Bufia. So thank you, first secretary, Burani, has been elaborating the transformation framework of Microsoft. I took like four days to understand, but now you can elaborate in like what 13 minutes. So you're excellent, you know, excellent, excellent presentation. Uh, I'd like to share with you about how I experienced uh, from pilot to scale up about the ICT initiative in, in many countries because I've been in USA, I've been in uh, France and UNESCO site and also in, uh, especially in Indonesia. So it's just to, to, to uh, build up to give some idea about uh, how we look at this uh, pilot piloting initiative. So it took me a while, you know, as I said, to create this because uh, 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 it's not easy to, to come up about how to start from pilot to scale up. Actually, when we have the initiative, mostly we will fall into three categories. Either we want to create more numbers or you widening the scope or improving the quality. Any innovation in technology mostly will fall into three categories. So if you want to increase the number of students, number of teachers, number of schools being trained with LMS with any tools, then we come to the quantity side. If you want to improve with other tools or different kind of training or workshop or modules, then we'll come to a scope area. And then, of course, we are not happy with this tool and we put them into improving the quality. So we want to make sure that the quality is accredited or certificate or quality assurance by any company or any expert, then we fall into the third category. But all of this has to be under the boundaries of the context and the relevancies, the meaningful. Meaningful of what? The context of what? The relevance of, of student learning. Actually, since the beginning, uh, Mas Menteri elaborating about the vision, his vision about education. Uh, I now has come to this conclusion basically. Uh, this is a very heavy uh, session this time you know, because we have to scale up all of the talks you know, from the beginning until this afternoon. But uh, actually, where are the technologies play a role now? So the technology can play a role in any of the three kind of initiatives. So either you call it like a mobile, 5G, AI, big data, virtual reality, augmented reality, internet of things, all of them will supporting all of these three categories. So now I'd like to share with you, I got this uh, graph from Sacha Casper. 
it's very interesting. That's why we have to always mention about involving student, prioritizing student, because every student, every teachers, or even school, they have their own pace of transforming learning with technology. So there are two, two uh, dimensions here, the time, and then the experience. I don't know, uh, Sachin, how can we scale up if we have two dimensions? If we have one dimension, now it could be three dimensions, we just not found it yet. But the, this only two dimensions is it's not enough. I mean, it's not easy to us uh, to scale up in one size fit all. Yeah. So I like to uh, so another one is basically uh, this is the book in 2015, basically in the book uh, uh, of trend in education. So three things we like we have to uh, underline here: Are we doing differentiation or individualization or personalization? So they are very uh, close, you know. If you don't look at in the detail, then it's very, uh, very easy to be distracted. So it looks like you're doing personalization, but actually you're doing individualization. So then this is another way of looking at when you want to scale up. So it's good uh, to start discussion, but uh, I like what I learned two months in Korea, and you know, just to share with you all, basically uh, how Korean government integrated the policies of personal education. So actually, the key here is uh, continuous, you know, continuous program on vocational education, starting from elementary school. How can it, it was like a, I, I'm just a little bit surprised basically. Uh, how can you uh, making policy? I mean, creating policy of vocational education starting from elementary school. You know, if you want to create teachers. I mean, you want to develop new teachers, then you have to start it from the beginning. So this is what the Korean government did. So from the early, from the uh, primary education, they start introducing what is vocational education. And then when they are in junior high school, they give them one semester free learning. What is free learning here is basically no examination. So here, when you don't have examination, you are free man, you know, so because life is exam here. So the better you do the exam, the more you, you have a better life, basically. And then starting uh, developing and choosing what kind of vocational education they can take. Either specialized education, minister high uh, school, master high school, basically, adopted from Germany, but this is master high school, like uh, Germany plus, you know. And then a apprenticeship program, and then vocational training. So all the way, basically, until workplace, they have also policy on lifelong, Personal education. What I like to highlight here, basically, uh, when you want to do scale up, three things here. Focus. I say, like in the government, in the Korean, Korean government, they said when they're going to do vocational education policy integrated. So they have to be focused, sustainable, and outcome oriented. That's all, uh, Sachin, that I can share. So it's just to start the discussion. Thank you. Go back to you. Thank, thank you, Pak Gogot. You know, uh, you actually brought in a, I like that slide where you uh, talked about, you know, personalization is putting the student in the center. And that's actually the essence core of today's discussion, because, you know, uh, we look at uh, uh, building scale as though it's something new, it's being done. But, you know, we have 550,000 schools in Indonesia because we did build scale. It has been done. It's not something new. There are 550,000 schools. Uh, maybe more, I, I would say the numbers would be a little higher than that. But there are 5 million teachers. So things have been done to scale in this country. The difference is the paradigm of building scale that has changed. For example, in the past, you standardize and then you build scale. So it's the same thing, one shoe fit all everywhere. And maybe you have three levels. So there's a type A, type B, type C kind of a school. And then you just do mass scaling of three types of schools, hoping one of them will fit somewhere. And that is the industrialized way of building scale. We are all used to that. And that's what has got us today to the situation where we have schools in all the areas. But comes the, the issue that I want to talk about today is actually with personalization. And we do not have one shoe fits all. And we are, we are putting the student at the center, allowing to choose what he wants to learn. 
means that the level of personalization has to be scaled. That is a completely different animal because you don't even know where to start. Do you? What, what exactly do you scale everywhere? Uh, do we have data to even uh, understand what we have to scale? So, so the, I want to set the discussion based on this whole theory that if we choose the wrong thing and we scale it, technology will help us to scale the wrong thing everywhere. And then it's too late. So it's very important that we get the framework of what is it that we want to scale first and applying all these new paradigms and ideas of personalization and allowing students to choose what they want to learn. Using technology, therefore, to help manage the scaling at a level where it is not a one shoe fit all, but you have taken that methodology everywhere and you have this personalization now at a mass scale across 550,000 schools. I'm just saying that's, a, that's the ideal dream, right? So the question I want to ask all of you actually to have set a discussion is based on your experience of a different way 10 years ago and a different way today, going forward with the technology that we have in hand, what are the things we can do? So I thought I'd kick off this discussion first with Dr. Rani first, because I want her to apply what she's actually doing uh, with those various provinces and with the programs that she's running. Are you thinking of these kind of things when your methodology of building scale? And it's not just building scale of the technology or the technology topics, but using technology by itself to build that scale, right? So both parts of it. So over to you, Dr. Rani, then I'm gonna come to Pagogat and Ibuya after that. Uh, Ra Dr. Rani, I think you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder how many times people have to say you are on mute on call. Great, great um, question, Sachin. And I think it's a very insight um, driving question because you said that to decide what it is that we need to do, it, it, that's a decision. And that decision comes from a student centered putting student in the middle and working out what is it that we are trying to do uh, for the student. Um, and then when you have those very fundamental things, you know, for them to be holistic, they need for them to be um, uh, a well-rounded human being, um, they collaborate well, they get into the workforce, whether they leave um, from year 12 or year 10 or to the, in the university, uh, wherever they're living, they are going to find and, and um, come out with a learning mentality, lifelong learning ment uh, mentality, but be able to contribute to society and their family and the community, right? So that, in, in my opinion, when my 13-year-old son grows up, that's what I'm expecting him to do. I need him to contribute. Now, if that is what then we are focusing on, what are all the interventions and knowledge that we need to give for that to happen in a classroom, four wall environment, in outside of those four walls. So we have to look at the whole learning journey as, as a part because a child doesn't just learn, learn in a classroom. Um, they are also learning in the, in the playground. They're also learning at home. So there's a lot of micro interactions that happen. And I think the first thing for that to be captured so we can have reactive, proactive, and predictive impact is to gather data, right? What is it that they are excited about? How do they learn? Like I could say my son learns best from Minecraft. I put him inside Minecraft and then I'm lost. I've lost him for hours, even if it is a subject, mad science, whatever it is, I've lost him for hours because he's totally immersed. But I also know um, my nephew hates it. He doesn't want that immersive environment. He will lock himself up in a book uh, or an encyclopedia and it doesn't make sense to me and he learns very differently. And then there's another kid who doesn't even want to have anything to do with books but the balls. You know, they want to be out there playing. So there's so many things that a student, when we put them in the center that we have to deal with, to your point, there are so many things to learn. But the first point is understanding that behavior and what you know, what excites them. And that requires data. And I think for me, that's the first step. First step is able to give them the access and equity so you can allow 
technology to help you make those decisions. They are never going to be perfect, but give those students the best chance, right? Of being able to take empowerment in their own hands for the learning processes that they have. And that's why um, the Korea also, when they talk about it, they're really talking about how they empower the learner. So the reliance on the community becomes a little bit less um, in the way teaching happens, but increases in the way they provide context and concept. So I think what we've done is that, you know, knowing that that technology component is critical and everything else needs to be planned around it, we are helping, for example, um, the Regency in Senjai, South Sulawesi, uh, where we focus on building the skills of the teachers to use technology as we deploy technology into their schools. So, because we also have the mindset of saying, I can give you the technology, but if you don't know how to use it, if you're not engaged with it, it's going to be a doorstop. They are not going to be able to use that. So I think for me, the first step is appreciating that that student that you are thinking about is the teacher to start with, right? Because that teacher is going to scale. So that student is going to scale a lot. So for us, I think there are two things that, you know, now that I've mentioned, being able to put the technology in their hand and then treating the teacher as a student as well as, and making sure that there's enthusiasm, there's adoption. And then in the back end, what I think more and more ministries are doing is laying the platform to acquire that data so that they are using really good Power BI and data, data tools to first get an understanding that might be very simple. How long is my teacher using this tool to teach? How long is that student using it? Are they excited enough? Did they complete the course? You know, it's very fundamental, very basic. But the more we collect these kinds of data and ask quizzes instead of assessment, knowing when to intervene in the pathway of scaffolding and learning with the student, all of this happens, then technology can come and help. Because I think it's really unfair to ask the teachers with a classroom of 50 students to say, hey, you need to give personalized learning. It's never going to happen. I have one son. I'm finding it difficult to give him personalized learning. You know, how does the teacher cope with it? So I, I do think the way that we've, we've done it is the, you know, the beginning of the process to say, here's the technology. Teachers think differently about how you use, you know, when you're teaching math, you know, it's, you're not only teaching numbers and addition. You're also teaching how the students are taking that and applying. You're also teaching the interaction between students. Maybe it's a project, right? And then how the students are doing. So earlier, as the Mr. Mentry said, that it is true. It's like every subject needs to become one of those data points that we can search. And for that, you need to have the basic data. You need to treat your teacher as they are a student as well in the learning journey, and then use them to scale and leverage, which is how we've done, you know, a beginning of July, 2020. We went out to so many of those students to bring, and we just don't try and overachieve, you know, make what the teacher does in the classroom simple so they have the space to think about um, what they are doing with the student. Until you make it easy for them to do their day job easier, you're, they're not going to have the bandwidth to think about the students. So, I think these were some of the learnings that we had from the Sanjay um, deployment. And you know, every time we deploy a school, we, we speak to the leaders, we speak to the teachers, we see the adoption levels. And then it's our, us who are in the industry who can impact the number of technology solutions that goes that work seamlessly to help the teacher and the student and then gather the data points. And then we, we have a chance at really personalizing education. Perfect. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rani. Uh, Gogol, I want to actually uh, bounce off uh, something Dr. Rani said. Uh, you know, if, if the process is actually so complex and it has so many components, uh, then building scale will probably take years, right? It will, I would say, going school by school or region by region or province by province and reaching 500,000 schools. At what level do you think 
uh, you know, it, this, we will be able to achieve this. It may be too late, too, I mean, say too slow, too late, right? So, Pagogot, your views on this, because, you know, you have been involved in many large scaling uh, challenges. And how do you see this one differently? Or is it the same? Or you have another view on this? Over to you, Pat. Thank you, Vasachin. Thank you, Burani, for the uh, insight of personalization uh, in this and in this new era. So uh, actually, personalization and scale up. If we look at a glance, it's like an, uh, an, an I mean, two arrows with uh, different direction. Yeah. Because scale up mean uh, you have one uh, framework being implemented in a big number. Personalization means that you have to take care of each learner with their own potential, their own pace of learning, with specific uh, treatment uh, and services. So, but actually, if we look at the role of technology, can bring those two different directions into one. Because it's not easy. Uh, how we can do it? Uh, we provide the menu, not just menu uh, like set of uh, subject matter, no, but also activities into detail until uh, the student they know how to measure themselves. So measure doesn't mean the same measurement of the teachers. No, the teacher will have another uh, authorization to measure the skill of the student. But at least self assessment. So if we have the set of uh, instrument uh, that student can choose, they can practice, and they can assess themselves in different, uh, uh, I mean, different, uh, like, uh, I mean, different uh, varieties, I like different, different uh, menu based on the potential of the student. Let's say one example, easy to comprehend is, if you learn about algebra, everybody has to know how to count, has to know how to uh, calculate, has to know how to subtract. You cannot uh, let the kid then, if the kid still since the uh, since early child, they say, I don't like to count. And then you let them not counting. Then when they grow up, uh, you're not helping them. So you put them in the trouble. So, but to learn algebra, not all students have the same way of learning. That's, that's why the type of student learner, either they are more cognitive, more psychomotoric, more social, more inclusive. So that's the technology can play the roles. So yes, they learn algebra, but each student, they have, they have different characteristics of learning. The technology can support them. So in the role of AI, can read how the speed of the student uh, solving any problem. And then from that, teachers with the help of this AI can uh, assist the student. This is the best way how you can learn. Because of course, uh, I mean, kids are kids, you know. Uh, they are free to choose, but decision making, we have to help them to make a good decision making. So I think that's, uh, that's my view. So. Yeah, it's not look. I mean, there's no fail. I mean, just to like to emphasize one more thing is basically there's no fail vocabulary in the piloting in education. What I like to yeah. uh, highlight is basically and you doing different things that the student need. That's yeah. another way to say it. Thank you, Vasachi. Yeah. So, Pa Gogat, uh, I get your point. I'm going to go to Lucia because you know she has been a teacher <laughs> and she has been with students, she has been running a school and you know, she has a lot of experience in what we're talking about. What is your view, Ibu Piyari? Do you think this will work? Maybe you have a different uh, viewpoint. What would you like to share with us? Okay, uh, for the difference uh, in maybe a culture or geographics, uh, now in direct early childhood, uh, primary and secondary, uh, education we concern to uh, for the uh, accreditations of school in category C because we want to improve uh, and then collaboration with the local government and then 
we want to connect with another school like a sekolah penggerak because maybe the all students they want to uh, improve their skill and then they having a curiosity and then they having a skills uh, they having a good facilities but the teacher is not a uh, confidence for using the digital tools because uh, we found it with a uh, mas menteri last week uh, when we we going to school and then make sure for the opening school we we found uh, many laptop <laughs> and then some places uh, to be keep is not using for a uh, learning process but they they said that this laptop is only for akm or uh, for uh, assessment competency minimum or for uh, national uh, examination so this is maybe the approaches uh, not only for the teacher but no we we uh apa ya dibalik <laughs> no we 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 having a uh, approach to students because when the students they want to know they want to play uh, they want to make a video maybe uh, like uh, they play a media social social media or tiktok maybe so we encourage uh, for them to make a, a education uh, video for educate and inspire the others and they might be local government they uh, maybe they feel that they are the best having the best program but they don't know when they <laughs> look at uh, the another local government so we, we want to connect this uh, this uh, local government they having a school and then we we want to connect because in during pandemic we have a useful and beneficial uh, especially for education we connecting a school to share and then uh, using a webinar maybe and then for program uh, SELN Sekolah Indonesia Luar Negeri like uh, Mr. Gogot in uh, South of Korea uh, South of Korea we connecting the uh, school in Indonesia to connect to collaborate and then to share with another teacher another students in Indonesia so they they want to know oh i, I having uh, innovation i have a uh, critical thinking uh, we have an innovation to share uh, each other so the government maybe the local government maybe they don't want the oh i'm the best like that so we connect like uh, spk satuan pendidikan kerjasama in international school we collaborate with uh, another school in uh, zona zonation so they can share all facilities and then uh, we having a program collaborate is not only campus mengajar between a student in a university and primary school uh, a primary school student but also we having a program collaboration of coaching or mentoring from the secondary students to primary students or secondary students to uh, uh, early childhood students and uh, etc. Because uh, they want to, like uh, Mr. Gogo said, that kids as a kids, they want to play, bermain sambil belajar. They feel that they they still are playing, but like uh, I said that they using a kahoot. So the teacher like using the kahoot because it's simply uh, simple, and then they can uh, collect the score of uh, every students but they uh, not feel that this is a difficult. So we offer to all school that uh, using a technology is simple because now they having a smart gadget, maybe a laptop with a high uh, specification, but it's only for the type, it's only for the send a text, maybe it's, they, don't, uh, they don't know how to use and how to download uh, all the learning resources like uh, Rumah Belajar, and then the aksi assessment uh, kumpulan soal is all example and then a video and then they want to share a video to inspire the all school uh, different school and then different uh, teachers so we appreciate when they not only using or download uh, in portal rumah belajar but on uh, but they can contribute and then to create a video to share each other in social media in uh, portal rumah belajar so they have uh, appreciate and so yeah. uh, they want to have a motivation to share each other to inspire
So, Thanks. Ibukia, I want to ask you, is your school where you used to teach in Jogjar uh, part of Sekola, uh, Sekola Pankara? Is it part of the program? Oh, uh, we, <laughs> no, no, because uh, Jogjakarta uh, having a quote uh, for the school, so they have uh, indicators uh, for Sekola Pankara, uh, and then we, we have an independent for Sekola Pankara. Okay. So the reason I ask is actually there's a reason, you know, Rani, I have this question I want to bring to you, Dr. Rani, uh, you know, this, uh, there's always this whole methodology of we have so many schools which are identified for specific projects and pilots like the Skola Pangarak, which is a good initiative. My question to you is, do you think the market could be elsewhere? Okay, there are, there are 550,000 schools. There are so many underserved parts of the country. Do you think there are teachers and students who are more willing to be accepting of new techniques and new methodologies. Should there be another approach of going to schools that want this kind of a program because they'll give it a better shot than to go with a government top-down led program or it should be a mix of both. I mean, say there's nothing wrong in doing, you know, one program like this, but also do a program for the underserved because, you know, I've been talking to a lot of people who do pilots. We ourselves do a lot of pilots. We found consistently that the schools that are underserved or are underprivileged or not having access are far more interested in doing something different, doing something new, and they send a set a kind of a standard. And then the other schools are forced to follow it because they are seeing that the other smaller schools are doing much better than them. So this is a strategy by itself. It's a, you could call it a kind of a reverse psychology that you can apply to the system. What are your views on that, Dr. Rani? <laughs> Great question. Um, so, let me give a couple of examples. In Senjai, which is a region in the eastern part of South Sulawesi, that includes about nine islands, right? We have about three SMPs. So, you know, the teachers who were so creative, what they did is they built a mini studio, and four out of um, the six uh, also now have a mini studio because what they realized is that to make content engageable and to get it to the students requires um, a different effort to what they, they would do. So they were so um, motivated to overcome this challenge. They did things that sometimes I find in the cities, they don't, right? And I, I think you make a point. Um, but one of the things, the learnings that we, we had from there is we had the support of the local government to be able to um, educate the teachers, uh, create excitement and do that because the leaders in the schools were willing to do that. So to your point, sometimes, and I've seen this not just in Indonesia, I've seen this in the remote parts of Myanmar, Sri Lanka, um, Malaysia, Vietnam, where sometimes in the uh, last mile schools, the, the only thing that is stopping them is connectivity and the actual devices for access. When you can make that happen, there is this enthusiasm and willingness because they've got great leaders. And also they are not, um, you know, hindered by previous successes. You know, whatever they do is very innovative. So it's the first time and they do it. And to your point, yes, that works. And I think whilst that is very important and we do that learning and there's lots of times that other schools follow that, we also have to be mindful that the majority of the population we have sits in those city areas, right? Yeah. And in those city areas where may, uh, connectivity may be good, um, we need to test them because we, we need to give them access to that. So I, I would say it's a mix of both. Um, almost whenever I think about something, I always say, you know, good, better, best scenarios. What I know in Indonesia from the experiences we've had in central Java province, in Senjai, um, and, and many of the other provinces, the urban schools um, and the pre-urban schools and, and the really, really village, uh, local schools, they all come up with very different processes, but the outstanding outcome is that there's outcome, there is learning outcome, they are trying to, uh, what you were saying, right, there's no such thing as fail. 
failure is only failure if we didn't learn from it, right? But you know, in this school, they do it. So to your point, yeah, often we don't look at the basketball goals, and um, we we try and make sure we're very mindful to choose not by school but by leadership, because when there is leadership, they find ways to overcome challenges in the learning journey for themselves. So, yeah. I mean, you know, uh, we are the perfect example. You know, this year today, coming from a school which has not been uh, very privileged, but you know, she has been a teacher, she's taken so much initiative and created so many programs. She has been sent to NASA and she's uh, in a program with NASA. A lot of few teachers in the program go overseas to NASA. Having an experience and being it has. This is a perfect example of how teachers are taking initiative. And inspire other teachers and students on them to go beyond what they have inherited, which is actually the, the school system they have in their village or their town. It's actually what they've inherited. It is not reflective of the aspirations of the people who live there. We have to be able to break through this piloting methodology that we all have in our heads to be able to reach it to those who want it and those who want to do something with it because then the results are much faster. Because you are here, you have motivated people who will make something out of it, rather than privileged students in privileged areas who don't really appreciate the resources being thrown at them. I'm just, it's a case in point. I just want you to think about it because, you know, we are all facing these kind of dilemmas of what is the scaling model we must use, etc. But I think, you know, going by uh, experience, it's go to people who want it. And maybe that's a, now use technology to manage that because it's not easy to currently, you know, spread yourself across so many geographical areas. How do you do that? I think that's where technology can help. Yeah, the single most important factor is that environment uh, from the leader of the school. When you have the right environment, yeah. um, then you, you will have some amazing things happen. So. Correct. So I'm going to actually throw up a wrapping question because we are coming very close to the end of our session. Uh, it is the fasting month, so we have to break at 4.30 so that we allow people to get ready, you know, to go break the fast, etc. So, Pagogot, the last question to you. I know your time zone is different here, Pagogot. Yes, almost. Um, Breaking really fast time. So, I'm going to wrap it up in two, three minutes, Pagogot. Uh, I want to ask you, Pagogot, you know, uh, you being behind uh, so many ICT initiatives within the ministry and you have interacted with Mencom Info and some of the other ministry, your counterparts in different ministries to make this happen. Uh, do you have any silver bullet solution for remote areas to get connected? What's the easiest and simplest way you believe a school in a remote area can have basic infrastructure to join this bandwagon and join the party as they say, be able to come to the party without too much of heavy infrastructure. I'll give you an example. We did an AI program uh, where we were supposed to give a lot of heavy equipment on high speed processors, but several schools did this projects without doing a, using any of this equipment. They, they were able to find workarounds. They were able to find things they could do with what they already had. So any silver bullet idea, Pa, Gogot, you might want to leave us with because uh, you will be talking to a uh, lots of people who are implementing great technology projects all across the country. Maybe you can give them a simple solution of a silver bullet of getting, you know, even remote parts of Indonesia quickly connected to do something useful. Over to you, Pa Gogot, for the final wrap-up. Uh, thank you, Pa Sachin. I remember in 2006, I took an ICT management course here in Korea. It's a long time ago. And I asked the same, almost the same question. Uh, always, you know, Indonesian, when they go to Korea, to a big country, they always ask, in my country, we have limitation, limitation of access and things like that. There's, I asked the same thing. So, uh, and the professor at that time, 2006, it's like 15 years ago, uh, he said, build from the local wisdom. I mean, what is there, build from there. I think this is what, what's my using it in the Gojek. Gojek is there when we could go and then become Gojek big now. So, the, the local wisdom. So what's available in the country, in the, in the school? This is what you have to use. And then I attended in 2008 an uh, executive briefing in Redmond with the executive director of uh, Microsoft there in Redmond a long, long time ago. The same time I asked questions because I just want to make sure uh, is, it, is it 
the the source of success is there and then yes he mentioned the same thing basically start from what you have so i think it's the best way is to ask them what uh, makes them work from their school so uh, i believe it's not easy because of the data we have uh, i mean affiliate data is going to be a problem but at least you can start from what is available from there so you don't need, you don't have to deploy the big thing from jakarta and then from there and i remember um, but muhajir a previous minister we went to merauke and then the same what ibu fia mentioned like masnadim just went to the school and they and uh, muhajir saw the laptop still in the box you know and yes. he asked me no oh god why is still the box i said it just arrived yesterday <laughs> because so that's why I mean you have to start from what they have. So, thank you, Basachi. That's a great point, Pagwagot. And I think you know this is, brings us to the end of this panel. Uh, I think it's a fantastic uh, uh, you know starting point for a discussion about frugal innovation and starting with what you have. Look at local wisdom. Plug in what you can and get the movement started because things always find a way to fall in place. Sooner or later, you'll find people can donate laptops, give a harder infrastructure, but get started first. If you're going to put a big uh, ask of wanting $15,000 worth of equipment first, you're already, you know, dead on arrival because, you know, you built a, built a big boulder for yourself to even get anywhere. So I think, you know, simple frugal innovation, simple ideas, simple. I love Minecraft. You know, this is Dr. Rani, what you said is fantastic. It's, it's so engaging for kids. And I think any kid anywhere in Indonesia, with a handphone or a mobile phone, we'll be able to, you know, start working on simple things on Minecraft. If you have a laptop, it's even better. I agree. But, you know, it's a starting point. So maybe this is the approach we need to do. Start to go to the underserved. Look at ways to create a revolution. We need a revolution where people will drive this. We can't be top-driven or company-driven or large corporation or foundation-driven. It has to be from bottom-up. If you can see a revolution among the people that they want to improve education in their own areas it will somewhere meet along the way on where the you know the top down and the bottom up will meet halfway somewhere and this is something that i think you know we should really work on not focus only on one aspect of scaling up uh, local wisdom i completely agree with you pa and finding frugal ways and then like how ibu pia mentioned that you know uh, the the people are there they're willing they're teachers and there are students who actually want this we have to find a practical way of getting them engaged and be make them a part of this revolution of changing how education is in their own respective spaces and i think that is the way to move mountains get the people engaged so it's not just putting the person behind in the center it's putting a community in the center get the community involved in upgrading their education and things will be find a way to work itself out. All right, thanks a lot. I really enjoyed this panel and uh, I'm going to interact with all of you again. We have a series of 10 round, eight round tables coming up this year. Every month there's a round table. I would invite you all to participate as well as speak at some of these. Uh, we have a great partnership with the Ministry of Education and they will be involved with us. And, and that's actually thanks to Pagogot. He was one of the earliest supporters of the Education Forum. And the reason why we have good links with the ministry is thanks to Pagogot, pa Ananto, and a few other people and who were instrumental in, you know, helping us build a conversation around these topics. And today, you know, I'm proud to say we have speakers from all around the world. We had from uh, different countries and we have inputs coming. And I think these are the ways we can accelerate a better understanding of what we need to do and then find a you know, model that we all can implement and then make things happen. Thank you so much. And I'm going to hand it over back to Pasho Web at the studio. And uh, looking forward to catching up with all of you later, including the audience who joined us today. Thank you very much, Sachin. And uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rani, Pagogar, Ibufia. It was a wonderful panel. I think it really encapsulated our, our day today in terms of where we started and where we ended, uh, and the range of issues that uh, we discussed through the day. Uh, I think it's very clear uh, that while you know, there is disruption going on in education, uh, from all the speakers and from the uh, panel discussions that we've had, to me, the, the biggest takeaway from today is that there are very, very passionate people in the education sector who are making things happen. 
And I think, you know, from AWS, from Microsoft, uh, from Orbit Future, from Intel, um, you know, we've seen the, uh, the willingness, the passion, the innovation uh, within, within the education space. And, you know, of course, working with the Ministry of Education, I mean, uh, by Nadim, by Iwan, by Gogot, and some of the other direct, director generals, by Wikan, their present, and of course, Ibu Fia Juga, their presentations really show that I think the ministry is really leading this innovation within the education sector. And I think that really is a critical uh, takeaway for me today. And I think the willingness to open up, to listen, to partner. And I think throughout the day, we've talked about collaboration. That really is the key, right? Collaboration. And I think um, uh, I've, I've, I said it earlier in my opening speech, and I'll say it again. We are on the cups of a bold new world, a brave new world. And I think the education sector, the focus on students uh, learning, uh, using ad tech, and the whole gamut of ideas that were presented by the speakers today really encapsulated. And I'd like to leave you with this thought. We are not at the end of the conference. We are just at the starting of a very exciting year for, for the Education Forum. So thank you very much, everybody, to all the speakers, to all our partners, again, uh, AWS, Microsoft, Intel, Orbit Future Academy. Uh, and of course, a very, very big thank you to the Ministry of Education. Uh, I'd like also to thank my co-host and my co-founders, uh, Nalin uh, Singh and, of course, uh, Sachin Gopalan, for helping me to moderate and to host this uh, wonderful day of, uh, I think, sharing of ideas. So thank you very much. Stay safe and God bless.